Hey, Steve. Hey, Gary. Hi, guys. Hello. 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 Nice to see you again, Steve. Thanks, Scott. So Sepide, you guys know who Sepide Husyar is, right? Sepide is from Iran. She uh, she had a documentary movie made about her, uh, about uh, Sepide and the stars or something. And it was her struggle as an Iranian woman uh, to do astronomy. She was a teenager when she started, really quite unheard of. Um, to uh, follow that path. And uh, now she's grown and has children and still does astronomy. She married a uh, university professor who supports her in her passion for learning about astronomy. And uh, so cool. it be interesting. I've got a funny feeling she's on my friends list somewhere. Uh, probably. Yeah, I, I'm sure I know. She got uh, really interested in supernova. Yeah. So. Same as yourself. Too many friends on there to keep an eye on everybody. Yeah. Um, That's right. Hey, guys. How are you? Hello, Maxi. How are you? Uh, right now, I'm at work. <laughs> You're working. Okay. Well, we got a little time. I I have uh, 30 minutes uh, uh, before I oh, wow. go home and I'll be, today I, I will not go into the gym, so my wife is going to be there, no. mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I told her that I will be online soon. No problem. Hello, Terry. Hi, David. How are you? Oh, I'm pretty good. I'm feeling pretty good today now. <laughs> well, that's good. Night. Hope to get some Orionids tomorrow night. Yeah, I have to fight that moon a little bit. Hi, Terry. How are you keeping? Pretty good. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. All good this side of the pond at the moment. <laughs> are you having better skies than we are here? No. No. <laughs> okay. I'm not. <laughs> yeah, I wish we were at the moment, but it's just that change of season. Yeah. yeah, October, it starts cooling and you're still getting the warm days, so get a lot of damp hair. Yeah. Yep. It's certainly been warm today, Gary. Yeah, it has really mild for this late in October. Very Glad you can't see the lower half because I broke, broke the shorts out again. <laughs> Thank you. 
I thought they had gone into hibernation for the winter, but they're back again. <laughs> Yeah, that's just the postmen that have them all year round. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the community that we're in is so small that we're on first name terms with the, the postie and the UPS guys and the Amazon. They're the only... Uh... Only people I see here. <laughs> it's so remote. Postman is the only person you see on a daily basis. Yeah. Terry, I love your background with the Halloween motif. Yeah, me too. Uh, thank you. That's from Friday night with our Halloween gathering. That was fun. Yeah, it was. It was a lot of fun. I can't believe we ran three hours. Yeah. Well, people, you know, they get excited about what they're talking about. So, yeah. That's cool. We're excited about what Terry will and the others will be talking about this evening. Yeah. Are you talking to me, David? I couldn't. I just said we're excited about what you're going to be talking about this evening, you and the others. <laughs> I'll be asking questions. Everybody else will be talking about other stuff. <laughs> uh, David, we are moving. Um, our next AL Live is going to be November 15th, so it'll be on a Monday night. I will send you the invite when I have it. Okay, thank you. And right now I can tell you I can do it. I'll be there. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you. Thanks. And I'd love to be there. Big honor. We'd love to have you there. So thank you very much. David, do you know how many virtual events you've done so far? <laughs> I know how many that I've done. I don't know how many virtual events, but I can tell you how many events I've done. Mm -hmm. 2,176. Wow. Whoa. Wow. <laughs> You've been busy. And I thought Elvis <clears throat> gave a lot of presentations, you know. <laughs> the, the event number one was the spring of 1960, when I gave a speech about comments to my fellow classmates in grade six at Roslyn School. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> <clears throat> I had no idea what was going to have, what that was going to turn into. <laughs> no <Right>. idea at all. Sharing this to a Facebook group called Rob's Astronomy Group. I'm not sure who Rob is, but hope you enjoy this. <clears throat> it is so warm today, it's unbelievable. <laughs> Not too bad here, so we have who do we have on right now? We've got uh Martin Eastburn uh from Cloudy East Texas, Ed Gunther's on from Pittsburgh, uh Plattsburgh, excuse me, New York. Plattsburgh, um, yes, I know it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so Ed uh was at the last Arizona Dark Sky Star Party. And um mm -hmm. He, uh, so we've, we've got the dates pinned down and, uh, so we're, we'll be, uh, making more people aware of that. Mike Wiesner's on, Norm Hughes, Andrew Corkle, uh, Richard Grace, um, <clears throat>
Well, welcome to the 69th Global Star Party, uh, a shared universe. And uh, thank you for logging on with us. This is a much earlier time than what we normally have for Global Star Party by you know, several hours. But uh, we have uh, uh, some astronomers from Europe. We have astronomers also from Argentina with us. So we wanted to kind of shift some things uh, forward a little bit so that we could uh, get everyone on at a reasonable time. Um, I, uh, I often think about, uh, you know, the, the way that, or, you know, that, we, that we are sharing everything within the universe and the, and the universe is sharing everything with us, you know, so, uh, it is, uh, a moment that you want to keep your eyes wide open about and, uh, use all your senses and, uh, all your gear that you can to explore your universe and to, uh, you know, gain a greater understanding and maybe somehow share that experience with others. And that's what Global Star Party is all about. So uh, I was uh, reading through the chat here, plenty of you from around the world uh, online right now with us. And uh, Pekka Hautala, who's sometimes on this program, uh, commented, he says, the universe seems to be so powerful for us humans that we dare not quarrel about it. So why not share the... The place in peace, and um, that we stand on and marvel at the great and powerful together. So that was very nice, very nice. Um, yeah, if everyone could understand uh, uh, our world the way that astronomers do, I, I think it would be a, a much more peaceful place. That's for sure. Um, and the more you people you can turn on to it, the more that that will happen. But someone that I know that has probably turned on more people to astronomy than maybe any other is David Levy. Uh, David has, I was asking David earlier in the program how many uh, events he's given. And, uh, you know, David's very good at keeping a log of his observations, but he's also good at keeping logs of all of his presentations. And he's given over 2,000 presentations since he started. Uh, doing astronomy. And so that is an amazing feat uh, by anybody's standard, I think. Um, David is also a friend to many of us. Uh, if you met David uh, face to face, you'd find out he's a very down to earth uh, person. Uh, but uh, he gets excited about the hunt 
for uh, for comets. He gets excited about seeing other people get excited about astronomy. Um, and, uh, you know, that comes through in his presentations, in his many books, uh, and all of his presentations that he's given so far with us on Global Star Party. So, David, I'm very, very pleased, very happy, very proud to call you my friend. And uh, so I'm going to turn it over to you, man. Well, thank you so much, Scotty. And uh, right back at you. I mean, our friendship has gone on for for many, many decades. It continues. And I'm so, so pleased to, to be here, especially when we have a glo truly global event with people from England, people from South America, people from Canada. It is just so terrific to have a truly global event. And uh, I really agree with you that uh, if more people appreciated the night sky, the world would be a peaceful, more peaceful place. Uh, there are two people in particular that I would like to say hello to right now. And one of them I think is on Facebook and that's Ed Gunther. He is one of our real stars at our Adirondack Astronomy Retreat. And I am just so thrilled that he's here with us tonight. The other one who is with us on Zoom is Martha Farkas from Canada. And Martha, has been at our retreat almost since the beginning. She's become a very good friend of Wendy's. I think they were in touch just today. And, um, and it's just delightful, Martha, that you're here. And I hope that you'll enjoy these events. We hope to have a uh, in-person star party next fall that I hope you'll, at the end of September, 2022, that I do hope you'll be able to come and enjoy with us and to come to more of these. And in your honor tonight, my poem is going to be by a, <clears throat> by a Hungarian poet. And this is one, Martha, that you sent to me some time ago. The poet's name is Hanos Vajda, born in 1827, died in 1897. And, um, the poem is one that I can certainly relate to. It's called The Comet. And some of you might know that I do have a special interest in comets. In fact, of the more than 2,000 lectures that I've given, the very first one was in the spring of 1960 uh, to my sixth grade class at Roslyn School. And that particular talk was about comets. But today I'm going to actually quote from this poem, The Comet. And here goes. I believe that he was referring to the comet of 1882, but it well, might have been any one of those major comets that, occur, that occurred in the 19th century. Across the night, a crimson comet lies. It ranges from the zenith to the ground. They say its path is straight throughout the skies and never marks through space a circling round. On where lights glittering legions flame and burn. It runs an endless race through gulfs unknown. It cannot or it will not backward turn. And so it is ever hopeless and alone. Its steadfast worship to the moon is sent. That fickle, ever circling satellite, majestic mourner of the firmament, a uh, flaring grief. I praise you to the highest. Vast sorrow, symbol of my soul's despair. A radiant brush that paints my destiny. The utter loneliness of such as we. Martha, thank you so much for blessing me with this wonderful poem about a comet. Thank you. And back to you, Scott. Great, great. Well, uh, that is just, that's beautiful. And uh, um, yeah, again, thank you, David and Martha. That was wonderful. Um, the, uh, our, before we get started uh, uh, with uh, Global Star Party number 69, uh, you know, we, we like to have the, uh, the Astronomical League uh, join with us uh, to challenge you with questions, uh, to uh, you share the door prizes and announce the door prize winners. 
Um, uh, the uh, executive staff rotates um, uh, the different members of the staff, so they all have some experience with Global Star Party. Um, but uh, much of the planning for this uh, starts with the secretary of the Astronomical League, um, uh, a dear, a dear friend, uh, uh, Miss Terry Mann. And uh, she is uh, uh, someone that I greatly admire. Um, I, I think that she is someone that uh, has, uh, you know, explored her life on her terms. She continues to do that. Uh, she's brave. She's uh, her mind's always working. She sees the beauty of the, you know, of not only the whole world but uh, uh, the universe as well. And she has dedicated herself uh, to, you know, tens of thousands of amateur astronomers through her work in the Astronomical League. She's been a two-term former president of the league. She's currently secretary. Uh, really, uh, a, a tireless individual. Um, who's uh, very humble, I think. And uh, so thanks, thanks for coming on tonight, Terry. And uh, let's, let's, uh, let's hear what the uh, Astronomical League has dreamed up for the questions to challenge our viewers. All right, Scott, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, we, have, we go back so many years. Um, yeah. Thank you, I do appreciate it. Me too. Okay. This always takes my computer a little while to catch up. We always start with the slide about looking at the sun. You always need to make sure you have the proper filters on telescopes. Anything that you look at the sun, make sure you always have something over the optics, a uh, filter that is made for viewing the sun. So what I'm going to start with is the answers from October 12th. And the question was, the famous nebula immediately east of the Neb is known as, and the answer is, the North American Nebula. Question two was, in what constellation does the sun lie in front of tonight? And that was on October 12th. And that answer was Virgo. Question three, which major planet is closest to the Earth tonight? which is the farthest. Remember, they won't be lined in a row and they won't be on the same side of the sun. And on October 12th, that would have been Mercury and Neptune. So the answer was C. The people that answered this, these questions correctly was Josh Kovac, Andrew Corkill, Michael, Michael Overacker, Aaron Thompson, Israel Monterosso, and Cameron Gillis. And their names will be added to a list, and we will announce the winners of October on the first star party in November. So the questions for tonight, please send your answers to secretary at astroleague.org. First question, what happened to the ISS on July 29th, 2021, after a Russian module docked? Question two, NASA's InSight lander measured the diameter of Mars' molten core. What is the diameter of Mars' molten core? In what constellation will you find this nebula? I'm trying to stick with the Halloween mood this month. Yes. Yeah. All right. And we will be back with Astronomical League Live 11 on Monday, November 15th. We're going to start at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And this will be the Astronomical League's 75th anniversary will be on November 15th. So we have a special program that is in store for you. We're in the planning stages now. So please join us if you can. And Scott. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Um, so uh, we, um, you know, I hope that you are quickly finding your answers. And, um, you know, also when they 
they run the Astronomical League live program. They also uh, give out door prizes as well. But you have to be a little faster on the trigger because they announce those winners right at the end of the show. So uh, you want to show up, you want to uh, listen up, and, and uh, that's the way to win. Um, we are uh, now uh, going to introduce uh, our first co-host of the program, which is Gary Palmer. Gary has been on our program many times. Uh, he is a guru of astrophotography, uh, of image processing. Uh, you know, uh, he's got a list of guru titles, you know, uh, uh, after his name, which really also includes solar, deep sky, um, planetary. Uh, he, uh, he problem solves uh, putting together systems. Uh, you know, and he teaches. He's a he is a, uh, a fantastic teacher. He teaches one-on-one um, uh, -on -one sessions with groups. You know, however that you can use uh, Gary's knowledge. He's willing to share. Um, uh, you know what he knows, and uh, so you can you can sign up for a program with him, and uh, he's very happy to take you from where where are you where you are. You know, whether you're a beginner, you know, moderately advanced, or even very advanced, you know, he can help you uh, figure out the last niggle of of what it takes to get past, uh, you know, any kind of issue that you might have in trying to accomplish the best imaging that you can. Um, Gary is also, uh, uh, you know, a great friend. Uh, I met him first at a solar conference with Daystar. Um, this goes back maybe six years ago, seven years ago. Yeah. I had heard about Gary before that, so it was a great pleasure to meet him and uh, and start to see some of his amazing images. And the dude just continues to blow me away uh, every time I see a new image that he does. Uh, he uh, is also someone that understands complex programs like PixInsight, uh, where he just in a few minutes can show you how to transform an image from something that uh, looks okay, pretty good, you know, to something that is mind blowing. So, um, you know, because he's able to dig that data out and he can show you how to do that as well. So, as I mentioned before, Gary, it's great to have you uh, be a, a, a co-host of this program. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Many thanks for the intro, Scott. Um, I always find it hard to listen to all of the things when you list them out like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I'm just me. I just get on and do what I I, I do in a sense. So um, yeah, thanks very much for that. But it is, um, I suppose, it's something you never think about. Yeah, you you just get on and do these things, and uh, then all of a sudden you do something, and it, it stops, and you realise what's going on. Um, mm. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us this evening. Um, it's always a pleasure to do these shows even though the, the time zones are a bit different. Um, but we've got a few guests on from the European side um, tonight. Um, for my little bit of presentation on something, I thought we'd have a look at um, mosaicing in PixInsight. Um, this is where we, uh, maybe through the field of view of the optics or the camera or different things, we end up where the, the target doesn't fit in our field of view. So we then need to take two or three images of the target area. And it's always an issue joining those together and getting a smooth background. So the background from one data set that might be on one night and another data set from you know another night or another month, um, they might have slightly varying backgrounds. So it's quite nice when you get a simple piece of software that can join those together. So I'll share the screen over. Hopefully you should see that. So we're looking at the, the veil. There's two parts here. Um, there's another part here. Just gonna run through the easy first part of the process. So we stack all of these uh, with the corresponding flats and darts um, for the system. Then what we need to do is a dynamic background extraction. So it's fairly straightforward. Dynamic background extraction module. Just zoom in a little bit. We click on that and then we set the module up. Um, on the tolerance, same as usual, 1.500. 0, 0. 
And then if we go down to the target correction, um, I normally go for somewhere around 12 on something like this. And then samples per row, I keep really low. I normally keep that at six. Um, I get pretty bored of moving these samples around. So I prefer to put less on and then actually add them in. So if we generate now, we see the samples have come on. If they're coming too close to the nebula, just drag them out and move them around. And that's the reason why I say um, you're better off doing less samples and adding some in. If you want to add them in, then you can just left click the mouse button, bring these in. And have a look over in each sort of section. Probably move that one out there. Now, if you leave these in close to the target, what will happen is you can end up with a black trough in the background. And that's really hard to remove. So you're better off with these out of the way of the actual target. You can always uh, rerun this again if you're getting any errors on anything. Set the target correction to subtraction and apply to the image. Okay, full stretch on it. So what you have to do is to do this for each section of your mosaic. We're going to cancel that out. We're just going to drop this one up out of the way because we don't need it. That was just showing the process that's led to these two parts of the mosaic so far. So we've got the two parts here. Main thing we need to do is star align them. Yeah, so that um, we're star aligning the two parts. The software then knows how to um, integrate the two parts together. Um, you can open up the star align module. Um, select one of the, the panels, whichever one you want. Um, whichever one you select is going to be the one on top in a sense. So once you've selected that, you need to change yeah, the registration model. So we need to change the, um, sorry, not the registration model, the uh, working mode. We need to change that to registered union separate. Um, if you change that to that, then what it's going to do is not actually star align these together. It's going to look at the edges of the fields of view and then it's going to match the stars on that. Once you've done that, apply it to the opposite one to what you've got selected in your view there. So you just drag and drop it onto there. Once that's done, you need to save these two. The process we use for joining them is the gradient uh, merge mosaic. That likes to have them from files. So you need to save these out and save them out in the um, PixInsight format. Yeah, so you want these saved out as a 32-bit. If I do this, so don't save them out as a TIFF or anything. Go into the XS IF um, system and save them out as a 32-bit. Once they're saved, these are your panels. Then you can go to your gradient merge mosaic, add the two files in, in this case. Nothing else we really need to do in here. This all works as pretty much a, a preset thing and then just global apply. We'll take it a minute to do this. It's got quite a lot of work to actually do to align the styles on the edge of the field of view and to balance the background. Okay. Now we always apply this before the images are stretched. Yeah, this is something that we don't want the background stretched. So there's the two images together. If we apply a dynamic crop, we can crop off the edges of the image.
There we go. Just close these two up out of the way. Now, if you scour over the background, you'd be really hard to find where it's actually joined. It does a really good job um, on this. It, it's uh, quite an impressive tool. <laughs> If we wanted to change the color, this is done with a, an extreme filter to buy color filters, a couple of different ways you can do it. Um, we could just straight away apply an SCNR to the image. If you just wanted to keep it real simple and not do a lot of work, you yeah, could just bring in something like a 50% SCNR. That will remove the green, turn it more blue. And then you can go on to stretch the image. You can use mask stretch. You can stretch it using the histogram and so on. So it's certainly something worth um, playing around with. There are other mosaic in techniques, but that's one of the simplest ones that you can use in here. If you've got any questions on that, then um, if you, you uh, post the questions up, we'll answer them as the show goes along. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing that screen. Um, and we're going to move over to our, our next speaker, um, which, if I remember rightly, was Steve. Yeah, Steve Ibbotson from the UK. Um, I've known Steve quite a long time, on and off, and uh, we're always probably swearing at each other in the background, whoever's got the clear sky on the sun. Steve does a lot of solar work and other deep sky imaging. Um, seems to get a lot more clear weather than what I do for certain months, and then it, it probably reverses back around again. Um, but I always like seeing Steve's uh, images. They're, they're interesting. And it's also very interesting to, to listen to. So I'm going to pass it over to you now, Steve. Thank you, Gary. Thank you for the uh, intro. Um, what I've got tonight is just basically what I've been doing this year, um, some images I've taken this year, uh, and some recent ones. Um, now, so I've got to remember how to do this. Uh, so, I want that up. That's why we're on every week, so we don't get, <laughs> we don't get rusty. <laughs> I haven't done this for a while. A while, I know. Yeah. Uh, is it share screen? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, I found it. There you go. There we go. Can you see that? Yes, yeah. we can. Good, good. Right. Um, this is a, in a series of what I sort of comically labelled how low can you go um, in this country. Um, and as Gary knows, uh, M20 is quite low down for us. So earlier on this year, I, I think I've just about fettled the, um, the William Noptix 132. I've had issues for it with it for years and years and years, but I haven't given up on it. Their initial problem with it was pinched optics when it got cold, which was um, sort of solved initially by wrapping several dew bands around it and keeping it nice and warm. Um, but it wasn't really a uh, a long term solution that so I've been fiddling with it and eventually I, I've, I've got a little bit more happy with it. So this is a uh, an image I took earlier this year, just uh, ten subs of six hundred seconds um, on M twenty with hydrogen alpha filter. So that's what we got there. Um, and then I decided to go a little bit lower uh, with the Helix Nebula. Now, this has taken over two years, and there is a massive eight subframes in this image of 1,200 seconds. And just to show you how low you can go, I uh, superimposed my, I put my horizon on to cast the shield. And there it is, just above mm. the horizon of my garage, which you can't get a car in because there's too much stuff in it. Also, once you get the car in the garage, you can't open the doors 
because the garage is too narrow. But that's it. So I can get about four subs per per uh, night on it. And I've had two goals at it. So I've stacked them together and we came up with this. I'm quite proud with that. Wow. To be honest. <laughs> wow. Very nice. We, we had um, Adrian on about Milky Way on last week's Star Party. Yeah. And it was actually quite annoying looking at his shots and seeing how much more of the Milky Way he's got below what we have here. Um, they're, they're very, very nice. They are. I was watching uh, it as well. So I, I, I <laughs> do know what the you mean. of the morning. Yeah, I do know what you mean on this. It, it, there are some really nice targets in the bottom of the Milky Way. And certainly from where we I just am, can't I get them. in the mountains, we've always got something in the way of the lower side of the Milky Way. So that's nice, nice image. Yeah. You never know in another six years, I might add colour to it. <laughs> Um, uh, perennial favourite probably not the best image in the world but I quite like it uh, again with the 132 and it seems that my processing on this could have done with uh, a little bit of work on the magenta stars uh, but through our early summer this year I don't consider that's been a bad effort uh, and Gary will know with the yeah. way we had we, yeah. we had quite a mixed bag this year. I, I only did a short amount. I think it was one run on this target mm. through the whole season. Um, it, it just worked out that it it seemed to be in the low cloud on the horizon for most of the time, or the moon was out, you know, yeah. one of those sort yeah. of things. So, um, but there is quite an easy fix for the magenta stars. Yeah, a real simple one. And you Invert can do that. It in picks yeah, inside yeah. and run the SCNR. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, you can run the um, the other the other add-on in um, Photoshop. Yeah, the Hasta La Vista yeah. uh, plug-in. Um, that works quite well on it. But to be honest, in these sort of shots, it doesn't overly bother me. No. Uh, it, uh, it looks quite nice. Um, it just adds a different colouring. And Gary? There's no wrong and right way, way to do narrowband. No, it, it's uh, as whatever as you get. Whatever you, you get is your image. You're the artist. You're you're the person who picks what you what colours you want and what you choose. So, um, and, and it's really the same as having green in it. A lot of mm. people come out and say, "Oh, you know, you, there's no green in space, or there's no this, or there's no that." It's like it's your interpretation. It's down to you. There's green in my narrowband in the images, as you can see. I, I think it adds another dimension. Mm. Uh, and I think it's like if I strip green out, I normally only strip a little percentage out. Um, otherwise, it just ends up to uh, one dimensional in a sense. It, it's just, you know, two colours. Yeah. Um, and at least if you play around a little bit. But it's, it's got some nice detail there. So, And the other good. thing that we have in common, Gary... I get bored of processing quite easily. <laughs> <laughs> Magnificent just, picture. Really nice. Thank you, David. Um, just to prove I do other things besides uh, nebulae, I do the occasional galaxy. This one has been an absolute pig to get this far. Um, I've tried several times, given up on it, and come back onto it. And this is about the best I can get. Um, this was taken with the 8-inch RC that I have, the Toscano. Again, something I've been working on for some years to get uh, to a situation where I can use it a little bit better to get my imaging skills with it a little bit better. So a couple of galaxies, um, the Welk and the... Oh, I can't remember the name of the other one, what the cat handle is for it. but. That was from springtime. And another couple of galaxies. I quite like these. But again, i got issues with the stars, which shows that the RC is not quite set up correctly. And when we start moving around a little bit further in the year, it will get put on the mount and it will get tweaked and tweaked and tweaked again to try and sort it out. There's a collimator coming in um, yeah. that's camera-based. 
um, that I've seen some good results on. That'd be here over the next few weeks. Um, and it's quite reasonably priced as well, but it looks very, very simple. Um, mm. with, which is uh, going to benefit lots of people. Yeah, because um, RCs are not the easiest thing. I actually find with the big one here at Cheshire is the easiest way of collimating that. Right, right. Yeah, that's me personally. But yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it's another basket case, case telescope that I've picked up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll get something out of it eventually. Or maybe not. <laughs> we'll see. I do uh, the Great Ball of Fire, as Gary said as well. This one's from uh, a couple of weeks ago now at uh, Kelling Heath Staff Party, which uh, we had a good, one a lovely sunny day. Problem was, where I'd set the mount up, there was a tree. So for a couple of hours around uh, midday, it was in the tree, so I had to do a little bit. Uh, uh, this one was just before midday, and uh, I just switched to the actual pixels. Um, that was quite an interesting sunspot there, um, which I had to twiddle with a little bit later. Uh, and where is he? Oh, that's the. Um, the filament again. I had a close up of that later. I also colour them up as well, uh, as Gary. And it shows the. I find that uh, the, applying the false colour seems to bring out my prominences on this one. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you also get quite a different view when you invert them. Uh, shows you much. So the, not more detail, but different detail it brings out, uh, certainly with the filaments, um, etc. I haven't quite got the uh, the transition from this to uh, prominence is quite off pat yet. I quite often separate the disc, even though they're all shot in one. Yeah. I separate the disc so I can invert the disc. Yeah, and then, and then put it back into the it back yeah. and you've still got the black background yeah, yeah with the prominences in. Um, but it is a little bit of work and yeah. if you don't like processing, um it, it yeah. turns into a chore. Mm -hmm. It is. Um now this is your fault, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're doing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because my normal double stack is can you what it was it? Is the lump the Coronado on the front? Yep. Yeah. But Gary put up something about um, this little beastie, the Daystar. Only problem was um, the adapters I had that I needed to get that to focus a little on the edge. I had to do a little work in the uh, in the garage on the lathe to make a small extension tube. Yep, of one hundred and fifty-five, I think millimeters that is. So that now goes in the back of the the lunt minus the lunt blocking filter. Mm. Then the day star on top of that. And then the camera, whatever I've done with that, with its tilt adapter. The knees on screen. Pops on top of that little beastie. Yeah. Because of might want the to background on. For a second, is just take yourself off of uh, screen share just so that we can see your camera a bit clearer. Right, I've got you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, zoom. No, I'm doing this wrong. Stop screen share. No, that's not that's like it. it. Thank you. Um, so we've now got. Wait a minute. Uh, so we've now got. This beastie, which is the lump, the adapter, 
and now the camera at the end. Um, yep. All fastened together, nice and rigid now with my nice adapter. Um, it is false threaded inside to stop the internal reflections. And we can then get in a little bit <clears throat> bigger on these wonderful uh, features on the sun. So what, what you'll notice now is, is that you get a lot more contrast in the active areas. So you get mm -hmm. a lot more, you, yeah. you'll see the solar flares as they're actually appearing. Yeah. Now this is only the third attempt yep. while I was away. Uh, and the first attempt with the rigid setup. So I was quite pleased to get that, followed by that one. And then this one uh, was a bit of a mistake because I left the Coronado front end on. Yeah. <laughs> it was pretty, pretty faint, uh, but I racked the exposure up and again. Um, that, that's yeah. the difference there, where you'll see that in the, the center, it's actually darkening out. So if that wasn't inverted, mm -hmm. you'd see, um, with the conventional double stacks, you'll see that they're, they're quite uneven on their field of view. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't realize that if you tilt some of this equipment, even only one millimeter, that's enough to move it. Um, you know, you could move it by 0 0.1, 0 0.2 of an Amstrong. Yeah, um, and you can get into all sorts of problems um, with the solar equipment, yeah. just in the fact that it looks like it's off band, and it's not. It's actually tilting the imaging system. Yeah, it's it's slightly out of focus at the edges, um, but I quite I, I quite like this to say it was a, a mistake by leaving the the Coronado on the front end, um, which I didn't mean to do, uh, and the group of people that are around me were what, looking at the screen. Um, we're saying, Steve, 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 it's very faint, we can hardly see it. And I said, well, go away and come back in 10 minutes when I've captured uh, a series of videos to yeah. process later, and then you can have a look. Yeah. So quite happy with that one, and thank you, Gary. That's all right. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant idea. Just a pity that the sun's getting starting to get a bit low now from here yeah I, i've got that new filter wheel in to test and it looks like it's going to be the spring now yeah sun's sort of mm -hmm. just starting to drop in the sky and get lower and lower and each time looking out when it does appear from behind the clouds i'm thinking gonna get no chance of some high resolution on that um this year at the way we're going now i don't do the moon it's lunar there you go. So I had a little bit of a play earlier on this year um, with the 178 on the back of the C11. It had one of its very rare trips this year onto the top of the, uh, the mount. Um, as you've probably seen on Facebook, there's been very few planetary images from me this year. The yeah. conditions have been so poor. Uh, and this was supposed to be a planetary night, but it never. But I occasionally do the right glow ball in the sky. Uh, it's, I don't know, it's frustrating this year. That's the easiest, the only way I can put it. You look at it, you know, there's no twinkle in the stars. There's nothing. The sky looks, you know, pretty good. Yeah. You get all the big equipment set up and then it's rubbish. You know, the, the first, you just look at it, the first image is coming in, you just think, oh, well, forget that. But... Yeah. Now, I think this is probably the best image I've had out of the 132. Uh, it was taken a few weeks ago. It's close in of the elephant's trunk. And I'm quite happy with that. Cool. Yeah. And uh, do the actual pixel sort of So... Yeah, quite happy with that. Probably a tad over sharpened, but never mind. A lot of this is also well managed. Look, I got it, colour, which is a, an unusual thing for me as well. So it's funny when you say like over sharpened or whatever. Yeah. A lot of it's down to the screen that we're actually processing on. Right. 
So this is the thing. I mean, I've got multi screens here, and as you know, two of them are the same manufacturer, same model, same everything, and they still look different. Yeah, yeah, on both screens, and they're meant to be fully calibrated. So I've got two. You put these things up, and then you look at them on a phone, or you look at them mm -hmm. on. Depending on how your brightness is set up, is how you you'll find this. You know. So I've got two screens here from same manufacturer, again, supposed to be uh, calibrated with the same um, calibration thing, and they're not. You can no. see the differences between them. Um, I always find and, some of them uh, have a slight red tint. When you look at the like the white text boxes, yeah. it's just got like a very slight red hue on it. Yeah. You can never seem to, to lose it. No, no. And I know you run 4K, don't you now? Yeah. Yeah, well, I haven't got that far yet. Um, just, um, 4K just shows you how bad your eyesight is, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, my eyesight is so bad that the glasses that I fetched from the opticians last week, I can't find them. <laughs> Didn't you not? I cannot find my new distance glasses. Um, a quick one from uh, another one from Kellen Heath. Um, I've got a it's quite fuzzy in the background here. I don't know whether it's actually background um, nebulosity or something to do with a couple of uh, the subs in the stack. But I thought I'd put that one in. And this one is my latest one. Yeah, I saw that earlier today. Yeah, IC5068, yeah. which is just down from the North American and the Pelican. In fact, some years ago, I did a mosaic, I think about a nine pane mosaic, just in HA, coming from the North American and Pelican through this area. And the plan was to end up at 1318. Yeah. Centre of Cygnus, but I never got that far. <laughs> um, probably the easiest way to do it is to go out and buy a, a wide field, what is it, 14 millimeter. Sandy yeah. lens and do it that way. But I never do That's it the beautiful. easy way. <laughs> I love that. That's beautiful. And it, it looks very, very um, different to most of the nebulae. Um, very abstract. So quite yeah. Like that. yeah. Yeah. And here's another one for you, Gary. I will ask you the question while we're here. Um, I have... This is a fairly blue ver version of M27 um, that's up earlier this year. Yeah. I have some other data that shows the outer shell much better. Yeah. How do I combine them in Pix Insight? Is it quite easy? Or is it you difficult? can actually just um, star align them against each other. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I generally put the two sets of data in to the batch processor. Yeah, right. so that then it's star aligning them when they come out, and then just um, integrate the images and crop off what's not needed. Right. That's my 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 favourite way of doing it, the quickest way of doing it. Yeah, but there are other ways of um, integrating them. You can do it in pixel mass, but you just start to complicate everything up a little bit if you're not sure on what you're doing. Um, and really, it likes percentages when you're doing that. Right. Well, you know, if you try and put 100% of an image against 100% of an image, it really cancels data out. You know, you've got to bring in, say, 40% of one and 60% of another or 80-20 or 50-50. So in general, I find it better to come in the other way, just batch process them all together. Yeah. Um, it Sometimes it can get a bit uh, funny if they're from different cameras on the, the image sizing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so then you might need to um, crop all of the images first, batch crop them so that they're all the same size. Yeah. yeah then run them through um, and do it like that. But, yeah, uh, image integration tool will probably get them together as long as they've been star aligned and use the star align in a separate module. Right, I've got you. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you a shout if I get stuck on that. Yeah. Yeah, um, Andromeda, I quite often do it too, because I end up with lots of bit images, you know, over the season and then just throw them all into a big stack and, and fire it away. But they all generally come from different cameras. Yeah. And uh, as, as you know, I'm, I'm a beginner in 
uh, I'm a beginning pixie. So, oh, I'll get there slowly. I'll get there slowly. No, thanks. thanks <laughs> right, that's that's, uh, that's the end of the run for me. Um, thanks very much for yeah, sharing that with us. It's always tips. always yeah. interesting to see what you're getting from uh, from here. Yeah. So, um, Stop. what we're gonna what we're gonna do now is um, there is a question that came up that I just got sent over. So. The difference um, between the Lunt double stack and the Daystar call, um, there's a couple of things there. If you use the double stack on the front of the Lunt, normally they're smaller in aperture than the actual telescope. So if you've got a 60 millimeter Lunt, they generally use a 50 millimeter double stack. So you're reducing the aperture of the telescope. The other thing is, is that you um, have sheets and sheets of glass if you actually think about this, yeah, because the double stack's got about three sheets of glass in there. Your main system is going to have three sheets of glass in it through the etalon, yeah, let alone the lens in the end. So if that's a doublet, it's got another two sheets of glass in there. And then when it, by the time you come down to the blocking filter, you end up with it really, really dark, really contrasty. So you end up then having to uh, push the exposure of the camera. The camera... Um, then has a, a major issue um, on running slow. So this is generally why double stacking doesn't produce really, really good results. Um, the other main thing is, is the actual blocking filter in the cork is larger, unless you're fortunate enough to have a, a LUNT 3400. Um, that means the size of the actual blocking filter that the camera's looking through. And on average, most people's blocking filters are up to somewhere about 1200, so that's 12 millimeters. If you've got a Coronado, they might run to a BF 50, something like that. So the actual aperture that the camera's looking through, yeah, it's very, very small. By changing it for the quark, you've got a larger aperture. So you end up with a more even field of view, and therefore you don't end up with the burning on the surface. So that's sort of answered that question. Um, what we're going to do now is go straight over to Sweden, um, to Andreas. Andreas is, um, always amazes me, really. Um, lives in a city, images from a balcony. Um, from what I remember, doesn't have a North Star alignment. Yeah, or not that easy anyway. Um, North, Star, North Star alignment. <coughs> so when you see... Um, what Andreas is producing, um, it, it's always interesting and it's always inspiring to say that, you know, whatever you read about imaging from light polluted areas or imaging from areas where you can't see pole stars and things like that, um, pay no interest to it. Yeah, look at things like what Andreas is doing because they're inspiring to people who are getting into this um, and even people who've been doing it a long time. So away you go, Andreas. Thank you, Gary. Yes, always humbling to hear your voice about uh, telling about me. And uh, that's uh, always feeling great to be, uh, be invited to these star parties. My main camera is uh, Celestron 8 inch and with the Hyperstar system. And I also use uh, Explore Scientific for my lunar and for my, uh, or for smaller objects. And uh, I live, like Gary said, in the sea, out in the suburb, suburb, and this borderline. I can see the North Star from my North Balkan, but I don't usually image from there, only the sun. So I often do a drift alignment and I have measurements, so I have uh, nowhere to stick the tripod and then I do a drift alignment. And I have go for the night. So uh, I have uh, custom Stellarium that uh, show, like, uh, show me how um, much image I can get for the night, how much uh, interferes with the uh, objects in my sight that I got from a uh, guy in Canada. And uh, he uh, his, has a channel that's called uh, Visible Star. Uh, Star. And um, I learned a lot of, from him uh, from just um, how to do a custom solarium and get the most of the night. 
So uh, this is going to be um, what they call it a uh, trip to my trip down the memory lane for uh, about eight about eight months, and uh, I'm going to show uh, all my pictures from not all of them. I have done a lot, so I'm going to pick the, the best ones, I think. So I see if I share the right screen. Did I share the right screen? We're seeing your folder at the moment. OK. Do you see it now? No. I can still see the folder. You might want to shrink the folder down and it might be behind that. Or you can stop sharing and go share again and pick the exact folder you want. Okay. Uh, try it again. Let's see. Mm, let's see here. Share screen. Oh, let's see. Oh, no. no. Sometimes a little tricky. Yeah. So there we go. Do we have? Um, do you it's see everything now? Yes. Yeah. You, it's, it's the, the gallery. It's, it's the, the gallery. gallery. Yes. Now we see a picture. Yes. Let's see if you click on an image. Now we click still, on. Still yes. showing gallery mode. Okay. Do you have a double screen? Do you have two monitors? No, just one monitor. Just one. Okay. Yeah. If you drop that down, the folder, that's in folder view at the moment. So if you go to the top and drop that down. Okay, no. Okay. So we can that's now showing. So we're just seeing your desktop at the moment. Yeah, that's the that's the point. Yes, desktop. Do you see in the okay. folder? Yes. So if you now close the or just shrink down your internet, you've got the internet displayed at the moment. Yeah, you're showing your web browser. Okay. If you open that folder and double click on one, it should bring up whatever your viewer is. We're back to your desktop. There you go. go. Okay. Is this correct now? That's it. Yep. yep. Yeah. This was uh, when I left off. This is the Ryan Abla. I did a remaster of my latest version. So I learned, I learned a lot of from uh, from guys at the internet and did a remaster of my previous image. So I bring me out the, the dustiness and the, and uh, I have some issues with the, with the then when I miss it, but I came out pretty good. So uh, 
Hopefully um, later this year, I'm going to image that one again. Then I start to do uh, solo photography again. And this is uh, started combining with uh, prominence and uh, chromosphere. So I took separate images and then started recombining them. So this is how I approach that one. So this is one of my first images that I recombine uh, data from two videos. So this was uh, like a trial and error. So, <laughs> so this is uh, one of my first images with uh, just that kind of method. Only before that, I shot only one video. Then this is the, called the Summer Beehive Cluster. This is with the Sellerson H inch with a reducer. This is uh, very late. I think it was the beginning of May. It's beginning to very be very bright here. So that was the last target for that season. So, and then I did some more uh, sun imaging. And this is the old program I used to the I uh, later on this year I switched programs for sun imaging. So this uh, was still a, a set of the WO's program. So this is the sun region 28 to 4 and 26. So and then we had a solar eclipse. So this is a full disk solar eclipse. So I did with my expert scientific and uh, Got the prominence and um, oh, well, try to do <laughs> uh, just a eclipse video. I think it was about uh, thirty four uh, percent uh, illuminated, uh, darkened here. So it that was this was the peak of that. Same way I did uh, that one. I did some high high power uh, solar imaging. So I, this is also combining prominence and, uh, and uh, just uh, chromosphere. And then I start using uh, from the oh, beginning this year, I started use uh, other, other algorithm when I stacked and I always do a uh, 2x3 two, two sample and it works out very well just in uh, in the, the just uh, just have the quality and uh, it uh, my image uh, turn out better and better uh, as I progress this year. This is the starting of the solar eclipse. You can see the moon is coming in on the right side, and then we have on the left side we have uh, down in the bottom we have uh, sun arc. And uh, that was very cool when this was the solar clip and, uh, and the sun arc. So that was pretty cool. And then I did a remaster of my previous version. I was, I was happy with that one, uh, but I did a blue one. So this is the, just a, another version. And then I did some more uh, up close uh, sunspot imaging. So um, this um, year was a uh, trial and error to always to improve, enhance my, uh, how to get the better and better quality images, new settings and new uh, ideas. This is a pretty cool image. This is a double uh, sunspot. I think it's actually three sunspot, but um, you can see um, two, in two sunspots on from the my first image I started in vert image and get out the more, more detail and uh, it was very fun to uh, work that way and I bought uh, just uh, EF, ERF for my uh, telescope and that helped uh, with uh, the heat and produce a lot of better images. This is a better um, cold beam uh, H alpha. So with this uh, filter, just um, isolate just the H alpha into the camera. So 
So I only get into the, my telescope just L alpha and just a specific wavelengths. So they called it a cold beam H alpha for solar. So I bought it from Germany in the summer. And uh, starting using that, I uh, also switched to uh, sharp cap and that combination was a success. Always uh, started uh, also with uh, uh, filming in 16 bit. Uh, so uh, Simon Tang video recommended that you should use a 16 bit uh, video. So I started in zero files. So this was uh, my take on it. So it was very promising. This is same solar and a little bit out, just uh, prominence and uh, chromosphere. This is also combined. I think this picture was picked up by an Italian uh, guy and uh, he was very, uh, he liked uh, how uh, the just the picture came out. So uh, they got a lot of uh, what you call a likes or uh, I, I think it's called uh, passionate astrophotography and uh, no, it's bouncing around the internet, just that one. This is the, you can see the filament and uh, this is also progressing a little bit all the time. And uh, just when you do solar is always uh, weather and uh, you have high clouds, <laughs> clouds and uh, atmospheric seeing. And the sun is always, in the summer is pretty higher, it's about 54 uh, degrees in the maximum and it's, it's very low now, so it's hard to do the sun now. This is the, this is the middle on the, um, called the NLC or not a lot night. This is, is crystals up in the atm atmosphere. This is what we get in the summer. It's pretty cool. They got shapes like tornadoes, and uh, so this was shot. This post was shot by my uh, Sonar X1 on, on a tripod and manual focus. So this is um, this. I like uh, bluish color, and uh, I like this uh, nights at the summer. Just a bit nosilotic clouds, and then uh, Saturn came out. It's pretty low here, it's about 10 degrees. So this is was my best image for this year. It's getting higher and higher, but um, yeah. And then we have Saturn with the ion shadowing. So this is one of my better image at Saturn with my 8H. So, um, so I've done a lot of planetary photography with ion Europa and other moons. It was... Uh, Pretty cool. This was Saturn and uh, Jupiter is around 17 degrees, so it's very uh, not very high here. Then I go back to um, some more solar photography. Um, you can see a sunspot uh, rolling out, and you can see the filament in the on the surface. So, so I'm getting better at that one. <laughs> and then we're back to hyperstar. <coughs> This is the M, M33 Triangle Galaxy. Mm. So I try to improve it a bit. So this is about four hours about hyperstar. So it's very faint here from when I shoot it from a bottle nine zone. So um, it uh, came out pretty good. I like it. It's beautiful. This is the Embryo Galaxy or NGC 1333. It's a very hard target because it's covered in clouds. And uh, just uh, when the shooting, just this target is very faint and uh, just obstruction of the, just the light pollution destroys often all the data. But this came out pretty good. I think it's about two, three hours of data. So I'm pretty pleased with that one. Last one is uh, M31 Andromeda. This is combined data, about three hours from last year and this year. I was out one day and it looks clear, but the data was rubbish. So I have combined with a, 
I have to uh, combine a brilliant idea. So this is the first time I did uh, star reduction. So I take uh, star plus plus and remove all the stars and add the uh, pictures. And then I combine them with a raster in uh, Adobe Photoshop. And I think it worked out very well. The stars didn't become as um, prominent and the, just the one is hanging out my back the, uh, on the wall, back on, on, on me, that image. I did some, uh, so, uh, some uh, moon photography. This is Copernicus and Kepler. So I um, enjoyed doing high power uh, lunar photography. This was a pretty clear night. Moon was mm -hmm. out. Uh, about, I think, 82% illuminated, so I didn't do any uh, deep sky, so I imaged the moon and planets that night. Mm -hmm. It was pretty nice. This is the Tycho crater with all these moons. This is uh, also one of my better images. Yeah. And um, the, the secret to shoot uh, uh, just the moon is I shoot we the uh, red filter only, and then I process it out. The data is very clear, and uh, and I use a 174 mm with my and uh, power mate on my celestial eight inch, so it runs about about 4,000 millimeters. So this was a clear night. This is what's was very cool. I uh, the next one is right in. Right, uh, yes, I inverted so I look like a bird of prey. If you can look, this is the Montes Apennines or the mountain of the mountain chain. So, oh, yeah, it was pretty cool. If you flip them back and forth, you can see um, two wings on the sides, and now uh, well, you can imagine somewhere it <laughs> looked like a bird of prey. I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. That was just a mistake, and I thought it was cool, so I kept it just for. Uh, for myself, and uh, it's online also, it's pretty cool. I like it. This is uh, Motaris Crater, it's uh, the crater in the bottom. Always a lot of uh, turbulence there, it's very hard to shoot and um, pretty good, I think. It came out pretty good. And I did uh, Uranus also that night. That one, uh, one of my better images of that one. So. Amperture rules, so the, this you can't see any detail or clouds, so you have to uh, like a 14 inch and very clear. And but it's, I'm pretty pleased with that one. This is Plato, and uh, you have the Alps, the Al Alpine on the right. So it's uh, also from the same night. And this is Aristotle and. and Exodus. This is also from the same night. This was in the more in the shadow, so this wasn't clear as clear as the other pictures. This is the M104 Andromeda, uh, Sombrero Galaxy. This was a, re a remastered version from I shot in uh, April, and uh, I wasn't happy with the my processing, so I go back and reprocess this uh, for uh, one of those cloud and came out a lot better than I expected. And I uh, hopefully to come back in this with a larger scope so I can uh, separate clouds and everything on the was. So I set out for, to shoot some bird galaxy and that what I did. Um, that's what I always do when I'm not uh, satisfied with data. So I go back to old data that I think I can improve, that I call a remaster. Or, but uh, I probably gonna left it now to uh, maybe uh, another year on uh, with other equipment. The last one is M13 Hercules, also a remaster version. I was not happy with my latest version. It was a lot of uh, light pollution. The stars were uh, not color corrected. Now it's color corrected in, in the middle with some yellow and uh, some red and uh, some blue stars. So, um, so this was my final image for tonight. So this uh, is, uh, was shoot, I think, uh, about four hours on that one. I have to dump one 
three fourths of it because it was not bad, just um, bad um, uh, guiding. It was uh, seeing was wobbly, so I I'm very what do you call it? I am um, I want the best data, so I ended up with own, just only one hour. So I probably will come back to this later sometime. <laughs> Well, thanks for that, Andreas. It's been really interesting looking through. Um, very similar to a lot of us. You don't just image one thing. Yeah, you, you're... Um, yeah, I mean, all... I've tried to be as dynamic. I'm uh, I'm a spur in the moment. So I do, when I shoot, I, I do a lot of uh, moon. I do planets. I do everything I can from uh, to... Uh, in Sweden, we have... Uh, from middle of May to end of um, end of August, we don't see the stars, so uh, so I have to in, invent something. So uh, solar came into uh, play last year, so I started with that. And uh, so this is uh, my take on astronomy. But that, that's what it's about. It's about everybody's different view and what they see, you know, or what they're after. And and you know, when we were talking earlier, you're saying that. You know, you're after going out and progressing each time or after improving on whatever data you got the last time. And I think that's what makes an astrophotographer, in a sense, that they're recognising what's going on. And really, they're never happy. They're actually quite a miserable bunch of people because their images, they, they, they look at them, they process them. And within two days, normally they're after improving on that. They, they see errors in it or they see the things that they don't like or the weather's interfered with it. So that, I think that's part of being an astrophotographer in a sense is that you're always chasing these different um, these different things and uh, chasing improvement in it. Yeah, um, always chasing, do as dynamic as can. So i always chasing uh, different kind of objects. So uh, you probably see a... Um, bad image from me uh, from uh, same target i don't i but often it, throw that data off and uh, I, I, I i like it when people do post what they just get from the night it, you know it's never perfect we have problems with equipment we have problems with weather and um, software and all sorts of different things and and you know that's just the way the imaging runs i mean this time of year from here probably get an hour or two hours before the fog moves in because of the temperature changes. So we're getting quite misty air uh, right way through October. And that, that's a general thing. So you just have to run with an hour's worth of data. If you're lucky, or maybe two hours worth of data. It's annoying sometimes because you think, oh, that, that could be a lot better. You know, but we've had a question coming on here and uh, it was quite a way up on this, but it was, somebody asked, what our favorite targets are to image. So I'm probably going to say with mine would be the horse head. Um, I find the horse head quite a challenging target. Um, it's not easy and it has quite a few bright stars in there. So depending on the equipment, it can cause reflections in the images. It can cause all sorts of other issues. Um, but it's quite nice to get the structure underneath the horse head. So depending on what optical system, but that's mine. What's yours, Andreas? Uh, Orion is probably my, uh, that, that's, um, my favorite and also horse head and flame. I had done a couple of times. And even on my back, I have uh, Andromeda. That's also um, I, one of my favorite targets because it's um, hard, uh, hard to shoot from here. And uh, I hope one day to, uh, to be uh, satisfied and uh, perfecting it so uh, and uh, also some uh, hard challenge like uh, sombrero galaxy so this also i came back several times with uh, different kind of equipment uh, and i like to challenge myself so that is also a favorite of mine cool um steve ibbotson what's your favorite target That works now, I've unmuted it. Um, my favourite one target is, it varies. It's the latest challenge, I think. Yep. 
a few years ago, three or four years ago, somebody said, I did the uh, flying bat. Mm-hmm. SH2 129. Yeah. Uh, somebody said, are you going to try for the squid? So I didn't say anything. Went away and Googled it and thought, go on then. I'm 84 hours into that image. Wow. For three years. Um, so it's probably the latest challenge yeah. on the solar. It's the quark lump now. That's it's it's the challenge, I think. Uh, and it's always a challenge. Um, yeah. It's whether to get... As you said earlier, it's trying to go out and guess, get the best you can under the conditions that are you image under. My condition's not perfect. I've got a, an LED street light 10 yards from where my scope's, where my mount is. Uh, yeah. um, and it will be like that until I'm six foot under or we move. Yeah. Um, I know which one it was probably more likely to be. Uh, uh, <coughs> uh, it's the latest challenge from here, as I say, it, um, the squid. And now it'll be the, the quark and whatever. Or, like, that stupid thing I, I started with earlier on. How low can you go? Scraping yeah. the horizon. It's just, it's, it's just a constant challenge. I don't think I've got one favourite object to go back to and back to yeah. and back to. There's it's, plenty of targets I'm not happy with. Oh, yeah. And, and that, that, it's really weird. It's like, um, I try and get on targets early now. So as soon as they're really up high enough to start imaging, even though we might class them as still a little bit low, I'm mm. after them. And that is because over the last couple of years, I've ended up losing the targets through the season. So something like Thor's helmet. Yep. That cluster. Yeah. Um, I thought, oh, I'm going to leave it last year. I'll leave it until it gets a bit higher. And then we went through a load of rubbish weather. <laughs> and then I back on it. And it's like, I can't believe it. I've lost it for a season. It's disappeared yeah. again. Um, or it just and it's really it. annoying. I suppose my... Um, Nemesis is M78. Yeah. I've tried several times uh, and scattered across the web are my poor attempts of M78. Yeah. They might be poor, but they get put out with the ones that I consider good as well. So I just put... Yeah, that's it. I, I mean, Andreas is M104, uh, Sombrero. That's another mm. one that can be challenging from here. Yeah. Um, you know, it's always skirting in the rubbish from this area. So there are those targets, and really you're just happy to get them sometimes, let alone actually, you know, get a nice, a nice sort of target. Yeah. But we're, um, we're joined by um, Steve Maglia tonight from Canada. Steve's the owner of uh, Ontario Telescopes. We've known each other quite a long time now. Um, Always doing something together in the background. It's always a um, pleasure to chat and catch up. So how's things going out your side, Steve? Very good, Gary. Thanks for uh, having me on. Um, and I apologize for crashing the party, um, Scott, and not letting you know I was... I think it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll try to make a habit of it then. Yeah, um, no problem. <laughs> Um, you know, th things are good here. It, it, it's amazing. We have this really rare phenomenon uh, that's happening right now here in the Toronto area of Canada. It's called a clear sky. And, oh, wow. um, <laughs> <laughs> but of course, we have a full moon at the same time. So it, it's like hand in hand, right? right. Um, uh, th this past summer has been, been a bit of a, a pain uh, for astronomy, I think, um, in most of Canada, because if it wasn't... Uh, cloudy weather and storms we were having um uh forest fire smoke from from bc this year it was completely out of control um and a lot of there was a lot of hard work to get that under control and hope, i think they they've got most of it done now and then northern ontario was bad as well so um we were fighting a lot of smoke and and that's something that i picked up in a lot of the well i don't want to say a lot in the images that i was taking 
um, you're, you're able to see it. So, you know, you finally get a clear night and it doesn't look like it's bad and but you can't see that smoke at night when it's really, really high up. Right. Um, yeah. And uh, it, uh, it added to some of the fun, but um, yeah, you know, it, it, uh, um, there was, uh, there was, I was able to get a couple of really cool shots. I'd, I'd love to, uh, to, to share with, with everyone. And, yeah, feel uh, free. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, you know, we were talking about um, uh, uh, favorite targets and, you know, one of the, one of the targets I, I love, I don't want to say it's necessarily a target, but a region. I absolutely love the Cassiopeia region, right? Cause um, I went to it uh, a couple of years ago. Here's uh, my first attempt at it. Um, and I was quite happy that I was actually able to get star color in Cassiopeia and I was able to catch a bit of the Pac-Man um, nebula there. But this was with um, uh, very poor processing skills. This was uh, before Gary, <laughs> I like to call it. <laughs> and um, uh, uh, it was with uh, an unmod unmodified camera and, and some uh, basic equipment. Uh, but I was quite happy with the shot and I, I printed it out and uh, you know, it's enough to wow some friends and, you know, maybe get yourself a free beer or something. Um, so, you know, from there, I, uh, this past summer, I went after it again with, with different equipment, um, again, a DSLR and, uh, um, it's full frame. Um, and I was able to capture a lot more and, and you can see in, in the, in the corners kind of, uh, unfocused and that that's the result of the, the smoke that we had. Um, that was wreaking havoc, but I was quite happy that I was able to get more. So, you know, I was quite surprised when I saw the shot out to get some of the nebulosity and the heart and soul nebula in the back corner. Um, I wish I had framed this up a little bit better because just below here is, would be the uh, double cluster. Um, and I got remnants of the, of the bubble and, and up in the corner and, and so on. So, you know, a really, really nice, uh, beautiful area. There's so much going on. And this is what I found myself doing a lot more of is these really wide field type of, type of images because um, you can collect so much. And then when you throw it up an Astro bin, you get to see a whole bunch of uh, um, circles pop up with uh, 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 through the plate solving to, to see what's there. So I find that quite interesting. It's, it's I, I would not have guessed that there's so much color in that region. It's really beautiful. Yeah, it is. And I was quite, quite surprised by it. like the star colors that are there. And then there's some, some nice yellows and the reds and, and the blues. Um, uh, now th this camera that I use, this is, was a, a, a Nikon uh, D810A. So it, it's meant for astrophotography and more sensitive in the high region alpha region. Um, uh, band, band pass, uh, sorry, wavelength, that's it. Um, and uh, I need to at least speak as if I know what I'm talking about <laughs> and use the right words. But yeah, I, I was quite amazed how, how it came up. And I think next year, um, this is probably gonna be another one, another region that I'll, I'll spend some more time on. Um, and the beauty of Cassiopeia is that it's always up. So I can, I can always uh, come back to this, to this area um, quite easily. A and uh, uh, the beauty of it is, um, you know, to take a picture and then plate solve it and then get my mount to go back to it and get it all framed up uh, nicely is is a nice little thing. But I want, I want to share another image. Sorry, you know I was quite happy and quite proud of this one. Um, uh, the uh, M31. Uh, this is a picture. I didn't take this picture. My my son took this picture. Um, my son Lucas. He's uh, oh. fourteen. Um, and uh, he came uh, camping with me. This was at uh, Scott. I'm sure you remember Starfest. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this is at the Starfest campground. So every month, um, uh, now that we're allowed to go, um, uh, we, me and some friends would go up and uh, we would image uh, for the weekend. I usually spend the weekend uh, testing out new equipment um, and uh, uh, or a camera uh, just so I can get familiar with it and know what, it, what it's going to do. But... Um, uh, my son, uh, both my boys came up with me that weekend and they wanted to do some imaging and, and, and this is what uh, my son Lucas got and I helped them with the, uh, the processing. Uh, so I call this post Gary. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, 
uh, and, and I've been in, uh, I'm very, very proud of this picture uh, that he took. Absolutely. And, I'm sure and, he and, is too. Yeah. We, we printed it out. We had, he has it up on his wall and, and he shows his friends and uh, um, uh, I'm sure he'll probably try to use it one day to get a beer as well. Uh, we'll just have to talk about that age um, <laughs> or whatever. I don't know. will kill me. So, right. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it, it I, I was proud. I was proud to to see this picture, and at least I figured there's at least one good picture of, of the season with the uh, with everything that we were battling here in terms of uh, uh, not having clear skies and with the weather and the smoke. Um, uh, it, in most of North America, really suffered from a lot of that uh, uh, smoke uh, that happened uh, from the forest fires this year, um, and. Uh, Hopefully, hopefully next year won't be as bad. The uh, um, uh, and, and it's just exciting to see, right? Um, you know, work like this, like that image of Andromeda, get pay off, and and to have a beautiful image of it. It's a lot better than than an Andromeda picture that I took. Um, so uh, you know, kudos to uh, to Lucas on that one. Um, you know that that that's really it. But you know, like I said, we have this rare phenomenon tonight called the clear sky. I'm gonna try to get polar aligned. <laughs> I've had my mount sitting in my observatory for about a month and haven't been able to to polar align it. Um, and uh, I got I have that new firmware that Jerry released. I haven't had a chance to try it out yet. So okay. <laughs> I want to see what we can what we can do now. Um, yeah, that'd be good if you could give that a try. Yeah, yeah. I want to at least tell you what I what I. Well, uh, get get some feedback uh, to you on it, but you know, it, other than that, it um, uh, you know, we're getting into the busy season now. Scott, I'm sure you're starting to see it too. Things yep. just start ramping up, right? Oh People yeah. Are getting into astronomy, um, telescopes make great gifts, um, and uh, uh, there was there was another dealer who 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 talked to our, our club a long time ago. This is before I got into the business, um, and he and uh, he. He had he had mentioned about um, there was a new video game that was coming out and everyone was waiting for it, and he said it sold so many hundreds of thousands of copies and he felt you know that's so hundreds of thousands of eyes that are not going to be looking up right but uh, I've noticed now that there's been a lot of uh, uh, the resurgence in in the hobby and people want to get their kids into it and uh, uh, actually been noticing a lot of younger um users getting in and buying equipment and I, wanting to learn so that's really encouraging and uh you know how to have to have this renewed interest in in the hobby i think it's uh, i think it's important um to keep keep things going and then you know it's good to have skills to be able to pass down so i don't want to get teary eyed or reminiscent on anyone <laughs> on that but uh um it's exciting to to see but uh anyways, that's i wanted to share that and like to crash a party and and i got oh. that invite from gary and, uh, it's yeah. always good. Um, yeah. Always good to have you on, and you haven't been on for quite a while. So, yeah, yeah. I think the last time I was on went, was a UK uh, party, star party, for yeah. like Whatever. April, right? Yeah. And and uh, it's funny the time does really just fly by. All of a sudden, you, you look and you go, "Wow, that was like such and such," you know, June or something like that. I, I mean, yeah. October, and it, it feels like it's only like the end of July. I wasn't yeah. bad weather, you know, in feeling. It would just feel like a couple of months or That's what, the time right. does seem to fly by now. Yeah, there's some good and bad to that. It's good because, uh, that, uh, well, it's bad because it's, everything's moving really quickly, uh, especially when you're really busy. Sometimes you need to stop and, and, and take it all in. But it's good that means that summer is going to come a little sooner now. Yeah. So, <laughs> and being a Canadian, um, I'm surprised they let me back in the country whenever I used to travel abroad. I don't like snow and I don't like winter. <laughs> and if that was a test to get back into the, into the country, I'd probably fail miserably. Um, so. Uh, Us having a mild October here is really yeah. unusual. You know, I'm, I'm the same thing. You yeah. know, we haven't had the fires on, you know, or heating on much. It's been pretty mild right the way through October, even though it's not necessarily been the clearest weather. Yeah. It, and that's it, really it's unusual. been 20 degrees today. Right, yeah, which is, it was twenty today. It was raining, but it was twenty. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm like, well, that's good. It's just going to make the winter feel shorter. Yeah, yeah. roll on November. Yeah, see if we can get a few more warm days in November, and 
and we're on a result. But absolutely, yeah, yeah definitely messed up. But I really appreciate that. Thanks for joining us, Steve. Oh, thanks for having me, Gary and, and uh, Scott as well. Thanks for letting me in. Oh, anytime, anytime, Steve. You're always welcome. Appreciate that. Always welcome. That's great. Okay. Uh, we have had a nice run here. It's very, very interesting uh, presenters, and it's always great to see, um, uh, you know, the uh, images that everybody's able to contribute. I think that, you know, I mean, our theme is sharing, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, sharing the cosmos and uh, um, a shared cosmos. And gosh, what better way to share than to uh, show uh, people what what can be imaged, you know, because these are, you know, you're capturing the data, uh, you're showing things that are invisible uh, to the, to the uh, um, you know, to the naked eye. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, it just, it makes people just dive in deeper. You know, it's really cool. It's really cool. Um, okay. Um, I think... I think that we are going to um, go ahead and uh, go to like a, a 10 minute uh, break and we'll come back with uh, Maxi Filares and uh, uh, who's, who is our second co-host here at the uh, Global Star Party tonight. And he's got a lineup of speakers uh, across South America. So. Uh, which is which is really cool. It's it's wonderful, to, you know. As David Levy was talking about earlier, that uh, we can actually have these uh, global events, you know. And um, so, oh, is that your Steve? Is that your uh, your uh, squid? That's his squid. Great. Oh, that's your Adrian. Is that yours or is that Steve's? That's He's definitely me. Steve's. That's Steve. Um, okay. Yeah. So that's I came cool. in just the way mute high. button as well. There it is. Yeah, yeah that's too narrow that's of a Steve's field too. for something I would shoot at. I <laughs> like the uh, wide angle. Yeah. Um, Look at that. I, it's so ghostly. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. See if I could find it. I found it just before we go into the break. This is 84 hours. Is that what you, you were mentioning earlier? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, the subs are all 30 minutes. That is that is a deep shot. That is beautiful. That's, that's, I can't remember that it's three or four years involved in that. I mean, I haven't done any of this year. This year. Mm. So, uh, I've had a break this year. <laughs> Well-deserved one. <laughs> Uh, apparently, it's much, much easier with the CMOS cameras hmm. for hmm. some reason. Don't know why. Great. Yeah. There was a question. Uh, maybe this is for Gary, um, but for anyone in our group that might be able to answer it. Uh, it says his, Lubo in China is asking, he has an Edge, uh, Celestron Edge uh, 8HD, and it states that it's a focal length of 2,032 millimeters. But when plate solving, ASI Air states focal length of 2089. Uh, the back focus to the sensor of the telescope should be 13.5 millimeter. Is, is something wrong with this? That's not quite close back focus. Um, but without seeing an image, um, and I always say the same thing, an image tells me a lot of what's going on on the system. So... Um, but a back focus of 13.5 millimeter um, is very, very close. Right. Yes, it is. Uh, and, and if I remember rightly, an HHD runs at about, I'm, I'm guessing here, but I've got a funny feeling it's about 75 millimeter back focus on it. Hmm. Yeah. I, I have a, there's something in me saying that it's up in the, the 70s for the back focus. So, I, I'm not quite guessing where the back focal of 13.5 millimeters is coming. No, from. I'm sorry, it's 13.5 centimeters. Oh. Centimeters, right? I was going to say, yeah, because 13.5 millimeters, and that's what Andreas is putting down there. So, yeah, yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, I, I'm. Um, I would need to see the, see images, but the, the data that's held on a lot of these devices for plate solving isn't always correct for all of the equipment. That is one thing I will say. Um, it, it doesn't matter what system you're using, it isn't always correct for the equipment. So it will generally pick it up um, and solve on the area. If it doesn't, then you'll just have to play around with the figures a little bit to, to find an area that is coming in and, and plate solving on. But your other thing as well is, is to try it without, I think it said it was on the ASI app, yeah? to try it on a, a standard system. So try it in something like SharpCap, connect it up to a laptop and plate solve it in SharpCap and see whether the figures work in there. Yeah. Okay. I'm well, it could be that. that there's some rounding error with this. Maybe the, the pixel size is not quite correct. That would throw the scale off. There's a lot of other variables in there, not just the optics. Yeah. I, I, I would be trying in another piece of software just to check that it's not an error in the, um, the, the configuration. Hmm. Very good. Okay. So I will, um, we'll switch to a 10 minute break right now. And, um, uh, we'll come back with Maxi Filaris. So hang in there. Hello, all. Just made a quick stop by. I'll be watching along from the background while... Um, I'm playing around with a few other images that I got from uh, Oki Tex. Um, everything I everything I have is wide. Um, playing around with um, an Orion you're shot. You so. still working on it, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and even better, somebody somebody gave me data and said, "Hey, work on this." <laughs> okay. <laughs> and their data, of course, looks better than mine, so. I figured I, I still have the USB stick somewhere, so I'll put it somewhere and eventually I'll get to it and play around and see what I can do. Maybe, uh, maybe try a few different things with it. Um, ended up with the cat's paw nebula making uh, photo bombing one of my shots. Um, didn't realize that if you get high enough on the Milky Way, just if you just get some of the southern region, there's two um, NGC objects. Yes. Uh, the cat's paw is one of them. And it just. And also, uh, the, the, the bug nebula is a planetary nebula. Uh, and oh, it's, I, I don't know if it's called the, the, the squid nebula. Uh, not like that one that has presented a, a few minutes ago. But yeah. there is another one. Uh, oh, it's close. Oh, no, the, no, the, the shrimp, the shrimp nebula. Yes. Yeah, there's there's one that um is above the cat's paw, mm -hmm. and after the cat's paw is where the cutoff is, from where I was able to see, uh, down in Oklahoma. Oh. So, so yeah, there's. Yeah, moving south, a, a few, it's like a few more Easter eggs are becoming visible. That's the first time I saw the cat's paw. And, um, oh, excellent. <laughs> and it, yeah, it shows up. It, it, it looks like a cat put his footprint on my mm -hmm. picture. So <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it was a nice little surprise. I, I was actually able to do a mosaic, it was just four images um with i believe uh it's like a 35 millimeter um on a full frame modified dslr and it worked out I, i'm on later tonight so you'll see the picture um yes yes i will be connected I'll, uh, yeah i'll i'll show a few of the other pictures that i'd found since the last time i shared um some of the images that i had and awesome. um yeah, it was still just looking at that sky was a uh, it was a beautiful thing. Um, that's 
part of my experience is pulling out binoculars and seeing if I can find a few um, deep sky objects with just the binoculars. Um, that's always uh, that's always a lot of fun. <laughs> And of course I have to dark adapt. So it's like, if I want to go back and forth between looking at a screen and looking at the actual sky, I have to be careful with uh, how much I look at the screen. So it can, uh, <laughs> it, it may not always be fun, but it's. Uh, you have to yeah, pause and then you continue. Yeah. And you keep, yep, you keep keep working at it is what I try to do. Um, <laughs> and, you know, you have, made, uh, you you might try to process, no, one, and no, two, tw uh, twice. Uh, maybe three times uh, the same image. And maybe it will be different, <laughs> you know. Uh, th that's uh, insane. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's well learning new tools. I think uh, I think I'll definitely be taking some time in the not so distant future to really try and get a handle on Pix Insight and watching uh, you, Gary, with some of the uh, cleanup work that and scripts that Pix Insight has. Um, definitely, you know, I, I look at the data that you start with and what you're able to do with that data through PixInsight. And I'm thinking, okay, this is, this is something that's got to be in my future. If I want to clean some of the, you know, if I've captured good data, I should be able to do something with it. I know Max, you use PixInsight as well. No, but not, not like Gary and Steve. No, no, I don't think so. Yeah, no, I, but I know I'm you know, Gary. You're the, uh, a long time. Well, you say six years, but that, that I, I'm in baby well, pants. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm very new. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's something that would be in my future. I mean, taking some time to figure that out, um, just to get it to where it it does what I like to do. Um, every once in a while, I do like wide field classic astrophotography, where I'm boring in on a subject and trying to get some detail from that. Um, I think I finally figured out how to take a decent flat. And mm. I still have to work. I got to get to where I'm taking decent flats and, you know, st stacking those in with darks, bias uh, frames and things. Um, so I'm still working at it. And um, it's, uh, it's still... It's still fun just to be on that journey the whole time. You so you have to enjoy the travel. Yeah. I, the experience and, you know, for every single detail you learn and you realize, oh, no, I didn't know that. So, and then change yeah. your mind and then process again what you did. And <clears throat> it's a... To grow a snowball of mankind, of no mankind, no sorry, uh, of uh, thoughts and knowledge. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the the flats are worth working on. The flats are really worth. It, yeah, it, they always seem daunting when you first start doing them, but uh, once you get them right, they're easy. Yeah, but they make yeah. such a difference to the images. Well, I, I saw a, a, a small a small difference already with the uh, less than crummy flats that I took. Um, I saw the image, the back, difference it, it, in the quality of the nice. image after stacking it. And I, I know the flats still aren't perfect. They're, they're still a little bit of ways away. Yeah. But, yeah. It, um, it, if you can get them into a bit of software, try and get a mean value of 22,000. So even if you put uh, um, a screen, a monitor, yeah, put a, a cloth over them, you can preset the value then. Once you find what that setting is for your camera, yeah, so you just take a few of them and, and find out what the mean value is and try and get it around 22,000. Okay. And if you take it in a controlled environment, in a sense, yeah, yeah. 
it's really easy to do. So I have to, I started off by aiming it at the screen and putting some paper in front of it. I got to have a t-shirt somewhere. So yeah, there's some more, explore, it's some more work for me to do, but um, I think I'm, I'm getting a little closer. Cool. Okay, everybody, we're back. Um, hope you had a, a few minutes to stretch your legs and get a cup of coffee or a sandwich or something. And uh, uh, we are now up for our second session of the Global Star Party, uh, a shared uh, cosmos. And uh, uh, up next uh, is our second uh, uh, co-host for the night, uh, which is uh, Maxi Filares. Maxi uh, was first introduced to me as someone that could do amazing things with a smartphone and, and his, uh, his uh, smaller telescope. Uh, since we've gotten to know him on Global Star Party, he's shown us uh, his uh, breadth of talent and uh, his amazing enthusiasm as an astrophotographer and as an astronomer. Um, we really enjoy having him on, uh, his bright dis disposition, uh, his, uh, his, his uh, knowledge of uh, how to get the best performance out of his gear and how, how you too can get the best performance out of yours, um, you know, is, is a, a wonderful delight, uh, you know, to have uh, Maxi on, on the uh, Global Star Party. Uh, Maxi, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, you've got uh, several guests and uh, thanks for putting that together. Well, thank you, Scott. Uh, hi, everyone. Good, uh, good night for on, uh, good afternoon. Uh, well, first of all, thank you. Uh, like I say last weekend to you, it's an honor to me be here, being uh, co-hosting with uh, Gary Palmer. He's an awesome guy <laughs> with all <laughs> that pictures that he did. And well. Uh, tonight, well, I'm I'm going to be a bit a little short well, of my presentation because uh, I have some some friends and colleagues from here from uh, Argentina uh, that uh, we are uh, uh, doing uh, astrophotography, uh, as, uh, observations, uh, and and everything. And you know, you also do uh, this kind of a friendly and cooperation in, in, well being together uh, and of course uh, by the media and social networks we also connected uh, even uh, the, the distance between us so well uh, what I want uh, to talk uh, in this GSP is uh, about what I what we did uh, with our local group of uh, astronomers uh, observers here in my city Chilcoy. Uh, I want to share my screen. Uh, okay, do you see it? Yes. 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 Okay. As always, we see that beautiful eclipse picture, Maxi. Yeah. 
It's a, it's a classic. <laughs> it's a classic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know when I will change this background. I don't know. I in maybe next, never. Maybe <laughs> never. In the next eclipse, uh, Max. Uh, in the uh, uh, yes, the ring, the uh, solar eclipse. Maybe the next year, right? Uh, I don't remember. Yeah, but... I don't remember. If, if it's not next next year, it's the the next one. <laughs> well, <clears throat> what I'm going to show you this is a little flyer where the the southern part of the sky here in Chivilcoy uh, was promotioned in the International Observation of the Moon, of the, the day of International of Observation. And we met, of course, in our uh, southern sky uh, park that we have here in, in our city. And well, this is uh, where at the, maybe at this time more uh, one hour before, and I would be with my uh, with my little equipment. In this case, uh, Max Utov, uh, a, a mount very uh, light, and my camera CW to to do some uh, projections with this uh, projector and my notebook. But also, uh, we have some, this is a, a homemade telescope that did uh, my professor Armando Sandanel, and he's teaching how to put uh, the, the, the telescope uh, quadrilateral mount to these um, uh, alums of his uh, teaching. And also in this place, we have this, uh, it was a, a father with his son that they, they put, they, they come with his little telescope. It's a little refractor, uh, uh, 70 and 300 millimeters. And because uh, he never saw uh, the moon with this uh, little scope, I think it was a, a new one. So we teach him how we use it because it's, it's very simple, but when you start, of course, uh, maybe you have to, maybe I, I think we, of uh, uh, of us, uh, we don't have some someone who teach us, and sometimes so you have to 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 see how it, how it works. So, well, this is another picture, and this is a uh, the play the the world that we'll be projecting while we see. And I was prepared here. Here you can see it's the moon uh, pointed with the, the Maxuto. And of course, here's the, <laughs> the moon. So it was a very clean afternoon, uh, very a little cold when the sun goes down, but uh, it was OK. Uh, well, this is when the, it turns uh, more night, maybe 8 p.m. Uh, and we are having, in this case, I was pointing to Venus because we have it uh, very at the west. Uh, um, I think I was, it was almost uh, 25 or 30 degrees. Uh, it was very high. So also we saw the ISS passing by uh, and we, well, for the people that, that came, uh, we told them that this is the International Space Station and the, the speed that it, it is passing by through us, they, they see that like, passing very, not too, not too fast, but when you tell them the, the speed, it, they, they was shocking of, of that kind of speed. Uh, well, in this case, we have, like I said, a, a soccer stadium where people go to to play football uh, and the lights really kill us but to do observations of planetary it was okay here's a friend of mine uh, marcelo and this is what what was projecting you know and people say uh, what can we see in this scope well you are seeing in the in the wall i, I tell them now, really, this is what you, yes, because it was the connected, uh, the camera was connected. So it's like, this is a live view of the moon. You can see if I move the scope, wait, and, they, and then I do some 
zoom images uh, from there. And when the people see this very big on the wall, these craters, uh, it was outstanding. Uh, it feels like if you, not orbitating, but it was, uh, if you have the moon really, really close to you. I remember um, a, a man who, who started to take pictures, uh, but she uh, took pictures with the flashlight. And I tell her that, uh, that not do that because it won't see anything because it was projecting light in here. So uh, then I, I tried to, to capture the, the ISS, but I forgot to this increase the, the speed of capturing. So I mm, have this line passing by. And also we pointed to Jupiter and well, I, I, I'm, I remember I, I didn't point it to Saturn, but uh, also they, everybody saw it in another telescope. And well, this is a little selfie of me. <laughs> and I, it, between the chats and the teaching to the, the, the people who arrived, I did a little video with the Max Sutov and I processed the, the Newton crater uh, when I came back to, to my home. And this is, uh, well, with the only, 500 uh, um, uh, F, um, frames that I uh, took and it was a very single shot uh, but you you can see the, the, the details from the creators and well the, it was very soon and also I did a single video of Jupiter uh, with the Maxutov and this is the I, I really liked it because I was using the in a deep sky camera uh, with a Barlow 2X, uh, of course, uh, that I put on the Maxwell telescope. And I, well, uh, lucky us, we had the, the, the great uh, red spot pointing to us. And of course, it was uh, the, the, the moons and all, but I really like how how it works. So when I came back home, I did this, but also I saw the, 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 the last uh, GSP that uh, Gary uh, teach us some little tips of fixing sight that I was practicing and I was doing this processing with uh, some uh, two pictures that I took uh, 50 days ago. Uh, in this case, with the Dumble Nebula or M27, uh, this is not like you uh, show us before. This is a, a 40, uh, yes, 40 minutes stacking only. And I have it very, not too low, but the light pollution and everything, it, it, it wasn't the great night. It wasn't uh, very wet, uh, some, uh, well, the clouds, it was killing me, but it was the night of the comet that I uh, show. But I could um, some kind. I could uh, try to to get out the the noisy uh, background, but also I could take some details of the Dumble Nebula. Uh, this is this it was with the the my GSO Newtonian telescope, uh, the eight inches. And, and, and I loved when the, I saw the, this spikes with the stars, I really <laughs> love it. And then I processed the, the M42 nebula that I took the same night, but it was awful. The, the, the horizon was very orange for the light pollution and it was very wet. And no, it, it wasn't the great night, but even this, uh, I could capture this kind of details of the nebula uh, that I really love. It seems to be little scratches uh, 
that the light pollution, I, I couldn't uh, take it off. But, you know, the, this star with the spike uh, really uh, threw, uh, put my brain out. <laughs> and mm. also, I, I love this place, this kind of nebulosity that it had us in front of and behind it, the, the browner nebula and the shining stars uh, uh, lighting the, the nebula, the nebulosity. This is an, an amazing place to, to capture. It's an easy place to, to get practice, to start to starting to do astrophotographies. And we have it, of course, well, in here in, in the summer skies, but and you in the winter skies, but you, you can see it uh, in every place if, uh, where you are in, on the planet. So uh, you can point it uh, when you want it. And well, this is uh, my little presentation. Uh, I hope that you will like it. And well, uh, this is for me now. Uh, now I'm going to pass it by to, to my friend, uh, Nico Arias, the hammer, that he he was um, uh, well uh, had to I don't know what 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 he wants to to show us tonight because he had some surprises. So Nico, it's all yours. Thank you, Maxi. Hi everyone. How are you? Uh, well, yes. For tonight, I, I was thinking on on capturing a, a double star live, but here still daylight so we go with the plan b and this weeks i i was uh, doing uh, several attempts uh, and different processing with the planetary imaging and i i'd like to show you uh, how i uh, how am i now processing so i let me share my screen uh, here we go are you seeing this? Uh, yes. Yes, okay. we see it. Yes. OK, OK. Well, uh, as, as you know, I, I used to make planetary imaging with my 10-inch uh, inch dog uh, hand tracking and uh, with my Quetch i5 camera that is a monochromatic camera. So I used to uh, make four videos. Uh, one for the luminous channel and the RGB. So I, I will show you how I am processing now, and I am trying this uh, software that is called uh, Astro Surface, that is free. Uh, so it, it's really interesting to the the power of this software, and I will show you how you uh, you just open the image and it has a control for wavelets. It's a, diff, a little different with uh, with Registax that the, is, the, is the common programmer for this, but uh, it's really really amazing the, the the convolution and the how how it manages the gain. So let me show you. You have uh, the wavelets level. Let's start here. And you have all the contours, the, the, the noising. Uh, Nico. I, yes. Uh, we are seeing only the, the window uh, where you are doing the wavelets only. And uh, we are seeing also the background of the YouTube channel. Oh, OK. Let me change the screen. <laughs> OK. What? No, again, it's, okay, let's disconnect the, the second uh, screen. Uh, okay. You need an IT support yeah. No, no, because I, I, I plug the, the, the second uh, screen. <laughs> okay, here we are. Now, oh, yes, yes. Okay. Now we start again. Uh, as, as, as I would say, this is the the, the wavelet uh, functions of the astrosurface, and it's really 
easy uh, to use, but it's yeah. really aggressive. Wow. This image is <laughs> your Dobsonian? Yes, yes, yes. And the, the hand track is with my 10 inch dog. Uh, as you can see, it's easy, but it's aggressive. You can uh, yeah. go to, it's, it's really, really delicate. And, and I will show you the, the common parameters I used to, you, to, to use for Jupiter. I can see, and you have the levels of wavelengths. The, the first one, you can be more aggressive. And the second one is for the, 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 the light details, the, the small details. So this is, I recommend it to, you, to use it in low values. As you can see that it, it brings noise if you if you go too far, so you can you can make a, a little balance there, and um, this is it. It's it's really used to it, it's really easy to use this this soap. So let's make the. I used to apply the, the same settings for the, for four channels. This is the, the red channel. Save us. This is the green channel. You see the, the, the noise. All, always in the in the green channel, you have uh, a little more noise. So I used to use more the noise in this channel in particular. And the blue one. Okay, so this was the, the first step, and we have the, the four channels with the, the wavelets on. You can see the, the, the field rotation, that's because the, the dog. You can see how the, the planet was rotating in the sky. And this, the next step is go going to wind hoopos to, to make the the, the rotation of all the channels. Okay. Wing shoopers with with Jupiter is it's really fast. When we use it with Saturn, you need to adjust this by manually, and it takes more time. Okay, and now we have the, the four channels and we are uh, joining them in the in an LRGB final image. Okay, and now we compile. And we have the all the channels together. Wow. Yeah, you can see that I, I have a, a little onion sharp here. Maybe one of the channels was not uh, correctly on focus, but it, it's a really, really nice image. Beautiful image. And I used to uh, to go uh, to register anyway, just to to make the the RGB align. Because I I really like how how it balances. I I, I like the the colors that circuits make. So you can see how we you need to you we need to make the four time uh, wavelets. But when you show the images, it, it's really nice to see the the, the color image. Uh, with with a mono camera, this is is really is really nice. And 
well, I, I have another image that used the, the, the same night of Saturn. In this case, I, I was trying, I, I was uh, testing for the luminance to using an UHC uh, filter, and I get a lot of details than the, the other times. Uh, so you have uh, some colors on the moons, and I use the, the same process for these images. Um, and okay, e and uh, about that was planetary with my dog, and these weeks I, I was making some uh, LRGB images with my my other scope, my uh, six inch uh, reflector with the equatorial mount. That was the the, the Maxis telescope. <laughs> I miss it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I use it with, with the same uh, QH, uh, QH5 uh, camera that is, is a planetary or giddy image, but you can use it to, the, to make some deep, deep sky. Uh, this is the, the nebulosity on Corona Austral. Hmm. And uh, I use, uh, I, I captured uh, 7 to can. This is my, my favorite close, uh, globular cluster. And wow. This is the result. And it's, a, it's the same process. I, I used to, I, I make the, the four images and then stack it. it in this case, I, I mix the channels and touch it with the uh, pixel inside. So, okay, this is, was a, a little presentation and we'll back to you, Max, to continue with the other friends. Thank you guys. Well, excellent presentation, Nico. It was yeah, uh, excellent work. <laughs> that Thank Jupiter, you, you know, seeing how it goes, the the, the sharpness and to and, and and get focused, it's amazing. You know, it, yeah, when the, you the change <laughs> when you see you start to see those details of the clouds and the storms. Uh, no, no, it's unbelievable. And you are you are doing in your home with your uh, little QHY5 camera, uh, also with uh, singular uh, filters, uh, RGB, and well, <laughs> without motors, without, uh, you are yeah, yeah. putting uh, a pointed before passing by uh, to the scope and start to, to capture. Follow him. Yeah, I'm following. <laughs> this... Uprofen is a good friend. <laughs> <laughs> yes, really, really does. Well, um, the uh, next one is going to be uh, Alan Gedding. Alan, also, he's a friend of mine that uh, we uh, started uh, uh, maybe together, uh, at, at, not together, but yes, to, at the same time. Uh, doing astrophotography and also observations. Uh, he also, well, we met uh, for the first time, I remember in the observatory of Mercedes, where the, um, it was the, the, the date of the 47, no, no, sorry, uh, the 46P uh, with Tannen Comet. It was, uh, I think we met at the, um, the 40, the, the 15th of December of 2019. And I, I remember that I went with my scope and I started to take pictures with, uh, with a cell phone and he was uh, amazing and we started to, to talk him. Uh, well, you know, uh, that's how uh, astronomy opened doors and op opened uh, friends to, to, to 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 know you and also you know it and well uh, Alan uh, it's all yours man okay <laughs> hello all. thank you Max for the intro hello Scott and everybody um First of all, I, I want to thank uh, everyone 
on for for this part. Uh, Alan, um, I think we have some issues with your we internet connection. We met with Max a few, quite a few years ago, and I was amazed by uh, pictures and the kind of work he was doing with his. Uh, it, it, it was a small scope. It, it was like uh, what uh, one, 110 millimeter Max. Uh, yes, it was. Uh, Alan, are you there? Oh, well, yeah, maybe he, he lose the, the internet. He connects again, I think, from another place. Um, this troubleshoots happens. <laughs> yeah, take it easy, Alan. You are not the first one. I remember when I was here for the first time. <laughs> you remember, Scott? <laughs> Yes, yeah. I. <laughs> we all lost connection, everyone. Yeah, I, I think it's like uh, everyone has passed by through the down of the connection. So, uh, Alan, are you there? Okay, uh, I think I'm back. I think I'm back. Yes. I, I don't know if you yeah. can see me or hear me. No, we we can hear you, but we can't see you. Oh, let me check the video. Just a minute. You know, it's pretty clear sky here. <laughs> well, and the moon was really big. I, yeah. I saw it a couple minutes ago. And no, but tonight I think I, I well, I, I don't know what I'm going to do tonight. <laughs> well, we we can see you now, Alan. Ah. Oh. oh okay. Uh, great. <laughs> well, I would was able to draw too quick. Um. Thank you all again for giving me this uh, uh, this space. And, and uh, I thought of the theme uh, of this uh, episode of, of the GSP, uh, uh, the one that Scott said about uh, sharing uh, the cosmos. So I made a, quite a, a, a small, because it's just a few a few pictures, uh, a slideshow, uh, and this presentation is called uh, astrophotography on a budget. I mean, what better than than share than mm, well? I think he lost connection again. I think he did too. Um, Yes, he really, well, uh, well, if you can hear me, Alan, I think we're going All to. All right, just bear with me. Oh. I'm, I'm going to share my screen right now. Okay, I'm sharing the screen. Are you able to see it? Yes, we are see it. Yes, we are. Yes. Awesome, great. Okay, I'm gonna start slideshow. Just, just let me know if the the screen goes black or not. We can see the presentation. Yeah. Okay. Well, th th that's a picture that, that I took of my first scope. It was a really small uh, reflector scope. Um, it was, uh, I believe, it was a three-inch reflector, uh, and 76 millimeters by 900 millimeters of focal distance. So at that time, I used a really cheap LG phone. I started um, watching the skies with a friend. And um, I was like, uh, OK, but it, it's, it's all nice. I, I can see some great things when I put my eye to the eyepiece. Uh, but it, it will be really cool if I was able to share that with some other people. 
So first I tried holding the cell phone with my hand up to the eyepiece. I was able to get some decent moonshots, which by the way, the moon is a really nice target. It's by far the easiest because it's big and it's bright and you don't need to tax your your phone or your camera too much in order to get some, some sort of detail. But um, it's kind of difficult to keep your phone right in the eye relief point and perhaps you took a breath and you moved it and, and, and you can have all sort of things happen that take the, the, the phone out of that position. So uh, I said, okay, so how do I solve this? And, and I went looking through a, a eBay-like site and I found, that, uh, I found that they sold adapters to hold your phone steady. So I got one of those for like, I don't know, it was like seven bucks or something, $7 and um, managed to get some really nice views for for the uh, the amount of money I put in. I mean, um, that scope was uh, worth less. I bought it secondhand. Well, actually, my wife bought it secondhand. She gave it for me as a as a as a present. And um, what do you know? For forty five dollars, fifty dollars, U.S. dollars, I was taking photos of the moon. And I was like, it, that totally blew my mind. Of course, you, you want to try more when you, when you go through that situation. I, I mean, you want to uh, try your hand at, at planets and you know that there are star clusters and open clusters and, and globular clusters. So you want to try and say, okay, why not? So I tried my hand first. The first open cluster I, I pictured was uh, the wishing well cluster located near the Carina constellation. And um, even though I managed to get uh, uh, to photograph uh, um, quite a bit uh, of a month of stars, it I noticed that you could improve that. So the next step was getting the right ascension tracking on the telescope. So again, since I usually I am, I am on a tight budget, I went looking for the uh, RA motor and uh, found that it was out of my league. So if you notice right below the scope, you can see a small white box with red, with, uh, red and black cables and a, a light blue power bank. So I designed a RA motor uh, out of, I scratch built it, I use a cheap stepper motor a driver for the for the for the motor and um, a pulse generator uh, board that i bought off uh, ebay all in all it, it sent me back like 15 dollars or so so um at that point i got a tracking telescope that i was able to use to um, take uh, long exposure shots and I upgraded my cell phone. I bought a, a high-end but old phone. This was around 2008, a 2019. I bought an L, a, a LG G5 cell phone, which was the high-end phone, but from 2016. So I, I didn't spend a lot of money on that. That allowed me to use some photogra um, cam photographic camera apps like Open Camera, which allows you to exploit the pro mode, the manual mode on the cell phone. You can change the ISO value, the shutter speed, the focus of the uh, of the cell phone, the white balance and all. And that upped my game and allowed me to get some really nice views for it. I, I mean, I'll stress again that this was done with a 76 millimeter diameter scope beginner a beginner scope with a eq1 mount uh, i was starting to get videos out of jupiter out of saturn getting some detail even though my processing skills were not that good at that time <laughs> but i was getting there and, and it was possible just by not spending a, a tremendous amount of money i mean 
uh, I've seen a lot of, uh, of posts in, in, in Facebook, Facebook groups and in astrophotography um, forums where they say, no, you have to purchase a uh, five inch reflector with a EQ5 mount, and, and get the dual axis motor, get a dedicated astro camera in order to get one good picture. And um, you can do, you can get a nice picture without spending that tremendous amount of cash. Uh, I was able to use that small scope and the cell phone to, uh, to uh, photograph. And I have, I believe I have the video of the occultation of Saturn that happened in 2019. That was a, a, a really, really tough um, event because the brightness of the moon was like overwhelming for the sensor of the cell phone, but I managed to get a couple of pictures. And of course, picturing the moon with a better cell phone with some new eyepieces, because I switched uh, the default ones that come with the with the telescope, the Super 20 or the Super 25 and the Super 10, I got some 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 quality brand eyepieces, and that uh, made really it really made a difference in the quality. Uh, once I managed to get the the equipment in uh, polar uh, to to do the polar aligning on the telescope, once I managed to 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 learn that process, which was difficult for me. Uh, I started imaging DSOs, mainly uh, open clusters, bright objects like, like nebulas M42, for instance, or Omega Centauri. Um, and it was really, it, it, it was possible. It was possible. Of course, you can compare these images to images from professional astrophotographers, or for instance, to the images that Maxi uh, gets from his scope and his gear. But and I'm pretty content with that. And um, after getting along with the cell phone and the telescope, uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Someone mentioned about the the, uh, the eclipse picture from Maxi, and I have some <laughs> similar pictures that I took again with the cell phone and the this time uh, for uh, for this event i upgraded the 76 millimeter reflector to a 70 millimeter refractor scope um which i was in love with that little little little, little ota again you can do all sorts of planetary uh, imaging using uh cell phones you know that from maxi because he has excelled at that field with his technique and his professionalism um after getting along with the cell phone as i was saying a friend of mine uh gifted uh this small point and shoot camera it was a it, it is because i still have it I, I still use it to to take wide field uh, pictures and do time lapse videos. Um, this is a, a Canon SX700 HS, which uh, it's you can find one really cheap online. I, I believe I saw it uh, yesterday or the day before for eighty dollars on. I, I don't know if it was eBay or Amazon. Um, so I use it on the piggyback of the mount managed to get uh, from a bottle seven almost bottle eight sky uh, that, that's the the sky quality that i have here in my house um and and, and it was just terrific because the sensor on the camera on, on this point it shoot is way better than the one on the cell phone but still i mean i got it as a gift but if you want to buy one you don't have to spend a lot of money on it this is m42 that i took I believe it was 20, the end of 2019 with the with the Canon mounted on the piggyback. Uh, I was using <laughs> the telescope as a giant guide scope while I had mounted the, the camera atop it. And um, after that, I mean, you, you just, I, I try to go step by step. I, I, I as I said before, uh, I'm usually on a tight budget and even though I could save money, I could say, okay, let's not buy this camera, but save that. I did that 
to get a reflex camera. Uh, the next step will be to get an astro camera, but it's that's way, way ahead of me right now. But I was able to find secondhand a used uh, reflex Canon T3. It's like, I, I don't know, maybe a 10 or 11 year old camera. Um, my wife, again, helped me and gifted an upgrade scope for me. I went uh, from a from the 70 millimeter refractor to a 90 millimeter refractor with a EQ3 mount. And uh, I had to redesign the uh, motor that I scratch built, had to, to redesign it and uh, uh, switch a couple of pieces in order to fit the, uh, the different mount point in the EQ3 mount. Um, but again, I, I mean, we're talking about small scopes, pretty perhaps inexpensive scopes in regards to to what I with uh, to regards to the advice astrophotography equipment that some other people tend to recommend. I mean, a lot of people tend to recommend larger aperture scopes, um, better cameras, or, or more recent. And with, with better sensor uh, sensibility, to say way. So this has allowed me to keep growing in regards to the quality of the pictures taken, and uh, share a lot more detail with uh, friends, family, um, people that are, that are interested in, in in getting into astronomy or or astrophotography because they they come at you and say like, okay, so you, you get a large scope. I mean, and I was like, and, and I'm like, no, this is a small a small scope. I mean, you can purchase a larger scope, and they're like, nah, you, you didn't get that picture with, with this quote small quote scope. Last year, uh, or, or was it no, this year? This year, I tried in at imaging galaxies for the first time since uh, I started with with this activity, and it has been uh, fulfilling, very fulfilling for me. Uh, I, I'm usually in a couple of, of WhatsApp groups and Facebook groups, and when people say, uh, "Okay, I, I want to get into astrophotography," but I cannot spend a lot of money on it. And the first thing I do is, uh, okay, take a look at this picture. Just know that I spent $100, $120, $130 on the equipment, and the rest was research and, and watching YouTube tutorials in order to know how to use the processing software or how to set up the scope, set up the camera, set up the correct exposure values in order to get uh, the lights and uh, the, the, the light uh, shots and the calibration takes in order to process them. Um, this is, well, actually, this is my um, background picture right now in my notebook. This is the Carina Nebula. Uh, I'm pretty stoked we, about this picture. We, we, can, I, we can see it. Yes. Uh, oh, uh, OK. Um, Screen is black. Yes, Maxim. Uh, oh, there you I, go. There it goes. There is. Oh, the screen was black. I'm sorry. So I, I was saying, I, I was uh, um, like, my mind was blown away when I started processing this uh, this set of takes. Uh, it, it was a surprise to me because I was not expecting to get this amount of color and and detail out of this, uh, this modest uh, um, uh, equipment that I'm using. So well, that, that was the last, the, uh, the last picture I was, uh, I selected for, for this show. Great, great work, Alan. Congratulations. Excellent, okay. man. I'm back. <laughs> Well, uh, mm, I think we, if you share the, the screen, we can hear it. But if you don't, we can 
can't hear it. It's the first Very time karma. It's the first yeah, time. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe turn turn off your camera. Mm, no. Or share your screen again. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps well, this, uh, connection will get better later in the program. Probably. Uh, well, uh, next guest is also a friend of mine that uh, we did our first adventure a couple of weeks ago, or a couple, I don't know, a, a, a month and a half, that we went, uh, we also, another person, uh, Ariel Rodriguez, uh, to, to a road place to do some uh, uh, Feel, uh, wild, uh, feel of wild uh, pictures of the, uh, the, the Magellanic clouds and the, 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 the galaxy and also uh, from the, the nature pictures. And uh, well, he uh, he's uh, Sebastian Jeremias, Sebastian Jeremias, uh, that he will present it, uh, tonight uh, what he's doing, what uh, he's working on. And hey, Seba, how are you? Hi, Max. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me tonight. Uh, it's great, great being here. Uh, all right. So as Max was saying, uh, I wanted to give some little background, um, uh, a brief introduction, actually, to wide field astrophotography. Um, I don't know how many of you folks have already been exposed to uh, white field or that night, nightscape photography. Uh, but in case you're wondering where to start, how to start with it, um, well, this I hope this is a, a good Adrian, starting point. Adrian, I think we're really a big fan of you. This is, I am looking forward to see your uh, work and how you do things. I, I am a fan of uh, wide field. Uh, photography, nightscapes, and everything that I think you are about to talk about. So I'm looking forward to this. Awesome. Glad to hear that. Hope you like it. All right. So uh, first of all, oh, let me close my window. There's, there's a whole party of dogs out there. Um, so what is it? Uh, you might already know what is it. There's no, no telescope here. Um, so nightscape, it means uh, photographing uh, the night sky and including uh, the landscape in it, in the picture, in the frame, all right? Uh, that gives us a lot of possibilities. Um, I jumped into photography and into astronomy quite at the same time with very basic rudimentary equipment um, and both in parallel. I, I never really thought that I would be uh, getting those worlds together at some point. Um, so basically the difference is the focal length, right? With telescopes, you use 300 millimeters and above, 200 millimeters and above maybe. Um, for planetary, it's much more than that. Uh, while wide field photography, uh, you're you're looking into uh, 35 millimeters at the most. Uh, ideally, a 14 millimeters lens uh, would get you very good results, and we'll see why later on. Um, there's uh, there's a lot of differences uh, between focal lengths. Uh, with a 35 millimeter lens, uh, you can get like an intimate um, picture like this one we're seeing here. Uh, this is in the, the, the place that Maxi was talking about. Uh, it's a different night, but it's the same place. Um, and you can see the two magnetic clouds here um, with 
uh, a typical, very typical rural, rural landscape here in Buenos Aires. And this is uh, a very southern picture. I'm really proud of getting the Magellanic clouds whenever I can. And 47 to Canada. And 47 to Canada, yeah. Yeah. All right. So, what do you need to start with? Uh, this picture is also with the 35 millimeters. It's a Nikon lens from 1974, I think, F2.8, manual focus, um, manual aperture as well. Um, but if you're if you're uh, if you're curious about it, if you just if you're just wondering what happens if I point my camera to the sky during the night and try to take a picture. All right, so there's a few things you will probably uh, want to know. Um, the, the, I think the best starting point is a reflex camera, a DSLR. Um, you don't really need it as long as the camera has a manual mode but the sensors in DSLR cameras are much better than point and shoot cameras. Um, you will also want um, a nice um, fast lens. Um, the kit lenses are um, F3.5. Um, maximum aperture, which is kind of, not that fast, not fast enough. Um, so you can try, as always, you can try and see what you get. You can uh, increase your ISO and try to increase your exposure um, and see what you get and try to get something out of addition. Um, but basically you will probably want something with a, a lens with f2.8 or more. All right. Uh, you will also need a tripod. We'll talk about tripods in the next slide. Uh, sky conditions and limitations. Um, so sky conditions are not that are, are kind of for, um, uh, it's easier to get a nice picture we in wide field photography than with a telescope, because um, you can also use the landscape to compose your, your images. Um, like in here, for example, the center of the Milky Way was really, really low in the sky. And I was pointing at, uh, at Capital Federal here uh, in Buenos Aires, which is a very, very highly polluted sky. Um, it might be bottle 15, at least, <laughs> if, it, if there were a bottle 15. <laughs> uh, or, or. <laughs> yeah, or bottle 15. <laughs> Is that even on the scale? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let, let's yeah, I think it goes to It goes to nine, but uh, 15 yeah, I know, I know, is bright, I know. bright, bright, bright. <laughs> so, yeah, yes. I know. It, uh, let's, let's call it nine plus. Okay. <laughs> Um, but you can see that, I mean, you can see here, it was a really dark night, um, but all this light here, it comes from, from Cava, from Capital Federal. Um, so you can include elements in your picture to make it look nicer. You don't really need that level of detail, like when you do deep, scape, deep space photography, uh, you don't need to take that much into account the star shapes uh, and that kind of stuff, unless you're thinking on printing it at 100% size or something like that, which you want at the beginning, of course. Um, you can also include clouds. Clouds, uh, I'll show you a picture. Uh, I think I have one here. Uh, clouds can look very, very nice. Um, if you give me a moment, I think I have here. So 
This one, I took it in Bariloche in Patagonia. Oh, wow. Yes. Right. And that's beautiful. Yeah. And yes. not, even, not even the clouds, but also light pollution. All this light is coming from the city. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see the whole Carina region here. Um, and you can make it look good. Very, very good. It's, it's as if the, the clouds have added some fill light to the, uh, to the mountains as well. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, they, well, they were behind the mountain. The sky above. The thing here is that the light is coming from here and mm -hmm. uh, from the left of the image, which uh, makes all these textures on the mountain. Mm -hmm. And the clouds in behind, um, I mean, they add a lot to the composition. Yes. And astronomy background, um, I'm not an astronomer. Any guy here in this meeting will know much more uh, astronomy than I do. Um, that's for sure in the case of Nico, Allen, and, and Maxi, for example. Um, but it, it adds a lot to your pictures if you know how the sky is moving, uh, where the stars starts shaping from one place to the other in the equator, where are your poles, what happens if you point your camera to the north or the south pole, for example, you can do some star trails. I, I have one here. I took it in the middle of the city, as you can see. There's, there are planes coming and going. Um, so knowing where your poles are and where, where the equator is uh, can also add a lot to your pictures. All right. Um, camera limitations. Let's talk a little, a little bit more about equipment. Um, so the first limitation that you will have tied to your camera model uh, is a sensor. And the sensor will limit uh, how much, how high you can go with the ISO. All right, so um, a good starting point would be have the maximum. Set. Well, I will talk about settings later on, but uh, just get to know that your sensor will limit your pictures a lot. Um, for example, I used to have a D80, a Nikon D80, uh, which I would have said that it's, it's it, it doesn't have any value for astrophotography, but since I've met Maxi and I'm, I saw the pictures that he got with that same camera that I couldn't take more than two starts with. <laughs> um, uh, with the native uh, lens, the AT55. It's incredible what you do, what, what you used to do with that camera. And I can tell you enough, and I already told you how glad I was that you changed it. And you can see the, the results now. I mean, if you, do, if you did magic with the D80, uh, well, the results with your dedicated camera are, are out there. You have already showed them up. Um, but I tried to do some astrophotography and landscape photography with the D80. And even in the Atacama desert, uh, I couldn't get anything decent. Um, and, but that's what I got, all right. Uh, then I changed it uh, a couple of years back to a uh, D750. It has a Nikon D750, it's a full frame camera. I didn't really care about uh, full frame, I mean, for the sensor size, but that camera does magic with light. I mean, it takes just three photons and makes a picture out of it. It's incredible. Um, so it, ha it has a Sony sensor. Uh, I think it's an IMX 128. Um, so Sony cameras are great. Nikon cameras are great. Canon cameras are great. I mean, any any camera is, is good enough to start with. and. Uh, and in brands, maybe Sony does a better job with high-end sensors, uh, but uh, you can do it with any camera, any DSLR camera that you have out there. 
Um, all right, so lens and focal length limits. Lens, as I said before, uh, you will want uh, something with uh, f2.8 uh, at the minimum for maximum aperture. Uh, if you have a 1.4 or an f2, that's even great, even 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 better, because uh, you're getting uh, points of light. Focal length limits. Uh, I mentioned uh, 35 millimeters at the most. You can do something with less than that with, with, with a 50 millimeters lens, for example. But as the sky rotates, well, as the Earth rotates, and we see the sky rotating with it, um, it will also limit your exposure times. All right, so you, you mount your camera on your tripod and start shooting. So if you take a 15 seconds um, photo, with a 50 millimeter lens, you will see all sort of strikes, uh, traces, star traces in your photo, and they will be noticeable. With a 13, uh, th uh, 35 millimeter lens, uh, at 10 seconds, 15 seconds, you can get away with it. Uh, with a 14 millimeter lens, you can go up to 30 seconds without noticing the, the stars, the, the star movement movements. Um, so the shorter the focal length, uh, the longer the exposure time. There's a rule out there, it's called the 500 rule. It's kind of a, it's kind of tricky. Uh, it can give you longer exposure times. It's basically it means uh, dividing 500 by your focal length and it it's supposed to give you the maximum time that you can uh, have your shutter open until the strikes are noticeable but you can get times that are in my experience uh, that uh, it's it's not really trustworthy um, but the rule I mean what I what I found is that with a 35 millimeter lens you can go to from 10 to 15 seconds. Uh, depending on where where on the sky are you are you pointing are you pointing to your camera to, um, and with a fourteen millimeter lens you can go up to thirty seconds without any problems. You can see the well actually in this photo on the background uh, you can see some traces. Uh, it's um, it's a panorama. I think I have it here. Yeah. Uh, it's a panorama. It's composed out of, I think it's three vert vertical images. And uh, it's the crop version. All right, sorry, but you can see some traces here, but very noticeable. And I, I never thought about uh, showing it at 100%. So I'm comfortable, perfectly comfortable with it. Um, all right, so equipment tripod, a solid tripod. There is no such thing as a solid and light tripod. So if you want a stable tripod, you need to carry it. <laughs> it weights. Um, I have a here, um, a Manfrotto B3 tripod. I don't know, it's, well, yeah, you won't see it, but. Uh, a solid tripod is very important, especially for the wind um, and other factors as well. Intervalometer, if you want to take uh, pictures of more than 30 seconds, most cameras won't let you do that. So you will either uh, need to connect your computer to the camera and control it from, uh, from some kind of software or an intervalometer, which is much easier to do, to get uh, pictures for, I don't know, maybe one minute, two minutes, which you will want if you want to mix your landscape with your sky, because the sky will always be brighter than, this, than the landscape. So um, many times as you go on with your night, night photography, you might want to take two different pictures, one for the landscape with a, with a greater exposure time, and another one for the sky. All right. OK, 
camera settings to start playing around with. Um, so I would suggest uh, that you start with half the camera's maximum ISO, not the not the forced one, H1, H2, H4, not those values, but but the maximum uh, that the camera offers, numeric values. So if your camera goes up to 6,400 ISO, uh, you can start with ISO 3200. Uh, if you can go up to 1,200, 12,800, you can start with um, 6,400 and so on and so forth. Um, during your first tests, I would suggest that you go higher than that, all the way up, all the way down and, and check, right? Because you might think that it's good enough exposure and then it's all dark. If you try to uh, increase the exposure, you will bring up noise. Uh, if you go too high on the ISO, everything will be noise and you might not even distinguish between stars and noise. So play around with it, take three, four images with different settings. Um, lens wide open with caution. There are many lenses out there that uh, you can see a lot of uh, aberrations in your corners. Like, let me show you, I think I have some here. Um, this one probably, this is with the 35 millimeters as well. As you go to the corners, you start seeing the stars as birds, as little birds. That's aberration. Um, our friend here, Ariel Rodriguez, who's watching us on YouTube, uh, will know the exact word. I think it's um, astigmatism. Yeah, I think it is. He, he will He will punch me in the face if it's not, but I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> so uh and you can you can control these aberrations wow uh by kind of shutting a little bit uh your your diaphragm mm -hmm. your aperture um so if your lens is 2.8 and you see this kind of artifacts on the corners you might want to close it to probably uh three something or five. So that's also limiting the light. And don't ever forget that you're counting every photo that you get. So every step of light is very important. Um, and then uh, exposure time. Well, I already talked about it. Uh, it depends on which part of the sky are you pointing to. Uh, so if you're in the Southern hemisphere and you're pointing South, you can increase your exposure times. If you are on the North and pointing to the North, it's the same. While if you point to the equator, the stars move faster. So you will have uh, much longer traces in your photos. So, um, once again, the numbers go from 10 seconds with a 13, 35 millimeters lens to up to 30 seconds with a 14 millimeters lens. You can also, as you can see, you can play around with, with lights, some light painting. Um, for This also takes some kind of trial and error. Uh, and I would suggest that you count the seconds uh, that you have your light turned on so that if it's if it's all burned out, you can lower one of two seconds. If it's too dark, you can keep it uh, on for a couple more seconds and so on for so forth until you get something you're comfortable with. Um, also, if you're doing some light painting, I would suggest uh, either uh, projecting your the lamp, the light to your hand or to some uh, or, or a piece of paper to diffuse it a little bit and move it around so that it's not that hard. 
because the 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 light of a single point it's very it's very hard and you will have uh, a very uh, very high contrast on your landscape and all right so when the, something about basic development oh, sorry so I, I normally use Camera Raw. Um, we, sometimes if I feel like it, I open it in Photoshop and do some more complex work in colors and, and uh, probably noise reduction, but I try to cope with that with other tools. Um, but normally with Camera Raw or some similar or GIMP or uh, some basic, uh, developing software, photo developing software that supports raw images, you'll be good to go. Um, always keep an eye on the on the histogram, not only when editing, but also, and especially when you're taking pictures, try to get your histogram uh, as much to the middle of the screen as, as possible. Um, maybe, let me see if I can show you. Let's take any of these. So uh, how are we with time? Are we good? Sorry, I, I, I'm yeah, not we, keeping We still have time. a number of presenters, so. Um, all right, all right, yeah. all right. But uh, so try to keep your histogram as, as, uh, as much to at least the middle as possible. Um, the noise, you should evaluate your noise at 100% zoom level. Um, And you could use the camera raw noise reduction features, but uh, it's it kind of uh, blurs your image. So I would try to get the right exposure. If you get the right exposure from your camera, that's the best way I know of for reducing noise. Uh, and there are other techniques as well, like uh, stacking your pictures, but in landscape photography, that's quite uh, troublesome, more troublesome than, than deep space because uh, I couldn't find any uh, software that does it for you, like PixInsight does for, for Deep Sky, for example. Um, yeah, there's some that's out there, but I forget the name. It takes your sky and stacks it and then takes your last landscape and makes that your landscape, but it, I haven't looked for it either. And I don't, I don't stack as if I can help it. The, I usually just tried to go for the single image too. So right, it's there, right. but it's. It uh, makes a difference. I mean, it makes a difference. Yeah. This, this is a stacked image, for example. This is what I was talking about, the histogram. Yeah. Um, and if you go up to 100%, the noise, so this image is taken at uh, ISO 1200, uh, 12,800. Yeah. So it's really, really high and very low noise for what yeah. is for what it is. Um, the thing is that it's nice. it is stacked, it, it's a stacked image, um, and it makes a difference, but it's also very complex. Yeah, uh, uh, maybe you're referring to Sequador. Um, that might be it. I don't really like the the quality of the output, but yeah. it's a handy tool. Yeah. All right, so I think that's pretty much it. If you have any questions or uh, would like to see more of my pictures, here's my intro. Room. And I'm really, really glad that I, uh, for the opportunity. Thank you guys. Thank Those you. Images are are those images are beautiful. They you are beautiful. Uh, you Thanks made a, a point, and it's a very <laughs> interesting point that you you made a point that you you aren't fighting stars to be absolutely pinpoint as long as you're painting the picture with your uh, photography, and that's part of what I suffer from is coming from an astronomy background. As you can see, with the that's part of a Milky Way picture I took in the background. I fight pinpoint stars and try and get that, 
but my foregrounds are these little things or there's a strip of a lake. So that's in one way to improve um, getting better foregrounds and composing better. That's something that I see you do very well, um, as do some of the uh, night sky photographers and some of the groups. Um, those foregrounds are beautiful. I rely completely on pinpoint stars and just having this majestic looking shot. So it's something I that know, I, I can know. I can take with me and say, you know, I don't have to, even if it's not perfect, I can still frame it a little better if I go. Of course, I have to go to some better foregrounds, which is why I must come to Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> there are great foregrounds here. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it comes down to what your intention with the photo is. I mean, if you want to print it again, like a hundred percent, well, you get, you have to get your, your stars pinpointed. Uh, but normally and to play around with it, to have fun or share it in social media, you don't really need that. We always want that, of course. <laughs> yeah, but we also want to get the shot because the sky moves. The sky, so, exactly. Yeah, right. so you have to, sometimes you have a certain window in which you can compose or you miss. Literally, the uh, exactly. Milky Way, it, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, we only get a little bit of what you can see in the South all the time. So with only 30 minutes, I managed to take a shot that included some nebulae like the, the cat's paw nebula that you can only see in the south you know, an hour right. later that's gone so that that can no longer be a part of the photo so it happens to us with andromeda <laughs> yeah you all have the same issue we can we can look at it most of the night andromeda has it's only so much you can shoot but, exactly uh, like the player is when i was in miami i was seeing the player is right there in the scene i couldn't, yeah i couldn't oh, believe it so it happy yes beautiful Yes, so it's uh, both well, hemispheres have well, something to share to each other. All right. Uh, I think uh, our ne next guest is our friend of us. Uh, that he's, He was my presenter a couple of months ago. Uh, he's Cesar Brolio. Uh, Cesar, how are you? Uh, unmuted. How are you, Maxi? Hey. Well, thank you for Hi, being here. Hi, everyone. Uh, can it's you hear a pleasure. me good? Uh, a little bit. Uh, you have some issues with your connection, I think. Uh, I I think that I can I can uh, change to to another connection. If if uh, let me. Uh, I know I know why. Okay. No, the best the best thing is close everything that I have open. But, uh, now it's going okay, I think the, the connection. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Now yeah, it's okay. Perfectly. Okay, Cesar, it's okay. all yours. Okay, let me. Well, uh, can you can you hear me good I, or or if not I can I can change my my uh, it, uh, your connection. internet has settled in, in and is now working. Now it's working because it's uh, uh, I, the problem with it, with the connection. Is, uh, I think that this that uh, no not I think I believe that work good but uh, maybe I'm free for you. <laughs> For the Every once in a while. It is, I don't it know. is freezing it is, and, yeah. and the voice is interrupting a little bit. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah, let me let me change. You want to change? Uh, okay. Something little that is only. Yes, yes, it's a, no problem because uh, it's really easy and I'm helping me with a uh, data connection from my cell phone because maybe in this part of the house sometimes i have a problem with the router of my my um, um, um well i in the living room is a problem let me check sorry sorry that i i can change now this one very fast let me cut this and maybe we'll be unplugged the, the spar no, yeah, but I, I think that I can change. 
this is the top of the time that everyone has connection problem here. It's 9 p.m. and everyone is and everyone's in, online. Yeah, it's online. It's uh, watching uh, absolutely movies, <laughs> all the movies, series, yeah. and the connection goes down. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, I can change to that. YouTube videos on how to make pizzas. <laughs> it's okay. The, the next yeah, channel. Better. I think it's yeah, better. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I changed. I changed to my, my phone because maybe in, in, yes, in my home, actually, we are watching uh, uh, movies, my family. <laughs> and, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And normally we we use well, we use a lot of of the wide of the connection, more than as possible. Well, uh, <laughs> maybe Agustin is mining crypto crypto monedas. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. It's it's like Maxi when he used a uh, a tool that the uh, for for uh, the name is one point five drizzly for for planetary image that consume a lot of of space in your computer for the ram yeah. ram memory and uh two weeks ago i i um i i um i was connected with maxi in the night two weeks ago maxi remember that and when uh maxi put uh the one point drizzly uh, tool uh, in the in the processing of of the planetary image we i i tell him okay chivilcoy now is turn off the light the entire city because <laughs> 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 we we have a laptop i i, I can i maybe i, I can them. cook with my cpu here <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah we, we we start to talk about make a barbecue in your processor yeah Yes, many many processings in in uh, astrophotography are uh, using a lot of material of of run of your computer is is normal. Well, we had a star party last weekend. Last Saturday was a not a typical star party with all with people with telescopes like next uh, November six, uh, where all people from Argentina and people from another countries. Of course, that you are all invited. Um, um, Saturday, six November, uh, November Saturday six, we can make a small safari with a small barbecue for for our friends in in, a, in an historic installation of uh, um, San Miguel Solar Physics Observatory, and um, well before. Uh, after, sorry, of my uh, of uh, uh, the people that that uh, talk uh, about astrophotography, uh, I feel really small because I, I watched the uh, the pictures from Sebastian are incredible. It's uh, and I enjoy the, the conversation between Adrian and Sebastian because I say, oh, these guys make the same type of of pictures, and I say, wow, <laughs> it's amazing. I think that. That is is uh, I I really I I hope that one day we uh, we went together we go together to uh, dark skies in Argentina with Adrian Sebastian Scott of course to have a a, a great surprise um, of course absolutely okay. for everyone. I will come I will bring my star tracker I will compare notes with uh, Sebastian and yes, we will try and yes. take some absolutely. absolute amazing photos. <laughs> Yeah, we'll learn a yeah. lot from him. Sure, and uh, really, I enjoy the, the, all that. The, this Argentinian part of the global safari is it's a honor for for me to be a part, of, like, like ever. Well, and I have uh, some pictures from the the um, safari of of the the meeting that we made uh, last Saturday. We had uh, uh, some uh, things like a uh, Mont uh, International Day Observer. Nike Observer, uh, we show to the people a lot of image, uh, live image of, or of course, observing by the telescope, uh, 
um, throw the telescope, sorry, um, um, of, uh, of course, uh, Venus, um, Jupiter, Saturno. It was very interesting. We have a, la a, lo a large file of people watching uh, through the, the very old Gustav Haydn telescope, 120 years old. Um, it was amazing because um, the, the, the majority, the, the government of San Miguel started to make uh, to make um, some uh, improvements in the structures of the observatories, start to paint uh, with a very good quality paint, uh, paint in the walls of the observatory. They, they are still painting with a, a special paint the domes. Um, this is fantastic because we are watching, we are, we are watching how the observatory is coming to the life again and again and this is really really great i'll i'll share my screen let me let me uh think where i can have here and i'm start here uh let me see if you can see the the picture now the big picture it's okay it's just the gallery view no, no, no. Okay. Okay. I need to change this. Stop share. And share screen again. Okay. Here. Near to 70, 70 global surprise. And I made the same mistake <laughs> with the <laughs> sharing again and again. Yes. Next global surprise is the 70. So, wow. Yes, it is. Number yes, seven. Is. That's sure. Right. Well, and here you can see now. Okay, the the. Yes, we can see it. Okay. Uh, well, we had a very very great uh, meeting. This is the the poster. Was the poster for for the meeting? The the um, San Miguel Municipalidad, the government, uh, the local government had the, the he's the, the single like an angel. And uh, well, here is the starting with the, you know, the, the identifications to, to give to the people of the, of the uh, organization. We started at very, very early in the morning to prepare everything. Here you can see the celostato. The people starting to come from the from the 4 uh, p.m. to uh, we made um, like a tour uh, uh, by the the observatory. Um, here we have more pictures with a lot of people that are starting to come. We count around 500 people visiting in the entire uh, evening and night the people that was um, was uh, coming and made uh, uh, make a, a file to watch the by the telescope or the telescope when I, I I have a lot of well Mariano Mariano Poisson it's you you know to Mariano uh, talking about about historical uh, observations, sunspot observations. Here, the equipment in the end of the night. Uh, me, Mariano, Mariano Pozón, Fernando Ricardini, eh, Agustín Mayese. Eh, I, I can see this is uh, Mar uh, Santiago Mayese. Um, Andres uh, Liark, that is Andres is, is the secretary of culture of uh, of the government of of San Miguel. Um, we had the visit of of uh, the major in in, in the evening. Um, well, the entire equipment of the, the entire team, sorry, of uh, Bella Vista al Cosmos. Here, a uh, aerial view of of the in the end of the night with a drum when the people uh, gone. 
Orion, we, we took a picture of Orion, uh, Fernando Ricardini took a picture of Orion uh, by the 10 inches telescope, uh, Alta Stimut telescope only, only mm. to say, okay, we can do it that. Nice. With the uh, one of of the pictures with the uh, of the moon with the Explorer Scientific uh, 500 five sorry inches uh, Maxutop telescope. Wow, yeah, we used it a lot it again. One. Yeah, yeah, we <laughs> we are <laughs> working a lot with this telescope. This telescope was for uh, for the staff tele, tele, Saraco Telescopios staff, and we using a lot to show to the people to make image have a very very nice resolution i have a very good pictures of uh, jupiter again uh, but i don't have in this group of in this gallery of pictures here we we had a, a, a stand with a, a lot of things about uh, this guy uh, oscar ferris is, is a is a great specialist in solar uh, clocks um all about uh, sextantes or uh, uh, his study, all about the, um, the old in instruments, uh, as in instruments of astronomy. Um, it's, it's a genius to, to show to the people, very, very interesting uh, to, to, um, to talk with the people and show how the all the ASEAN instrument in astronomy work. Uh, we had a DJ this time, and um, he, of course, that uh, we we uh, enjoy the music from Star Trek, Star Wars, you know, and something electronic uh, from from uh, uh, Daft Punk or uh, you know. But all was about the space. N nothing. The DJ is is a, a, a amateur astronomer, and he was very concerned to to. Um, only to to uh, play music uh, about stars about astronomy you know space was very 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 nice and uh, here well uh, we used a lot of uh, telescopes to show to the people uh, we had a lot of people uh, around the 9 p.m um, the time where the the connections work very bad well <laughs> we have uh, the most of the of, of the people coming uh, around between the 8 and 10 p.m. in the night. Here we, we had uh, uh, the, the area to show with telescope uh, lunar surface or observation, light observation uh, th through the telescope too. More pictures of the day. This uh, this man have a real meteoritus. This one are two meteoritus. The same, the same uh, exposure that uh, uh, that we show. The same show that we we um, uh, show in in the last event. And here, but, but it is very important that uh, because um, Jorge Rusanji is a part of our our group. Um, Bella Vista del Cosmos, and it's a it's a very important piece because he worked in the observatory in in the uh, 25 years ago. He was a uh, important part of the observatory, and for us, really, it's uh, um, it's a great piece of um, of uh, helping for us because he know everything about how the the works how works the instruments and the parts. And this is very, very important that Jorge Rosansky is, is, is with us. Well, an, another picture of Oscar Ferro uh, showing to the people about Astrolabios. Here was very interesting because he's a, just, if, I don't know if uh, how Jesuita is in English, I don't remember. Hmm. Um, he's a, a like a monk, and uh, is Jesuit a monk? Jesuit, I think it, it's called. Jesuit, Jesuit. Well, he he was a part of the of the observatory and have a lot of information. It's very old, and 
for us was um, a, 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 was a pleasure that uh, Santiago Mayese and Jorge Rusanski talked with uh, with uh, these men and was amazing. Really, uh, we was uh, really amazed with the histories and the knowledge about the observatory that that he have. More people. More people <laughs> watching, enjoying, you know, and really was a, a great, a great uh, evening and night. We we enjoyed a lot of uh, lunar observation and planets of observations. Here and another aerial uh, view with a drum of the observatory. Here is the Liot for H Alpha telescope that we are working with that. Here, uh, now actually this dome is empty, but we are working to fill with a telescope that. And this one is where we have the Gustav uh, Haydn refractor one. Um, it's around, uh, it's a 500, uh, yes, five, five inches telescope from, from the, uh, the end of the 80s, from, not the 80s, from, sorry. Is the aim from the 80s? <laughs> it's, oh, it's around, yes, are around. We, we think that is 120 years old at least, because Gustav Haydn was by it by size telescope. And if a telescope, if you do have a telescope that say Gustav, Gustav Haydn is, is really. Um, is older than 100 years old because Gustav Haydn sold his company to size, you know, it, and this is very interesting. Mm -hmm. And work properly. We made the, the old mechanism. We, we have completely, completely, you know, this is the Obsidiana uh, solar filter telescope, uh, Scott, that. I, I tell you many times we ah. use the explore scientific uh, uh, IPs for to show to the people and was amazing yeah. how the Thank new you. technology work properly uh, like uh, in the in the um, your refractors that that in the, in the biggest refractor of, of the of the world hmm. use explore scientific uh, IPs and I, I say that with size telescope were very all telescope work incredibly when, yeah. when you mix the old and the new technology. But in optics, nothing is new technology. You know, that is right. incredible <laughs> for, for many for years and years of yeah. using. It's incredible. Good optics last for a very, very, very long time. Absolutely. Yes. 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 It's something that you left to your grand, grand, grandchild, grandkids. That's right. it's, yes, absolutely. Um, here the band of, of the of the government of the local uh, uh, San Miguel band uh, official band made a beautiful beautiful they played a beautiful music for the for the sunset it was amazing really uh, because this one is is in the middle of the suburban areas and it's great because when you go to the, to this uh, observatory area it, you feel like a very like in a, a very open area is it's great mm. really well this one is the 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 the, the old one telescope uh, um the the size telescope it's not saraco telescope sorry it's size telescope but somebody put my my <laughs> My sticker of of our company. No, no, it's a size telescope. Was more of of the band, more of the equipment, and uh, here well uh, another picture. Really, really, uh, we enjoyed a lot. We had um, we had a, a great a great time uh, with a lot of people and. Uh, Really, we enjoy it uh, a lot, and we are preparing a small surf party with the uh, with the um, 
amateur astronomers with telescopes. And our idea is um, we invited, invited amateur astronomers with telescope and they was very happy to show to the people because we separate the area, you know, because when you have curious people that come in, that is perfect. And we have we had telescopes to show to the people, but the people start to walk in to another area with the, the amateur astronomer that made uh, that uh, uh, you know put their telescope and yeah. say no no this is and this is for for only for amateur astronomers you know that they have their own telescope come on to watch your telescope and amateur astronomers say no 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 problem come on <laughs> And it was a great, really, the people start to enjoy it. A lot of people went with the amateur uh, astronomer with their own telescope. And, and I thought first that, well, that they say, okay, this will be an, a nightmare because, you know, sometimes the people that say, okay, I'm, can, I made pictures or I have my telescope very, but no, it was amazing because the people, the, 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 amateur astronomers we, we like to talk with the people and say no this is you know this is my telescope and this i'm functioning with this better than us maybe <laughs> and of course there was friends that was very happy with the people um really enjoy it to talk with the visitors uh without telescope showing and talking about how is uh, uh, amateur astronomy to the people that and it was amazing and sometimes you scare more that than and say no i'm scared i'm scared about this and say no was amazing um many people told me wow the, these guys are amazing and showed me a lot and about how they made uh, astrophotography um well it's amazing was amazing was an amazing night and it's very really something that that uh, be, uh, be coming from uh, time big very long time without see people without uh, uh, be in a real place was really something that well we can repeat the next six uh, six um, eleven and of course that we make smaller smaller uh, star party maybe we will be uh, uh, no more than 50 people with telescopes um, talking and uh, making pictures of the sky the sky is of course a very polluted area is uh, is worth maybe seven or eight but uh, we have a lot of planets and, and fun talkings about uh, you know and um, maybe Bondiolas, Maxi, and uh, yeah, I, I told something about barbecue, and uh, um, <laughs> and well, this is the the idea for for uh, uh, our next step party. Is it for enjoying? You know, you can have, you can take your uh, planetary camera, put in the old telescope, and you can use the your camera reflex camera or or a planetary camera in in the old one telescope the, the gustav hayden uh we are inviting to the amateurs to use their telescope in this historic area and um use uh, using two uh telescopes and the old telescope and talking about the history and talking about how um make photography helping for the newest uh, the newest amateur astronomers too and of course that this this is the idea for for the next star party yeah that sounds great yeah that sounds great <laughs> thank you thank you scott thank you caesar well yeah caesar, thank excellent you, maxi. presentation thank you I'm maxi glad, too i'm glad to you know uh was well, a star party that you did and all the people that had come to together in this situation that we're passing by so i'm i'm glad to know that it's starting again uh, well our next uh, up next is uh, our friend from nepal uh, dipti gautam uh dipti are you there yeah i'm here well 
Tipsy, thank you for uh, joining us. Um, see, uh, let's see what, what you want to share. Okay, uh, thank you, Maxi. Uh, Maxi Valers and all, all out here. And I realized today just, uh, just before, uh, just a year ago, I have joined Global Star Party on 19 October, that is 20 October, continue please date. And it's been a year now, just today, it's been mm. a year, I uh, joining the Global Star today? Party number of, yeah, today. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> So it's the anniversary, um, and um, uh, today I'm connecting. Uh, I'm showing uh, some of my uh, photography, uh, which I've tried uh, to capture through my system and telescope, and um, all this uh, campaign which I've been running in uh, Cyborg Astronomy too. And I will connect um, my presentations with a kind of poem and relate with the theme too. So okay. So I like to start with uh, connecting with the theme. Here is the boy. Uh, this is my telescope, and this is the uh, eight-year boy. Uh, he is pointing toward the moon. He was really curious uh, to know, and uh, I am connecting here like the boy uh, see the moon, see the sky, and pointed the moon and asked, "What's that?" I replied, "The moon." He again asked, "The star near to the moon." What's that? The star near to the moon. And I said, that's the planet Jupiter. Okay. And he replied, what are they? And I said, moon is a natural satellite of Earth and Jupiter is the planet of our solar system. Boy again said, but why they have much important on our life? Why they are always there to see us? Are they observing us? Or are they expecting something from us? A number of questions arise and why they are here, what are they doing, why we are searching about it. And he was really curious uh, to see the moon and Jupiter through my telescope. Uh, I couldn't capture the picture of the Jupiter through my phone and telescope, but I can see clearly I can see the Jupiter and it's uh, Jupiter and it's a three moon with the te my telescope. Uh, here's the short video I have captured uh, from my uh, uh, mobile phone. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, this is the uh, photograph I've taken, the background. I really love this background uh, in the evening. And I really love this uh, scene, which is created in the evening, the sunset and the Jupiter and the moon rises up. And uh, here is the pictures of a moon and uh, Jupiter too. And uh, here's the telescope. Uh, and uh, this is the uh, campaign uh, we have run in this uh, another orphan home that is a uh, disabled home and uh, these kids were really interested about to uh, we teach them about the astronomy what is the space science and here is the uh, 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 students are uh, here people are from uh, age of uh, 9 to 14 is of 9 to 14 years old and uh, they were really new to about this and they were really curious about what's the moon and what the, we uh, introduced them or the creator of the moon and uh, similarly all this planet and all the phenomena of astronomy and space science and um, similarly uh, I have captures uh, the moon uh, with my telescope and uh, this is uh, which I have captures um, uh, through my telescope, is it clear? Yes. I think yeah. I have captured uh, recently, uh, just uh, three days ago. I have captured it, but it seems uh, now it ha we have very cloudy uh, weather now since uh, two days, at the, um, because of the rain. And similarly, and uh, about this kid, uh, we we were teaching about them, and they were. Listening very carefully about the space science and the one boy after this event, uh, he said, "I want to be astronomer in the future." <laughs> mm -hmm. 
uh, this month. I have put the campaign and in the occasion of the old space week, as I was, uh, I already mentioned in the last you know, global star party, I was coordinating in my local local governments uh, over the star part over the old space week and conducting the various programs, going to the school and uh, other organizations and uh, kind of, and uh, similarly, I have tried uh, the side of astronomy. I set up my telescope and take out of out of my home. And um, I just set up there and the people were curiously coming to see the moon. And similarly, I use solar filter and observe, uh, make people observe the sun to their solar observations uh, in the day. And uh, just, uh, I was very uh, happy to see this reaction of the people uh, while they see the moon, the sun and, uh, I really enjoy it and people uh, out there also enjoy looking up and know extra about it. And uh, one boy, uh, he's excited, one boy come to me and he said, uh, Dipti, uh, can you set up a telescope? I want to look the sun. <laughs> and uh, I set up this uh, telescope and I let it, him to observe uh, this sun, uh, you can. And he was just uh, continuously looking like, I want to see it uh, for a while. Just give me a time. I want to see it. And he was continuously looking for. Uh, uh, he was not letting uh, that. He was looking continuously for 10, 10 minutes, and like he was like, "Oh, what's that in a black dots?" And uh, uh, so that's a uh, black dots. What is the black dots in the sun? And he was asking of all sorts of questions, and it was really great. Thank you, this Ms. Fajr. Well, sure. thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Nifty. And well, I think uh, this uh, concludes the, the second session that we we uh, been expecting for all the this week that has passed by. So Scott, uh, thank you again for thank you uh, for the, the the space to to show what we do here in the south uh, with maybe a single uh, equipment or maybe a professional equipment and because you know like like uh, we always say that you can do astronomy with everything that you have in your pocket uh, with your eyes uh, teaching everything and well it, this is the spark that we want to spread uh, to all of the audience uh, uh, to everyone who's uh, interested to starting to do astronomy and of course astrophotography so thank you again for the space and uh, well let's continue in, uh, with the schedule thanks yeah. again to all the thank audience thank you thank um, you maxi thanks for co-hosting this event and for bringing on your team and uh you know they are of course welcome to come back anytime and uh um uh you know, and uh, uh, as well you as you, Maxi. So thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for contributing so much to this uh, this program again and again. It's been awesome. Um, and DP, congratulations to you for celebrating uh, one year with Global Star Party. So that that's really incredible as well. Happy birthday! Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you. That's right. Yeah, I do have a question for DT. Uh, DP, yeah. how, how do you feel? Has the Global Star Party added uh, anything to your um, experience in astronomy. Yes, really. Uh, the first time um, I have uh, got uh, to, uh, no, I, have, I want to use the telescope uh, when I was using a year ago. Uh, but um, when I see this photography done by the all out here, and uh, when I see the astrophotography I done and uh, so in, uh, in this global style party, I really um, feel amazed. And that was the first time I see the yeah, um, like a life for the life, I can see this. I think uh, I have uh, seen Caesar Bros. Um, uh, photograph, extra photographic first time in this global star party. Yes. Uh, when I was attending uh, that, and uh, about talking about the experience, uh, it really are uh, talking about the experience. I, I wouldn't really appreciate that uh, the and uh, um, 
kind of um, it is uh, like uh, after joining the Global Party, uh, it's like I'm getting the inspirations and all sorts of uh, connection with the peoples out uh, the out uh, out of the world around the world. In the Nepal and motivations and kind of uh, I'm the inspiration of many people, my my friends and they are really happy to see me here and. Um, I think uh, it's the great opportunity. I already, I have always mentioned that it's the great opportunity for me to get in the when I getting into the astronomy and I got I got uh, this opportunity with you from you just a year ago. And I think uh, we have talked uh, about this global star party uh, with you in October 13. I don't uh, I didn't uh, forget that day. That's October 13 uh, when you come uh, message me. Or about this global star party and um, yeah. send me to join this uh, global star party. And uh, at first I feel like, um, like what is this global star party and all. And um, as you have mentioned uh, to join and I was really excited let's join and what's happened. And after joining, like um, I can see the uh, young, uh, youngest uh, astronomer than me that is a living star. And this is really an inspiration for me too and uh, what she's doing in her age. And now I'm 17 years old and I have joined in this, when I was 16 year old in this global star party. And I like, I feel like uh, Libby in this, Libby has done a very good job now. And like oh, yes. uh, in her age, uh, we just used to, we just, yeah, though we have interest in the astronomy, we just used to source in the internet, what is about it, but we didn't get the chance to involve in it. Uh, completely, though uh, we have uh, a lot of organizations around here in Nepal, but um, um, but uh, we don't get uh, much exposures about uh, all this astronomy and space science. So we and now uh, we get a kind of confidence and like uh, when we have to introduce ourselves in the public and uh, people are kind of uh, if we said I can. Uh, I am uh, presenting my uh, presentations in the Global Star Party, and the people's, uh, you know, people uh, want to listen us. Really, they want to listen us when we put in the campaign and like introducing them. I'm presenting in the Global Star Party, and that's uh, which is organized by Explore Scientific US, and uh, they feel like okay, we are we are to listen from you something, and they listen very carefully. And kind of um, this uh, coming into Global Star Party has given a kind of way to us a meaning a meaning uh, for our people uh, want to listen us uh, very carefully. Um, because of one kind of uh, it has a portfolio it has made one kind of great portfolio uh, to move on on the field of astronomy so um i think uh, for uh, moving on the uh, field of astronomy i really appreciate this uh, global star party and the nasa nepal astronomical society which is uh, completely supporting us and my own organizations we are running our organizations and we are planning now to go, go to physically conducting the programs physically around the all nepal mm. because the, we are distributed in all around nepal the team of the uh, astronomy enthusiast in nepal so with uh, we have seven uh, local province in our um, in our country and uh, we are uh, we are separated in all the seven province so um, we are uh, deciding to conduct different programs after because after uh, after a month because we have uh, festivals now festival is running in our country and it's a uh, great festivals of nepal it is called dosai and tihar so uh, it's kind of vacation now in dosai and tihar and so we are planning to conduct the program physically around around all the nepal after this uh, globe after this uh, festival uh, when the festival is ended and the school college and all those organizations is open back then we will go to the school college and conduct different programs and now uh, this uh, though the festival was running we consulted with the school college uh, do you want to we want to um, share our knowledge and uh, talk about the space science and astronomy and share uh, something with your students and mm -hmm. also the observations and some of the school and college invited us seeing our profile phase like 
why don't you come in our school to uh, uh, share with our students? They, are, they will be, it will be great if they got the knowledge and the time. Um, like when I was uh, before joining this um, astronomy and science, um, and I think um, when I was 16, I got to join after completion of my grade 10th. And uh, there are a lot of people who are joining from the scenes. And I, I was taken deep in Gimiri already in this Globester party. He mm. was he was continuously um, uh, following this uh, astronomy and space science. Uh, it's been a three years already. And he continuously uh, made the video on the different topic and uploaded in his YouTube page. And um, similarly, he learned and he participated in the different programs. And he's near, uh, near my house. And, um, uh, sometime I take him to the further observation programs and he joined with us uh, and uh, he just he mentioned that I learned a lot of things um, and though I have uh, I have uh, sourced a lot of things for posting in my YouTube videos for making videos but um, while coming to the observation part uh, while coming for in the topic of observation part and this observation and when I take him to for the observation and people uh, to make the observation when the people see him uh, they feel really motivated the small kid is coming here to show us the moon and sun and they feel like uh, why can't we do like they like him uh, we can do like him and kind of we have greater motivation and it was uh, I already said uh just uh, before uh, that uh, the way we, we have gone to this uh disabled home and the one boy at last one boy smile uh, uh say a smile with his smiley face that i want to be astronomers in the future and uh, one boy was saying uh, i want i really want to go to the moon i want to be astronomers and like oh. their person their person was coming out and they were sharing about uh, what they really feel about uh, the astronomy and space science. Uh, we feel like uh, many of the peoples, many of the students, many of the peoples around here, though they have this, um, they have do have the interest in this space science, but they do not reflect because uh, they they feel like we don't have any scope in here. So we don't want to make that humor like uh, we don't have any scope for the space science astronomy. But uh, we wanna uh, tell them we have we have we can go far better than this. And um, if we collectively uh, make the effort and if we uh, conduct different programs and if people uh, come with a different interest to learn, so we can be the same uh, together. And we have a kind of team collectively. We are a team around all Nepal. We have collected in, uh, in one uh, already. And um, we can connect anyone around us and conduct the programs. So um, we have already built a community of um, all the around interested peoples around all this Nepal. So as Nepal is a small country, so it's not difficult to collect all the peoples who are interested in this. Uh, so uh, we have already make it uh, to collect the all the peoples around here and we are sourcing for others and I'm just preferring to uh, collect some other young people who are just the age of 19, 11, 12 so they can do better uh, than us and, and just they can secure their life in this field and they can do much better because if the, we can tease them in the small age they will tease, uh, they will learn uh, more better and they will learn many more things yes that's right that's yeah. right yeah because the experience and all this will give a lots of knowledge not only the book things and all. yeah that's great dt you're going to go far and you're going to see the, these young people grow up and change the world so that's wonderful and you're doing it too so thank yeah. you thank you dt okay thank you. um thank you so much uh, we are going to uh, take a 10 minute break and then we're coming back. Uh, we still have more to go here. We got Jerry Hubble from the um, uh, Mark Slade Remote Observatory. We've got Libby in the Stars who will be on. Uh, Jenny Hines from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, Montreal Center will be on. And then of course, uh, everybody's uh, uh, favorite uh, night sky photographer, uh, Adrian Bradley. Um, so stay tuned, uh, more to come.
Hey, Cesar Nico, did you saw the moon right now? No, let me let me see. Hey guys, I'm back. It's hey, amazing. Nico. Amazing the moon. It's it's like when you are in the in the coast, uh, Mar del Plata, Miramar, when you see the, that that moon that's shining and it's no clouds, there, there's no stars. It's, it's, I don't know how to describe it. Yeah. I just unplugged my, my laptop to go and check. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I took yeah. my telescope out. Oh man, it's beautiful. Yeah, I have my dog outside. So for the after party, maybe I connect the camera. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> no, tonight I will not we're not going to be outside i think uh, but well well thank you guys for uh be part of the uh, gsp and 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 share what you doing oh thank you max amazing host <laughs> oh <laughs> no, i'm going to yeah great host and thanks. Thanks a lot for the invitation. I, I really appreciate it. You know, I've been looking forward to participate for some time. You're, you're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, no, I think I'm going to to cook some panchos <laughs> to be quickly. The panchos I'm, I'm is... waiting for Cesar's bondiolas. <laughs> oh. Cesar is going to be the 6th of November. Is that would be the day? Yeah. Okay. So yes, I, I put in the chat. Yeah. Nico, everyone coming that can come in. Excelente. Yeah. Anotado. Uh, I will bring right. the chorizo seco from here. Uh, okay. Nico, okay. Nico, Seba, have tasted. Alan too. <laughs> yeah. I didn't. No, I didn't. No, no. I, 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 that's right. I didn't. I, I didn't uh, when we when we met. I didn't put uh, Ariel tasted. <laughs> yeah, <true>. I, <laughs> <laughs> it's a really weird conversation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's why. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, Ariel was uh, well, what he couldn't be here, so we can say <laughs> this. <laughs> well, whatever we want. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I will move in to my patio. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> It's okay. I'm moving to my patio. Right. I think in in North America they uh, they say to patio, like backyard. Backyard. Maybe because I when, when I see when I when I said the the astro patio observa patio and Scott really love he, he understand. Mm. Yes. <laughs> the observa patio. That's. Uh, that's the name of, of an observatory uh, made in your backyard. So it's the Observa Patio. Incredible.
At Johns Hopkins University, astrophysicists are studying the distribution of matter in the cosmos. Mark Nyrink believes an origami model can help represent that distribution. We can only observe visible matter, shown here, the material that forms stars, planets, and entire galaxies. But this is only part of our universe. There is also a mysterious substance called dark matter that's invisible. Astrophysicists have detected it only indirectly, but many believe that it forms the hidden skeleton of our universe. The dark matter started to accumulate into clumps almost immediately after the Big Bang, and we wouldn't have as much structure as we see in the universe today if there hadn't been this dark matter. The normal matter started to form structures based on the groundwork, the, the skeleton that the dark matter laid down right away. So the dark matter is really the, the basis of understanding the structures that we see today. According to Nyrink, the unseen dark matter folds like origami. Gravity gathers and crumples together the dark matter sheet in places where ordinary matter is drawn to form galaxies and stars. Pleats in the sheet, called filaments, poke out from each galaxy, aligning its rotation with neighboring galaxies in a pattern, similar to an origami twist fold. In a twist fold, you have a small polygon, so let's say a, a, a triangle. So here we have a triangle. And going from the unfolded to the folded state entails twisting that triangle. Even though this is a dark matter structure, it accretes uh, regular matter toward that. So the galaxy here would form here. <laughs> it's a strong approximation that the universe forms like an origami model. In particular, the way that various elements of the cosmic web are spinning are very explicit in this model. We see in the universe that neighboring galaxies tend to be rotating in the same direction, and that actually relates to this origami model. Nyrink is now working with students to create a more complex model that captures how dark matter folds intersect to build the cosmic web. The dots on the paper represent the galaxies as observed by telescopes. Whenever the paper is overlapping, there is an accumulation of dark matter, and therefore, a greater number of galaxies. Astrophysics is now being enriched with a new vision of a folded universe, inspired by the ancient art of origami. Scott chooses the coolest videos, does he? You're muted, Scott. We can't hear you. That's right, you can't. <laughs> well, now we can. No, there are so many cool videos out there. You know, the visualizations that are done by NASA and the European Space Agency are incredible. Um, some of these programs are also put together by public broadcasting uh, television stations and, uh, you know, often interviewing really kind of cutting edge scientists and, and uh, these people. So uh, when I, when I, often when I see visualizations of the, you know, the greater part of the, you know, the universe, the, the really large scale stuff, it reminds me of the, kind of the neuron uh, connections that are inside the human brains, you know, and, uh, or maybe all brains uh, for that matter. Um, but uh, it never occurred to me to think of, uh, you know, an origami uh, structured universe. So very, very cool stuff, you know. Um, so welcome back, everybody. Uh, we are uh, 
We're back uh, for the third and final session uh, before we go to after party of the Global Star Party. And uh, up next, uh, waiting patiently has been Jerry Hubble uh, from the Mark Slade Remote Observatory. Uh, Jerry, it's it's all yours. I, I do wanna say that Jerry has been very inspirational in getting a lot of people started in science. Um, he, when I first met Jerry, uh, he was, uh, you know, very interested uh, and serious amateur astronomer uh, that eventually came to work here at Explore Scientific. He is today vice president of engineering for our company. Um, he uh, has been overseeing very complex projects for our go-to uh, telescope systems. Uh, he's been involved in uh, training our staff um, and uh, you know, really is an integral part of the DNA of Explore Scientific, I, I think. And um, you, you know, like he has gone. since gone on to write books and um, uh, is the, um, one of the directors of uh, the Mark Slater Remote Observatory, which is uh, showing people around the world how to do science. So Jerry, I'm going to turn it over yep. to you. Thanks, Scott. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I've, I've been lucky in my career. I've had two careers now in my life. One was nuclear power and one is astronomy. So I found that the interesting thing about that, both both do work in domed buildings. So <laughs> the containment structure of a nuclear plant is a domed it's, building. It's and very it similar. A, yeah, it's, it looks pretty much the same, but this different. <laughs> one of them you can fly a 747 into and, and not right. hurt on the other one. Well, you know, you, you can't. <laughs> right. Well, you can, but the results might not be as. Uh, That's right. Yeah, one gets as, uh, as good. one of the one other gets, gets more damage than the other. So, yeah. Right. But uh, so thanks, Scott. I appreciate uh, being able to uh, come on and show uh, everyone at the uh, Mark Slade Remote Observatory. Uh, we started the Mark Slade Remote Observatory about, it's been almost six years ago now. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I'm going to show you is station one, where we have uh, actually have our technical innovations six foot dome. And I'll show you a picture of that. I'm going to go ahead and share my desktop here. I'm going to share the observatory desktop. Uh, do you see that? Not yet, but it's coming. Here we go. So, not sure what's going on with my webcam. So, let me bring up the MSRO Science webpage just to give you an idea of uh, what we do. We're, we're into three different things, Re outreach, uh, training, and research opportunities for amateurs and professionals alike. And over the last uh, three years, we've been able to have several people come through our training program, students in high school, and also people all over the world uh, have remotely accessed the uh, Mark Slade Remote Observatory to do science, which is kind of exciting. Um, uh, so if you go to msroscience.org, that's where you'll find us. And I want to just uh, show you what station one looks like. So this is our first station that we're, I'm going to show you the desk that we're on the desktop of the computer inside this building right now. And, uh, and people always wonder, why did you put the observatory up against a grove of trees? <laughs> yeah. You know, because we only want to see half the sky. That's, that's why I always answer no. That's not why. That's because it's like it's like when you which telescope is easiest to use. It's the one, it's the one you'll take out all the time because it's lightweight. You know, right? It's not hard to set up. So that's the one you'll use the most. So that that happened to be the same reason we built the uh, building there is because there was uh, a deck there already. There was power running to that location, and it was just the easiest thing to set up quickly. So we do have plans. We do have other stations that are out in the middle of the backyard. This is Dr. Myron Masuda's backyard, but we have we actually have three stations here. This is station one. Station two and three are out in the middle of the yard where you can see a lot more of the sky. And uh, and but this is a good training facility. We, we're training. Uh, we have a good training program, a hands-on training program. 
We don't do full automation on our telescope systems. They're hands-on type of systems. Uh, and I'd, I'd, I'd really prefer that type of process. I like, I like sitting in a comfortable environment like I am here in my control center. You can see behind me. But, uh, but also I like to operate the telescope uh, by hand. So that's what I'm gonna demonstrate here. And, and right now I've slewed to earlier to M27, Messier 27, which is the Dumbbell Nebula. It's in, it's in uh, the constellation uh, uh, Volpecula. And I'm gonna start this camera up again because it's got a weird, I don't know why it's not doing a correct, Actually, I'm gonna just disconnect the camera and reconnect it right now. So you can see right now, I've got a picture of the Dumbbell Nebula here that I took a few minutes ago. This is a 90 second exposure. Uh, the instrument we're using is a six and a half inch refractor uh, with a QHY 163 camera on it, color camera. It can do, uh, we bend it by two to do science imaging, to do photometry and astrometry, which is a measure of the star position and the brightness of the stars. And you can see how nice uh, our tracking system works. We have a high resolution encoder tracking system uh, on the mount that keeps the stars- Nice and round. Nice and round over long periods of time. And we don't have to think about it. There's no auto guiding. It's, it's just turn it on and it works. And it gives us uh, uh, tracking down to 0.3 arc seconds or so, which is good enough. Okay. It's always, you know, don't let perfect ruin good enough for your overall system. That's one of the tips I would give everybody. Don't, don't chase that little unicorn that, that's in the corner there that you think needs to be perfect uh, to get the rest of your imaging if the rest of your equipment doesn't meet that requirement or doesn't match that. So, and a big, and this is one thing that's I'm, I'm maybe controversial. I don't know. I have to see what Adrian thinks about this, but you don't need a perfect polar alignment to do astrophotography. In fact, you don't want a perfect polar alignment to do astrophotography. You want to compensate for some imperfections that are in your mount. And Adrian knows about that. And I'm sure that yes. and I know for a fact that uh, everybody else knows about that, that are experienced astrophotographers. I've run around with my tracking mount, aimed it toward the North Star and said, good enough. Let's see what I can get. Sometimes, <laughs> right. of, sometimes exactly. it works out well. Yeah. Right. So um, so that's just a little tip. I'm going to um, let me go back to here and increase this. You can see the telescope in the building in that little hut. Mm -hmm. It's a seven by seven foot uh, cube, basically. And it's got the six foot dome on top of it. And the bright, the lights look a lot brighter, but this is a four second exposure. They're not near as bright as that. Um, if you were inside there, it'd be practically pitch black. Uh, but the camera is very sensitive. It's a ZWO camera and uh, it's four shot on time. Terry and his dog. dog wants to, your dog yeah, wants to help you my, with your presentation. My wife's coming in the door probably is what, what my, happens my, all the time. My dog, here <laughs> up his ears what's going on <laughs> right right you know uh we didn't explain why you don't want to do perfect polar alignment and one of the reasons why is that uh you would like to have your gears preloaded always pushing in the same direction okay instead of jumping back and forth um especially in declination you know right. so this is right. usually There's where lash. you start to see drift um, because, uh, you know, you can, you can correct for a lot in, uh, RA, um, uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, the residual drift is something you want to kind of keep pushing that gear a little tiny bit in the same direction all the time, whether it's going to be North or South, you know, so that's right. Yep. Yeah. So this is a color version of that image. This is a Ben one image, uh, that it's, uh, Maxim DL doesn't have the best processing for color, and I'm not I'm not a color astrophotographer, so it suits me okay. <laughs> you know, if I want to, 
and this is a single image. It's not a stacked image or anything, but you can see, you can see, still see quite a bit of detail. Now, if you notice the difference between this image and this image is that this image has been too, but it's got blown out features. Okay, you can see it's basically saturated in this area, but it's the same 90 second exposure. So when you, when you combine the light from basically four pixels when you bend two, you're gonna, each pixel is gonna be overexposed where on a color image uh, like this one, it may not be. You can see more detail in here mm. and you got the color differences too. So, but again, you can see how nice and round the stars are. Um, it's a very precise uh, system. The, the, the 165 is an excellent telescope. It's awesome. Uh, to be able to have access to it and use it in the sky. And this is, of course, uh, the, the dumbbell is located in the Milky Way. So that's why you got all these stars out here. But even with the 90 second exposure, you can see, I imagine I'd have to go measure, but I think you can see stars down to like 16th and 17th magnitude, especially on the black and white on the uh, bend image. You can see these really dim stars here, mm. like right here. Right. You know. They're, they're, they're 17th and 18th magnitude, which is pretty amazing with the camera systems we have today. And Gary can talk about the camera systems. He's an expert on those. Um, so I just wanted to give you an overview and give you and just talk a little bit about what we do. Um, we, I use CART to seal as my planetarium program. And uh, one of the things that I like to show here, you see all this brown stuff around here? That's the trees that you saw in that photograph. <laughs> so this is the part of the sky that we can see right now uh, that's lit up with the star chart. Um, so Very handy. Yep, so you can draw the horizon, if that's a tip. If you use Cart to Seal, you can actually do measurements across your horizon and enter them into a file. Uh, it's a simple two, Two entry file. It's like it's got the uh, the first line. You know, each line is a is a point on this horizon, and the first number is the azimuth in degrees, and then the second number is the altitude of the horizon of your tree line or whatever it is that's blocking your house or whatever. So you just create a file that's a sequence of these two numbers, the azimuth and the altitude. And you can make them any value you want between zero and, of course, azimuth is zero to 360. Altitude is zero to 90. And then you can just uh, go to your setup, uh, go to the um, observatory, and there's a horizon tab. And then that's where you select the uh, file. And then it'll draw that horizon when you're in azimuth uh, mode on the chart. That's a little tip for using cart to seal with your horizon. Uh, anybody have any questions about it, about the uh, operation? We use Maxim DL, like I said. And uh, I didn't know that in cart to seal you can do that. <laughs> I think yeah, I yeah, to... yeah, yeah. So try it out. Uh, and also, I, I have to to learn how to. Uh, uh, put uh, with the with the mount uh, and do the the meridian flip. I think it goes right when I'm pointing pointing to the southeast or northeast, then goes to the zenith and change the meridian. They have to flip, but I didn't configure it uh, for now. Excellent. Right. So uh, I have a question, Jerry. What what is uh, what's happening right now as far as research at MSRO? So Myron is in a, a couple of campaigns. One is uh, with uh, supernovae. Uh, he's been imaging different supernovae as they come come along and 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 track. You know, try to do it as much. He's working with a another. Um, I think he's a college student. That's in. I'm trying to remember where he's at. He's somewhere else in the world. He's working with him to uh, gather data on supernova curve when they, you know, so when they light curves over time. Uh, 
So that's one program that's going on. I'm, I'm working with a couple of our members or uh, uh, users of the observatory to do exoplanet training. We're getting uh, our training program revamped and getting our documentation working on that. So that's a long-term project uh, that uh, we do have uh, information developed already, documents and all to do training. But we're just working on that. We're continually working on that stuff to make it better. Hmm. That's basically, I don't, I don't have a lot of time to work on the observatory, not as much as I'd like, but uh, I do spend a several hours a week on it. Uh, and then I do the, I, I'm the maintenance guy for the observatory systems, of course, you know, um, and, and we, I manage, uh, work with Myron on the other stations we have, we've networked all of our stations together. We've got some, uh, good, uh, data storage capacity. We've got 12 terabytes of data storage. We're using about four terabytes of data right now over the last five years. That's about how much we have. Uh, I tell you what, just one night of lunar imaging for me, uh, you can gather 30 gigabytes of imaging data pretty easily and within an hour. It doesn't take long to, uh, to fill up a hard drive <laughs> if you're doing high resolution lunar imaging. You know, deep sky imaging is not quite as bad in terms of capacity requirements. But again, uh, like I said, we've got almost four terabytes of data. We've got tens of thousands of images we've taken. They're ripe for for inspection to do double, you know, to uh, do uh, variable star measurements, all kinds of stuff. That's something I'd like to think about automating some of this analysis of this data. I know we, we've worked on a uh, program to catalog all of our data into a database where we go out and open each file and read the FITS header and then store that information in a database automatically and then we can search for locations uh, what images do we have at this location what you know uh so we can do perhaps do a time series on that on certain stars in that area of the sky or something like that you know this it's the the benefits are huge if we can catalog all this all these images we've taken so that's another long-term project at the observatory very cool very cool. You know, there, this is a great, I, the way that I look at Mark Slade Remote Observatory is it's an excellent uh, training ground to, to get involved in uh, professional amateur collaborations. Um, the uh, International Astronomical Union and the American Astronomical Society are both very involved in connecting amateur astronomers uh, with professionals. There's also the AAVSO, uh, ALPO, a couple of other programs that you can find. One of the areas that you can go and uh, check uh, for uh, pro-am projects that you could get involved with, I'm talking about projects that where you, you might make a discovery or you might, you very well will, uh, would land up on a scientific paper uh, is through uh, a program uh, a website called Zooniverse, um, mm -hmm. which uh, is a great uh, launching uh, pad right there. But you do have to develop some skills, and uh, MSRO can help you develop those skills uh, so that you will be making observations like a professional astronomer would. Okay, uh, you know you'll be working with a six and a half inch telescope, but as you already see. Uh, uh, that six and a half inch telescope can be quite powerful going, you know, down to 17th, 18th magnitude stars. Uh, that would include a ton of asteroids, um, yeah, uh, that kind work. of thing. Um, and, uh, you know, Jerry and his team also uh, uh, like to work on exoplanets. They're, they're part of, uh, they're one of the uh, uh, teams that's involved with the TESS program. Uh, so, um, right. But the I IAU and the AAS are very, very interested in enlisting as many amateur astronomers as they can uh, to be involved in program collaborations because they need the they need the um, uh, the additional manpower and woman power and kid power yeah, it takes, to yeah, do this. You know, you've got tons of discovery going on. There's there's discovering all these objects and they can't do effective follow up work unless they you know, that they want amateurs to help doing follow-up work. It's, it's an excellent opportunity. 
and that's we great. we train the the equipment and the um and the software and all the techniques we teach are basically what you learn in college to do to be an astronomer for hands on the hands-on part of running an observatory it's using modern equipment modern software state-of-the-art software basically um and um uh, we're a nonprofit, and we do it on a on a small budget <laughs> right we accept we <laughs> We, we accept donations, donations. Right? yeah, we want donations as much as we can, but right. we get by, I mean, we, 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 you know, people that are directly involved fund it basically for the most part, we do get donations from, we've gotten quite a few donations over the last five years, which we were very welcome. And then Explore Scientific, of course, helps us with the equipment quite a bit. And uh, without Explore Scientific, Station One wouldn't exist basically uh, yeah. in terms of the opportunity. Best. Mm -hmm. Trying to do our best. Uh, one of the people that's involved in Pro Am is really inspiring, and she will be on one of our future programs. We're actually setting up the uh, the schedule right now for her to be interviewed um, by uh, Dr. Rosalie Lopez from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. But uh, uh, Nicolina is her name, and she's eight years old, and uh, she has. Uh, she has got 18 asteroid candidates right now um, that are being verified. So, uh, you know, and she was involved in a program very much like what I was describing. And um, so uh, you too can be part of it. You know, you just have to uh, you know, develop the skills to, uh, to find things, you know, and you can make discoveries all of your own. Well, Jerry, thank you so much, man. Thank you. For yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Tonight. And, um, uh, you know, this is kind of the uh, northern uh, North American part of this show. But, uh, uh, you know, again, it's an international effort, um, you know, that makes up the Global Star Party. Uh, next net, next one up is uh, Libby of Libby and the Stars. And so, Libby, uh, you've uh, you've been traveling, I know, and um, so it's good to have you back and uh you know thanks for coming on to the uh, 69th global star party yeah we are i'm back so <laughs> um last night i got back really late and then this night i'm staying up for a star party so <clears throat> been the really fun mornings so i'm just waking up <laughs> and i'm like oh yeah. but it's really fun um i did want to add um i did a poem today and i have some stuff i'd like to share and um, I know I said I'd be doing the club that week, then I was traveling and um, it just ended up to where I was going to do it. So I'm now working on the poster and I plan to do it this week since I'm now going to be able to do that. And I think I'm going to do it once a month. Um, since it is close to Halloween, I didn't want to share. I got my cat a Halloween costume. You probably can't see it. Oh, there you I go. I got her a rocket. And <laughs> That's adorable. You put your cat inside of it. I've I've done it before. I've taken pictures when she was first like really like tolerant with the costume, and then now that it's kind of she kind of figured out what I'm doing, and hmm. she doesn't allow me to. So my plan was I was gonna get her into this for the star party. Her like head goes right here, and <laughs> she was she was. She just figured out my trick, so she she said no. But um, here's the costume anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I put her in it for like, um, when I used to do virtual school, I used to put her in it and my classmates would be like, oh my gosh, she's so cute. She's learned the tricks now. She's, she's, she's that's learned that's my that's tricks. That's <laughs> smart. Yep, that's right. Mm -hmm. Well, great. So I did a poem and um, I kind of like to share this one story, which is kind of funny because I know last year my science teacher, she watched the first global star party I did. And that wasn't real. The first global star party I did remember I was the first one where I was kind of interviewed and about, you know, what I like to do and stuff like that. That went amazing. And then the second one, which was the one that she watched was kind of embarrassing because I had a lot of stage fright, but now I've gotten pretty good at it. So um, it was really funny. My teacher last year, she loved like all the space stuff. And that's when I was first getting started. 
and now it's kind of turned into like a bigger thing to where I'm doing like review videos and stuff like that. Um, I started back this year doing physical school in person, as I should say. And so um, I go into science class and I didn't tell the teacher to like two weeks in because she was kind of just zipping us through everything. But I, didn't, I told the science teacher, I said, you know, how I do review telescope videos and stuff. And she was like, oh, wow. She was like, she's expecting me to get like two views. And so um, I told her, I said, you know, I actually like go and talk to like astronomers and stuff. She's like, oh, my gosh. And I was like, yep. I was like, I'd love to present to the class anytime. She's like, sadly, we're not learning anything about space this year. That was we mm. learned about the Mars rover last year, and that was just, you know, like one day thing where she sent us like a Google form. It was like, answer three questions. Name all the planets. Mm. Name the sun. I'm like, really? Name the what? sun? Yeah. <laughs> what is the sun? A star. Oh, OK. It was like that. A lot of kids thing. don't know that. You know, a lot of adults don't know that. Uh huh. So. Right. They just and think so, it's a light up there or something, you know, so. Yeah. But um, I remember last year I used to do art and I never really found found this till now. I was trying to find something else for the star party, but um, the virtual background doesn't really help. But I drew a rocket. Oh, this thing nice. is like huge. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> and um, I drew it and I, I, I came across it and I was like, oh, my gosh, how better how much would like who would this be if I just shared this because this is when I was first starting out into astronomy and I wasn't even prop I bet this was before I started the star party so it was kind of like it was kind of like oh my gosh this is before I started the star party I've been doing this for over a year now and so um it's been really fun so I, I was like oh my gosh this is so nostalgic because I only did a poem today. So I decided that I would kind of share some more stuff with you guys since I haven't been on in a while and I know I'm doing it once a month. But I did want everybody to know um, that now the kids, the kids uh, meeting will be this Friday. Last Friday, it completely slipped my mind and I was like, oh my gosh. And then by the next Friday, I had to pack and then I was just gone for a while and then now I'm back and I've been working on the poster and I plan to do it for an hour to two hours. If you want to stay the second hour, you can. Um, I've been downloading NASA videos to show and I know when I first started astronomy, every day of the summer, I would download the little NASA crafts online and I'd print it out and I'd do it. And, you know, it wasn't anything, you know, I would be doing the high school crafts, which were still really easy for me. It was like make a origami star shade, but I thought um, that it would be amazing thing to do for the kids. And I was thinking, you know, literacy is an amazing thing to share throughout astronomy. And there's many different topic topics. Um, one of my friends, he was talking to me about this. We were talking about, you know, math and literally every subject of like ever relates to astronomy in one way computer skills literacy math um everything literally can relate to astronomy and so um i personally am a person who loves going to literacy class and stuff like that and i remember last time i did a poem i always talked about how in second grade whenever we were learning narratives I would just make multiple, like I had a so-called library and I would just take pieces of paper and I make little books and I give it to my friends. And because it was something that I could write about topics that I liked. And so when I really came around to the space idea, I made like millions. And so that was about the time that I started learning poetry and David Levy has really inspired me. Um, he gave me both of his books um, and he mailed it to me. And since then, every single time that a friend comes over, I'm like, look, David Levy gave this to me. And they're like, who's David Levy? I'm like, you don't know who David Levy is. 
Right. And so um, I know I'm on the star party a lot later now because um, I only do this once a month now. But um, I, rem I remember um, he signed the book too. And every single time I'm like, I always look at that book. And he even gave me a book on how to um, teach to like friends and family. Well, the book's to teaching kids, but I'm a kid. So it doesn't really make that much, you know, sense. It's like teaching another kid. So um, I've been reading that book a lot too. And I've been um, thinking about how different subjects can relate to astronomy. But my favorite subject other than astronomy would be literacy. And I like to mix that in because David Levy, his books are truly amazing. Just talking about the stars and different stuff like that. Because honestly, every time I go to the class, the teachers are like, you need to pay attention to other subjects too. Because if you don't pay attention to that, then you won't get this in astronomy. I'm like, I see your tricks. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and read my poem. Um, I did a little bit of Halloween themed because it's Halloween time. It's not Halloween themed really, but um, I was just talking about the Halloween moon. Even though we only have a full moon on Halloween every 19 years, I did want to kind of set, you know, the kind of uh, like kind of aesthetic of being in Halloween and stuff like that. Um, the moon shines bright on the Halloween night. There is not a cloud in sight. All the dots of stars in the night it has always been a stunning sight. In front of my eyes is my universe, and again the night arises. For I am stranded on earth, the universe expands beyond the world. The galaxies twirl and the stars dance, for I just took a glance. Wow. So That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Libby, thank you so much. Thank you. Libby, um, you need to send that to David. Literacy. Uh, send it to David. Send yeah. To David Lee. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I take a lot of inspiration from his books, and I know a lot of people who come on the Star Party. And um, I know Deep D, too. She's she's really good um, with writing poems. I know she did a couple times before. And all just coming here once a month, and even I come here sometimes even more, on the anniversaries that we celebrate like every 10 star parties or so it's just like so much inspiration because over here somebody's like oh my gosh I'm on another side of the world and it's cloudy and on another side of the world it's beautiful and you can see the nebula because sometimes at my house when it gets cloudy I'm like well dang it I'm like at least I get to go to the star party tonight and I can just see from somebody else's telescope so I'm like this is amazing because another thing too is I hope to my kids club um, when I start doing this to show that soon I'm going to be opening it all over the world. Um, I'm not quite the tech genius. I mean, I know how to like get on the star parties, do stuff like that, but my brother is, so he's going to help me with that. And I know um, my family helped me with that and I'll be able to get that set up because Deep Tea has inspired me too. Because she, her stuff is um, in her high school. And I'm like, I love to connect to high schools all over the world like that, or even all different elementary schools, even. You know, that's the thing that I liked about researching. When I was like in fourth grade, that's when I was really reading all the books in class. They're like, they teach you one thing. And in your mind, just, and then they're like, okay, forget that two years later. Now look at this. And so with researching by myself, I kind of get to look into what I want to look into. And so um, what I was really interested in is uh, supernovas and black holes. What is dark matter? Like, we don't know. That's the thing that interests me. It's kind of like, well, what is dark matter? I don't know there is dark matter is just space there's just nothing in space what is it's gravity is and so um a lot of stuff like that interests me and I hope to share that with the club now that I'm back and I get to actually start doing this since this last month has been like a rush and so um especially now that school has started too I was going to do it through the schools but that put a lot of red tape through 
you know, trying to travel, it's like, you don't want to have a teacher like every single month, like with a Sean mean, I couldn't really find a teacher to do this. Um, my teacher from last year, um, I know I just started uh, doing mountain biking and stuff like that. I was like, hey, join the team and we can even do a Shawnee too after like practice. And she was like, eh. And I was like, you don't want to? <laughs> but um, I hope this week, 7 p.m. Um, for the first hour, if you want to come for the first hour, um, second hour is optional. The second hour will just be kind of hanging out and, you know, doing crafts and activities. Mm. Um, I really wanted to do this because, again, I said I wanted to open this to kids all over the world, not just in my little hometown, because, you know, I'll probably have like kids showing up with um, being like, okay, so what are all the planets again? And then I'll have kids like into black holes and supernovas. And so I did want to open this to like all different ages, all different skill levels. And, you know, really the kids to help each other out into different things. Cause um, I know I never really had an astronomy club and doing sidewalk astronomy is something I really like to do too. And Deep D was just talking about how she completely just changed somebody's life. Cause I remember when I first saw sidewalk astronomy, I did it. It was Scott. And I, um, he told me to go make a birthday card for um, the Apollo astronaut. I forgot. Um, Buzz Aldrin. Yeah, Buzz Aldrin. And so I went home and I was so stressed out because I couldn't draw an astronaut. And so I was like, how do you make an astronaut on a birthday card? And I drew it and I got and I just got so sidetracked. I forgot to give it. And now that's one of my biggest regrets in life. Mm. I'm like, no. If only if I could give him, give him Buzz Aldrin the birthday card, that would have been. You still can. You still yeah. can, Libby. <laughs> I'm going to figure can. out how to draw an astronaut. Okay. But that changed my life forever. And now I'm doing astronomy. I've got like part of my garage, the sidecar garage. Um, it's just all dedicated to my astronomy stuff. And um my parents are like, hey, like, we need to put this in the sidecar garage. If there's enough room. <laughs> and I told my mom, I said, I definitely like to take donations too, and maybe even work on making the sidecar garage into a observatory, even an outside observatory, even just getting a concrete block in the backyard and just making it that when my tent is a observatory. But um, when you're ready, Libby. Um... Uh, you know, you can come here to our studio. We can shoot a little video that you can promote your um, your program, and uh, and then uh, I would be more than happy to spread that around. I'll put it in uh, at the end of our uh, live programs and stuff to remind people to come to your events. So I think that's very cool. Yeah, Thank and I'm you. sure your brother can figure out how to do broadcasting, but. Uh, if there's any questions he has, he can get in touch with me too. So I'm yeah, happy to. He, he is. He runs all my social media accounts. Okay. Like I, I make the posts on like my Facebook pages and stuff, but he runs it. Like I am not kidding. Thank you to him though. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you very much, Libby. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Um, I know my mom will probably get in touch with you or something if we need anything for the thing. Yep. Which Sure, you Anything. know. Yep. I'm just want to see where I'm at when everybody comes together because I'm like, I am that person that likes to be the leader. I'm like, if somebody, I don't want everybody to come in, and then like, I don't want it to be like a million people, and then I know at the same time too that it'll be like maybe two to five kids at the first meeting. And then like over time, we'll have more kids. That's just how it goes. That's so exactly. I want to see the, where the first meeting takes me. And then I'll see if I want to uh, go out in nature one day or um, I definitely think that um, 
I think that I've never been camping before, but I do think that it'd be fun one time to go camping or once a month, not like once a year, maybe once a month will be a lot um, of camping, but once a year out of the, um, out of all the meetings to do camping and stuff like that, because personally I've never been, um, it's really sad. It's kind of funny to think I just sit out into my driveway and some, I have a little area out in the rural country. That's just a gravel little dirt road. And I picked it because nobody ever goes on it. And that's where I usually stargaze. Hmm. Excellent. So excellent. Let's see how the first meeting goes. And then I hope to open it to more. Oh snap. My video just randomly turned off. Um, <laughs> gotta love technology. Uh, I'm gonna see where I'm at, and then I definitely want to open it up to more kids around the world and just kids everywhere. And the video is turning off again. Mm. Well, I gotta right. get that checked out. <laughs> <laughs> Libby, thank you so much. Thanks for coming thank on you. to the program. The and, next uh, meeting, I will get that cat in the rocket costume. Good, okay. <laughs> Well, don't try too hard. If the cat doesn't want to yeah. go in, you you don't want to force these things. Uh, cats have ways of letting you know uh, progressively worse and worse. Now, I don't know if your cat still has claws, but if they do, then you'll you'll love how they feel when they're five inches deep inside your arm. I think so if your careful. brother is. I think if your brother's this dedicated to helping you, you should just make a larger version and put your brother in it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. The, at one time I got him um, to dress up. Um, I got him to dress up in a Halloween costume once that we were both matching in. He kept it on for like five minutes and then took it off. So um, there's that. But um, my cat, she has her ways of letting me know yeah, nice try. I know your antics. <laughs> yeah, very much. I could well, take a photo of her and Photoshop it. <laughs> yeah, it's not the same as when you really do get it working, though. <laughs> yeah, it's there's a slight. It'll, it'll be it'll be still a cute picture. So if you can get that yeah. working, she'll be the master of the club. Right, that works. She says right. hi. She doesn't want to say hi. <laughs> well, anyway, thank you guys for having me on. Um, the next meeting, uh, I may even try to get on another night um, or at the four o'clock party um, sometime soon with the whole club once I kind of get things organized. Because I know by experience, the first time you do something, it's a hot mess. You know, I'm like, wait, what's your name again? <laughs> and then it's just running around everywhere. But um, the first meeting, I kind of want to see where I'm at. And then I definitely want to progress from that and do more stuff since I've been holding it off for a while now that this month was just flying by. Yep. Well, you're a busy girl. So, and, uh, but you got lots of passion, lots of inspiration and lots of ability. So I know you'll go far. Libby, right. thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to, uh, I want to uh, bring this back over to Kareem uh, uh, Jafar. Uh, he is um, with the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, Montreal Center. Uh, and uh, uh, you're going to uh, give a, a nice introduction to uh, Jenna Hines. So. Well, if it has to be a nice introduction, I'll do it. But uh, <laughs> <We'll> do it. <laughs> it's a treat for you guys tonight. Instead of hearing from me, you get to hear from one of the people I look up to in our center, well, in our in our society. So uh, as I've mentioned in the past, and we've talked about some of the programming that we do, I've talked to you a little bit about the Insider's Guide to the Galaxy and the remote telescope that we have access to. All of that is made possible by the work of Jenna Hines. She's our outreach coordinator for the national office. And one of the things that I've been trying to kind of bring across over the last few months when I've come to the Global Star Parties is that the RASC really has a place for everyone, no matter your background, no matter how 
aware you are of the science behind astronomy and astrophysics, how adept you are at using different types of equipment. When you enter into the RASC, you enter in and you find your passion, you find your niche, and you can move from there. And it's kind of neat that in our head office, we have our outreach coordinator who started in underwater sciences and marine biology. And she started out with her studies looking down into the water. And then at some point, I guess she looked up and realized that, hey, that's more fun. So I don't know if that's true. And she could tell us later if that's still how she feels. But she joined the RASC and she has been a ball of energy and fire. And it's just incredible. So for example, she has been working all day. She did her own stuff. Now she's been with us for the last few hours. And if the weather's good tomorrow night at 10 o'clock, she'll be back online with Zoom with my students to run the remote telescope to try to look at ex an exoplanet transit. And this is kind of what she does. And she's, you know, she's been active in bringing real outreach and making it available to students across Canada. So I'm very happy to introduce you to Jenna Hines. And Jenna's going to talk to you a little bit about some of the stuff that she's been doing, but specifically this awesome project that my students have been in on from the ground floor. Jenna? Thank you for setting the bar as high as possible. <laughs> um, thanks so much for having me. It's Scott, I really appreciate the, uh, Scott and Cream and everybody else. I really appreciate the invite. Uh, well, some of our I, audience may remember you from last December from the Great Conjunction. That's true. That was the last time that I was on. I had a great time. Um, I have somehow managed to pack my entire life uh, full of things, not just astronomy. I don't know how you all do all of what you do. It's not, it's 10 o'clock and I'm ready to go to bed. Uh, I'm the world's worst astronomer, but here we are anyway. So uh, I do, yeah, I'm, I'm running the, the robotic telescope project at uh, the RASC right now. And for the past couple of years or so, we've been um, trying to get high school students engaged in astronomy in a meaningful way. I'm speaking as someone who at one point was in high school um, and learned zero astronomy. Um, and in fact, actually didn't really understand the scientific process at all. Um, I feel like reaching high school students is really, really, really important. Um, for me, I don't know about I don't know about those of you who were who experienced this in high school, but the scientific process, while it is taught, isn't really well communicated. It's sort of like I mean, you learn through a textbook, and you're looking at um, at experiments where you know exactly what's going to happen, um, and if if you don't get the answer, it's your fault usually. It's usually something that you've done in the process that doesn't line up with what everyone else before you has done. So when I first came on board in, in at RASC, my goal was to just kind of break that cycle and really introduce high school students into how science actually works before they get to university. Um, and Kareem, who says he looks up to me, was the person, first person to test run this course. So... <laughs> I look up to Kareem a, a heck of a lot. So uh, Kareem students were the first ones yeah. um, to run through this program. And that was fall of 2019, I think, right? It was, yeah. And then, and then, and then 2020. Yeah, we kept going. <laughs> it's been fantastic. Yeah, yeah, we did. It actually ended up working out extremely well because the entire program was uh, is run virtually. Um, and so we adapted well to the pandemic. So the first goal in the program was to get students understanding how exoplanet transits work. Um, and get them imaging exoplanet transits. And so that kind of required some really uh, supportive staff in each school, um, which is why Cream led the charge, um, because obviously Cream is this champion of astronomy and, and he really inspires his students and can dive into big topics like this. Um, the, and that went well, still is going well. It's been fantastic. Uh, we had our first, we had a club run the program last year uh, and it was all girls and non-binary students, and it made me so, so, so happy. I had never thought I would see a, ratio, a gender ratio like that um, in this program, and so I was just thrilled um, and so excited to see it. But we've expanded the program so that even teachers who are not familiar um, with astronomy at all can now run a slightly more simple version of the program. Um, and so we're, we're reserving this like really intense exoplanet program where they choose the exoplanet that they want to image. We image it all together. They join in with us and see how that all works. Um, and then we send them the raw data and the calibration frames and they do take every step themselves after that, um, which is obviously a little, a little intense. 
Um, I was only learning how to do it two weeks before the students. So, and it went well. <laughs> for those um, older students who've seen a little bit of math and a little bit of astronomy and a little bit of digital competency, it really is great for them to work through those steps themselves and see the importance of taking out noise and understanding exactly how astrophotography is actually done and how photometry is actually done. And it takes like it takes a fair bit of experience in, in life and, and diving into academics to understand like turning a picture into scientific data. Um, and so that kind of breach it, we, we kind of jumped that hurdle in the program. Um, so what we've done now is we've collapsed the program down so that teachers are given, if they wish, they're given all the PowerPoint presentations they need, scripts to go through them. Because we're Canadian, all of the Canadian content that comes with it, um, and all the different things that Canadian researchers have contributed to the field, um, and and sets of data from our scope that have already been calibrated. All they have to do is just like measure the brightness of the pixels and look at the transit. So, um, with that, we've seen a huge increase in the number of students um, participating, and it's been awesome. Um, the program's free. And the next steps are things like developing a math specific side um, and developing, we are actually working on how to get the advanced program um, following up on the, the test uh, follow-up program, a follow-up yeah. observing program as well. So that's, Kareem students are gonna do that this year. We're gonna see how that goes. Fingers crossed. If we actually get some clear nights in California. Mm -hmm. Knock so on far wood. it's not been great. <laughs> We had smoke for two months and then now it's raining. So um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. We have a couple other students that are, are really excited about it. And my favorite part about all of this is that we have finally um, set up an, another separate team, um, which is our science team and is gonna be running long-term projects. And we finally have a place to send students who've gone through this program and loved it. Um, because the students that come out the other side go, this is great, what do I do next? And we have to kind of sit there and go like, uh, university? Um, and so now we can, we can direct them into our science program uh, where they can have some more say over the projects, the long-term projects that we're running and can work with the data themselves um, and sort of get more involved in that process at whichever point in their lives they wish to. Um, and it, I hope that that inspires people and young people the way that Libby and, uh, and have been, yeah. have been inspired because it's just unbelievable listening to them talk. Like I'm sitting here just going like, I, geez, I hope the stuff I'm doing inspires kids the way these kids are inspired because they're just, they're unbelievable. Well, this is exactly it. Like when you developed the advanced program, the, one of the first things Jenna did is she put together a series of YouTube tutorials on how to walk through all the steps of searching for an exoplanet transit, knowing that it will be observable, and then how to actually process the data. And my students still go back to those tutorials constantly to try to understand the steps that they're doing. Because these are not steps that come naturally to most people. But Jenna was learning literally a couple of weeks before the, the first group of students went through it. So she was learning it, understanding it, and then finding a way to communicate it in a method that these students actually could absorb it. Because just writing out a PDF, no, they, they don't get that. <laughs> I, I still am surprised because those videos are some of our best, like our most watched videos on our YouTube channel. And we've spent the past two years making content. Yep. And still those are doing so well. So I'm glad that someone's watching them. Well, this past summer, you also opened up the program to make it accessible for other RASC members who aren't students, who aren't doing it as part of a class to be able to take part in this. We did. Thank you for reminding me about that. That was, um, we started running uh, science courses for adults as well. Um, we've been trying to come up with a way that like we can do citizen science, but also have tech, like have the, the, the citizens doing more hands-on stuff. Um, so not, Zooniverse is awesome. There's a lot of really awesome programs out there that you can um, have citizen, citizen science participate in, but you need to have someone prepping that data first or a computer prepping that data. Something needs to happen before a lot of those citizen science, scientists get involved. Um, and so we're running these series of programs focusing on exoplanet transits, variable stars, and supernovae, finding supernovae in galaxies to get our members or anyone who's interested 
up to speed on how to do this stuff with the data that comes from our telescope and use that to kind of propel our research forward. That's fantastic. And one of the other things I have to mention, uh, because Adrian is here and he's coming on next, is early on, Jenna actually made it available to me and said, look, if the transit's going from 1 a.m. to 3 a.m., if you have students who want to do astrophotography, give me targets and we'll program them into our camera. And so can you tell them a little bit about the equipment that we use at the uh, Edgescope? Yeah, sure. I actually have a PowerPoint presentation in case I needed to use it. There's our equipment. Um, it's, it's a 16 inch Arcos FA.9. Um, I didn't know what any of these words meant before I started this program. <laughs> so I feel like the world's biggest imposter in this meeting. Uh, we had, I've learned a lot since then. Um, I know the scope is a, is a pretty good rig for what we do. Um, there's a little outline of the different, the sort of the different programs that we were looking at the advanced program versus the basic program, which is a little bit more, um, simple. The other, the other thing I forgot to mention too, I'll get to the astrophotography, but the other thing I forgot to mention is that um, we do have publications with RASC and that's been one of the most valuable thing to students is the ability to publish either like storytelling pieces in our magazine, which is more publicly accessible, Sky News, um, or scientific pieces in our academic journal. And that's where my students were able to publish their first set of data back in 2019. They were in the 2020 March, April edition of Sky News. And that led many of my other groups to then start submitting articles to Sky News. And even the current edition has a group of three students who did ISS biology research and they're published in Sky News. And so it really snowballs. Once you show the students what opportunities are there, they jump it. It's amazing. We actually have a new group who cited your students' articles as the reason they participate in the program. So there you go. Good job. <laughs> I can't wait to tell them. Oh, it was yeah, it was so it was so great to hear. So we have we have all this data as well that's astro for sale, astrophotography data. Um, but we have actually we even have this new partnership. I don't know if I told you about this yet, Kareem. Um, a member from our Toronto center runs a, a club with his son at his French school. Um, and they're Ooh. extremely interested in astrophotography. And astrophotography is, you know, there's some science to it when you talk about taking There's a data lot of science and, in there. Yeah. And visualizing, visualizing data in a way that makes sense to us as humans. How we do that with radio astronomy can kind of apply to the way we do it with narrowband imaging. Um, and so he's actually, he's <laughs> gotten some amazing funding um, and is buying access to our data for all of his students to use, which I'm, I'm thrilled about. Um, but even when, uh, even when we run the program just with Kareem and with the students, we allow a little bit of time for astrophotography too. There's some, there's some good stuff in there. It's fun to get people trying this out for the first time um, and seeing what they can do with it. That's the next stuff that we're doing is that math program. We are gonna make, formalize that astrophotography stuff to Kareem um, and, and move students through the science team. Briefly, because I know that um, it's running late, and at least I usually am in bed by now. Um, I wanted to throw back to uh, to um, the last time that I was here. We actually ran the scope live, looking at Ju Jupiter yeah. and Saturn. Mm -hmm. um, and there's the result of the uh, the camera that's on the back of the scope, where we imaged um, Jupiter and Saturn slowly, uh, or Jupiter slowly passing Saturn wow. until the conjunction. Cool. So, yeah, it was really fun. It was a neat. It was a, like a somewhat unique perspective on it um our scope isn't really well set up for planets so it was nice to have an alternative i've enjoyed getting to show that to my students the last three terms now and it just it it blows their mind because they learn about the orbits they learn about the periods but realizing that you can actually watch them passing on the ecliptic every 20 years their jaws just drop it's yeah. insane. It's insane. And it's so, I just, I'm so glad that you showed it to them because it, yeah, it blows my mind every time I watch it too. It's when you're just stepping outside and I, so I love, I'm going to stop sharing because um, <laughs> I love star parties. I do. I I literally, and I've been taking my scope out after going to the climbing gym with all of my random climbing friends to be like, look, here's Jupiter and Saturn. And they're like loving it they're flipping yeah. out and being like no way that's actually Saturn and like that totally fills my heart up but you don't you don't always get the like like you get the you get the spark but you don't really get a lot of the like extra stuff that comes with the, the next step of mind-blowing and that's where this stuff comes in it's like you can actually see like how the planets move compared to background stars if you pay attention 
Um, yeah. And you can show things like this to really take that next step of like, like that's in, like that makes you feel so small to, to see first yeah. see the rings of Saturn and then to see how they interact with each other um, over a longer period of time. It's really fun to take that extra next step. And and I tell you, um, as someone who has found an exoplanet transit in data for the first time ever and spent the rest of the day being like, look, look at my data. Do you see it? Do you see this? Do you see? I found it. I did it. Did you yes. see that? And like, none of my, none of my coworkers care, but here I am walking around being like, look at the plot. Look at the plot. Do you see the plot? Um, watching, watching high school students do the same thing yeah. and like get that plot is almost, I would say it's comparable with seeing Saturn for the first time. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, because they, they see these things in the textbook or they see these things in class and they're told that this is what happens. But actually taking those images and finding the luminosity and graphing it and seeing the dip and seeing that the dip matches when you thought the ingress and the egress were going to happen, that we do know the movement of a planet around a distant star that well that we can predict it, go and see it at night. It's just it's inspiring for them. Right. Jeff Wise is commenting. He says every astronomy club needs someone like Jenna. So <laughs> I agree. I agree. I agree. Jenna, Jenna's a superstar. Yep, yeah, that's awesome. That's uh, awesome. I do have to tone it down sometimes. I tried to tone it down tonight, it didn't work. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> the one thing I've realized with the GSP is the people that tell us to tone it down don't understand the drive. And it's the drive that makes us continue to ramp it up. Right. That's right. But you guys oh, are good. amazing, both of you. So Excellent. thank you so much. Thanks for coming on, Jenna. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, if Explore Scientific can do anything to help out the RASC Montreal Center, let me know. Okay. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, thank you Scott. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Good night. Okay, so up next uh, is Adrian Bradley. Adrian has been uh, popping in and out uh, for our uh, program. Uh, um, Adrian, are you there? You're right there. Yep, I'm here. There you are. Yep. Okay. All right. So what, what did and... you think about the uh, Global Star Party this time? This, uh, the Global Star Party was awesome. We, um, we saw a lot of great astrophotography to start with the first part. We saw the Southern Hemisphere and all the fun and the outreach in the second part that, you know, a lot different from the outreach that I uh, learned um, in Michigan. Um, here in Michigan, we're still we're still mostly visual astronomers in a couple of uh, clubs. Now I'm in the RASC, so I have to learn the ropes. I've learned that I must become a Blue Jay fan now. So this uh, Yankee shirt here. It's, no, listen, if you're not going you know, to go Tigers and you're not going to go Brewers, then you got to go Jays. Well, I like all, <laughs> all those teams, but it's been go Yanks for a while. And, um, you know, at one point, kind of like visual astronomy and Yankees. At one point, they were what baseball was about, what astronomy was about, were the big telescopes, the Dobsonians, and about seeing the photons with your eyes. In this era now, the type of teams that a certain rival team from Boston, um, all the better teams are like that now. There's different, there's analytics. You could compare that to astrophotography is becoming more and more of the norm and not the um the visual side is shrinking a little bit and we don't want to lose either side but in at the Oki Techstar party for instance there was a lot of red a lot of uh screens and you know a lot of ambient light and the visual astronomers um did struggle with that because you know, when you're at a dark site, you want your eyes to get completely acclimated to the dark. So, right. um, so there's a there's a bit of there's a bit of changing of the guard when it comes to enjoying the hobby. And as out for outreach, we have to embrace that. And you know, the Rask has embraced it. It's been tougher for some of the older astronomers, the visual astronomers, to embrace it. But um, you know, embrace it we must because that's what's keeping people interested in night sky is taking a picture of it, bringing it down for themselves. Um, I've fallen into wide angle 
um, Nightscape photography. And so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and your work in that has been breathtaking. I, I can't believe uh, actually with what Libby was saying about the GSPs and being able to share the night sky when you have a dark cloudy one, we had nothing but clouds and rain for the last week or so. And you posting stuff from your Oki uh, outing has yeah. been me letting me survive the night. It's been incredible. And that's right. exactly all of the pictures. So all the pictures you see here are a collection where I put the Okitex pictures in and I have pictures that I took in the past at the various Bortle zones. Um, and so I'm just going to start with the, I'm going to start with what Kareem's talking about. This is what we usually deal with in, um, you know, Northern latitudes. Are you standing outside my house? That's what I see. That's exactly there. <laughs> you have a nice lake and, and now this is being illuminated by the moon. You go to a dark site and the clouds may follow you, but that's not the moon that's illuminating you. That is the Milky Way. Wow, that just it looks is like a that quilt work. Right. That's really cool. You yeah, know, those you should give to Libby for her Halloween costume. Yeah, there you go. Make the uh, hiding the Milky Way. So that there's a difference. Um, let's see the zodiacal light. If you go to a dark enough place, this is um, Port Crescent State Park. It's a Bortle three slash Bortle four zone. You might catch the zodiacal light after sunset and a, a little glimpse of the Milky Way. There's Orion. Um, it's not bad. It's a it's a very beautiful, serene sight. And I do believe this is, no, this is not the double cluster here. I don't know what I'm saying. Um, so it's just unbelievable. Yeah, it's I, yeah it looks I, wonderful. I, I, until I so you go to a dark site. To get that to the other light. And then you see this. And you take it with your HA modded oh. camera and you blow that other, the other picture is beautiful in its own right, but Look how much more there is to see. Oh, and there's I, I love, Orion, but now he's all dressed up. I told you that I love the zodiac light. <laughs> I <laughs> that's blown my yes. See, seeing that with your own eyes, you know, is it's if beautiful. you are if you are seeing uh, uh, try uh, seeing it uh, with the moon rising through oh, it. Oh, exactly. Uh, oh, well, and that's mostly Mars dust. So right now, when we can't see Mars, you were seeing it. Yes. And uh, that was, and it's seeing, seeing it with your eyes, though, there, and there's nothing like seeing the moon rise over the horizon. I was panicking going, I got to try and get a picture of it. I made it a composite. So I took the moon picture separate, laid it on top of a picture where I was able to get the zodiacal light and then did some, uh, tried the Photoshop magic of content aware fill in it. It did an okay job. I slapped that in, and that's close to what I saw naked eye. It it really was an impressive sight. That was the other side of that image where, you know, shooting for Orion, shooting for the other side of the Milky Way. I would try and do that from time to time. And somewhere in here, I think I have, I wouldn't get the color mapping right. So... It, you get a or there's Orion, there's the Milky Way. It's all purple. It, it makes for you know purple and gold. It makes for nice colors. So you saw that picture at a dark site. You can get in a lot more than that. There's that. There's what I was trying to do, but um, turned out a lot better. You got air glow here. You don't have light pollution. You have air glow, and um, it's a huge difference in um, because everything up here is bright and everything pops out, all the nebulosity. Now, if you don't have an HA modified camera, that region is still beautiful. Here's the winter circle with a non modified camera, and it's still a beautiful sight here. You got a little bit of air glow and clouds. That's just incredible. Can I use that one in my class? 
Yes. That's just Please fantastic. Do. Please Sorry, do. I put you on the spot. I should have emailed you. <laughs> you can email. I will, send, I will send the emails. I did post that to Facebook. One of the coolest things that I was able to do was get the Milky Way as the moon was setting. This is uh, one of my favorite Bortal 4 spots. You can get a little bit of detail. That's nice. Now, let's see. Where did it go? Bortal 1 site. Astronomical Twilight hasn't ended yeah. yet. And look how much detail you've got. And yeah. for those of you that have not been to the Okitech Star Party, Scott was just about to tell you, this is what it looks like. Yeah. There's a little bit more detail here, but honestly, this is what you see you, with your own eyes. That right. Milky Way pops out. Go That's ahead. incredible. Go ahead, Scott. I think That's you, amazing. You, Arms, right? Yeah, you're ready yeah. to jump in. Now, let's... Uh, so we get a little bit deeper. Um, here's I'm playing around at a Bortle 3 site with a modded camera, and I got funky with all the colors and tried to do something extra special. Um, it turned out looking like the Denver Broncos color scheme on the Milky Way. So that's not the craziest thing I've done. At a Bortle 1 site, I put an iPhone on a tracker, and I got this iPhone 12 Pro and got as much as I can get. I got round stars for 30 seconds. And there's your Milky Way. So I wouldn't recommend trying an iPhone 12 Pro. Still go get your DSLR because when you get your DSLR and you take the same picture, it's going to look more like this. So you've got, and this is with a I think a 50 millimeter lens or 35, I forget what I used. I think it was 50 millimeter. This is essentially, we see in around 50 millimeters or 45 millimeters. This is essentially what you look up and see. You, know, you don't quite get it to the granularity that you see in a picture. And yes, there's some aberration here, but you do see this and you see some of the color here rising up over these mountains at a border one site let's see so how about the cygnus region that was my attempt at the cygnus region it's not bad it, this was one of the ones where i didn't do too much work at oki texas i could have i've actually got a little bit better work on the cygnus region at a border three zone i we put this picture together uh sebastian if you're watching this is as good as it gets as far as me doing foreground and actually trying to interact with my environment with a night pick. Um, the coat hanger is right here. That's a very beautiful. Yeah. That. Yes, this is Alcona. Very beautiful. Yep, Alcona Park. It's uh, This was my attempt at actually having a beautiful picture. Now notice the color of the clouds here. The color shines with the clouds with the, the city that's in the distance. Only at a border one site, it's black. And I've got a picture here. I think this is the one we'll use to prove it. There's the light. No light. So crossing the milk, the face of the Milky Way, it's black. And when it's middle, when it's dark of the night and clouds come over, stars just simply disappear because they, you know, you, you don't see the clouds like you do at the other Bortle zones. Were those, so, were those did, stars yeah. coming through the trees? I think those are stars coming through the trees. Let's look. Yeah, starlight look at that. is coming through the trees in this shot. And That's you see great. no light below the, the clouds. No Only lights they below are, the clouds. They are out. Well, yes. And um, so you want to do classic astrophotography. You want to shoot the Orion region. This is me, a poor attempt at a Bortle Foresight. I did my best. Yeah, but you got Barnard's Loop. I got uh, Barnard's Loop. I got Lambda Orionis, which I lovingly call the Afro of mm -hmm. Orion, the uh -huh. Rosette, <laughs> and no witch head here, but. Um, I tried, and there's some of the regions 
the belt and the sword region. And so that's, that's a modified camera, right? On a trucker? Yeah, it's a modified camera. Yep. So I took a modified camera and tried it at the dark site. Not sure I processed it very well. I still I have the raw data, so I'm going to use it to learn. And the haze was in the air, so things got blown out a little bit. You know, these things look like they're ready to go supernova. But it makes for a real interesting picture. Lambda Orinus is here. More detail on Barnard's loop. And there's the witch's head. And that's one single picture? That is a stacked picture. I want to say that that is about 40 frames stacked um, and then processed using some Photoshop tools and Lightroom Classic to try desperately. I wanted a dark sky, and there's some haze here, and then the milk, you know, the Milky Way that Orion sits next to. Um, I'm going to continue working on it because if I process it properly, there's there'd be a lot more detail here. I did painstakingly up the uh, exposure on the witch's head so that it would be visible here. So uh, there's Adrian. Do you have the the stack uh, image uh, if you want to share me with me? Uh, because yeah, I, I would I'll like send to. You, I'll yeah. send you the stacked image. Um, I was I was gonna say. Yeah, you guys can <laughs> you guys can take that data and see what you could do with it. That would uh, I'll send it to you after this. We like Adrian. Data. Yeah. It's so like me. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. On. <laughs> yes, I'm worried. Yeah. Bye bye. Yeah. So I try to hand at a panorama. This is our camp. Is nice. University Lowbrow Astronomers. And oh, nice, nice, really nice. Yep. So Ryan and friends are over here. Pleiades came out really, really well. Look at that. Uh, you can see the glow and everything. Yeah. You know, when I see these uh beautiful Milky Way shots, I can't wait till Adrian goes to the southern hemisphere. Uh, it's gonna make some mind blowing night sky shots wait to see it <laughs> maxi and i were just talking about that we'll knock yeah. you over it really we will. will be ready so let's talk about the core of the milky way my favorite part then over the years trying to get it i basically went from this which was a 49 second with a kit lens and a a uh old 30d dslr from about 20 years ago and was happy just to get some of this detail here. And fast forward to Okitex, and this is my Milky Way shot. Yeah. So more detail, still working to make some progress. Um, along the way, I took some shots like this at a Portal 5 zone. I was still able to get the Milky Way in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I was, um, I tried with a modified camera to, you know, I could get detail, but I couldn't quite get the color right. Um, then I said, I'll just go with the other camera and there's the light, the light pollution sort of blocks this area of the Milky Way. It's still a pretty picture. And I think it was an HDR attempt. Um, then you go to a dark sky park. Well, no, this isn't. This is over Lake Huron, and here's this section with Andromeda, and got wiped out. You know, light pollution, clouds. So I try in another location. Start to get the North American Nebula, and I, I blew this out terribly. So what do I do? And I go to a dark site. Hopefully, it looks a little better. Well, there's still some air glow, but there's Andromeda, there's M33, there's double cluster, there's the heart and the soul. And all of that visible. And as the sky rolls around, Andromeda rolls over here, double cluster, heart and the soul, some meteors, the Milky Way rolls as the sky continues on moving and a lot of stars so so now i would i want to shoot a deep milky way photo this is sort of the finale of this thing 
we're focusing on, on the Milky Way itself. So star, sorry, Sebastian, this was, I didn't worry about framing anything at this point, but the Milky Way. So at a Bortle 4 zone, this was as deep as I could get at the time. And I don't recall, I think I was using the, cam the camera when it was unmodded. And I got this. And I was pretty happy with that. Then I was unmodded and I went to a Bortle 2 zone and shot for a minute. I think those were long, minute long exposures. And I got this. My foreground is a wasteland. I, I come from an astronomy background. So will this win any awards? No, but is it fairly detailed in the Milky Way? You bet. Oh, uh, you, you lose a little bit of this over here because of the light from Mackinac. This is the UP in Michigan. It's a, it just makes a Bortle II sky hmm. and some cool features. There's this, this is a visible object. This kind of looks like an E here. I forget what nebula this is. It's a dark nebula that's visible. Um, there's Tarzed, there's Altair. This is a, a dark nebula that you can see at a Bortle One zone. You may be able to see it here. But when you're near Altair, you got the coat hanger. One of my favorite things to shoot at. Sagittarius of the Air Arrow is somewhere buried in here. I'm not seeing it, but um, you know, if the coat hanger's here, Sagittarius is nearby. And that leads into the Cygnus region. This line going into Rofuyuki. One single one minute photo at a Bortle 2 site. So that was a minute. This was bright. a series. This was a series of thirty-second photos at the Border One site. Wow! What goodies do we have here? There's a cat's yep. paw. Look at that. Yep. And this one. Someone tell me what this one is, because it that's, looks that's the the shrimp nebula. The squid, the shrimp no, nebula. The shrimp here we nebula. are. Yep. So we caught the shrimp and the cat's paw because at at uh, Oklahoma's. Um, Latitude, a little bit more of the Milky Way is visible on its southern face. About here is where it stops for me at around 42 second latitude. So we missed this. We get the rest of this. There's your lagoon, your trifid. There's other nebulosity here that I really should learn about, but you can see it. A lot of detail. This was what? again That's 30. Omega, I Omega, believe this was a 30 M16. second. Yep. Right here. Mm -hmm. And this is a composite of four images. So I didn't quite go as high to go find my coat hanger, but it's up there somewhere. And this is a closer view of that region. I think I tried to do a little more. I think this is the Instagram version of it. So it's contrasted beyond recognition but um it still brings out a lot of the dark lanes and this now this was with a modified camera so i did cheat a little bit at the border one site um but i still like the results that i got there um so i think i've gone through just about all these images um smoke didn't see any smoke at uh Oki Tech, thank goodness. This is what it does to an image. Um, same place, Bortle, same part, Bortle 4. You see this much Milky Way. There's a meteor that came streaking through the photo. And oh, nice. Yeah. And then when smoke hits that same area, you can barely see it, but you can image it. And it just how bright the Milky Way really is, even if you're in a Bortle, this is Bortle 9. That's my Milky Way at Bortle 9. It it may not look like much, but I dare you all to try this sometime. Basically, see if you can image the Milky Way off of your balcony with some of the brightest lights going on. Bortle 9 site and see what you can get. It, it, it's a great work because it, uh, watch the Milky Way that this is completely invisible in a city skies in Bordel Nine. It's it's a great work. Um, I have from here 
only one picture that took uh, Agustin uh, was maybe one of, of, of his fr first pictures. And I can believe it when he showed me the final picture. Uh, I think that here is 9.3, but your, your picture is amazing because it's impossible yeah. to have and it yeah, appears the Miguel Way exists. This is incredible. Yeah, and you can just get it. This was, uh, I forgot to shoot this one. This was supposed to be a comparison photo, uh, me trying to get a bunch of detail out of a bordel. I think this was like a minute and a half, and this was 30 seconds. And the, the time of the short time of integration is something that you get and still get a lot of detail at a dark site. Um, so one way to end this is uh, the, the Northern Hemisphere is still a beautiful place to do imaging. You just have to be more creative. There are some spots where you can barely see the Milky Way, but now your foreground matters because your night sky can't carry you as much. So you have to, if you frame it just right, you end up with a beautiful image anyway. And it continues to drive you to, you want to share the, you want to show the night sky. And part of the reason I shoot and I do shoot for detail is because I want to show the night sky and I want to share the night sky. I want to, um, this was when I was, signing images and it's i could fix the angle on it but you want to share the night sky and you want to do what you can if you're at a locale where your light pollution hinders you you have all these tips and tricks to try and make it so that you're still sharing the beauty of the night sky and here we all we got kind of close to where the cat's paw is as the Milky Way rises here. Um, so you do your best, you process with what you know, and you say, this is, you know, this is the Milky Way. Yes, it is up there. Um, then you go to, then you go to a dark site and with eight, and it only takes you eight seconds to get this photo. This is an eight second shot aimed up over the mountain, ISO 8000, uh, F1.4 with a 50 millimeter lens, and there is a coat hanger suffering from aberration. But, um, the, the scenery was beautiful, so that's why I kept that photo. So, you shots that you take at your home locale prepare you for the type of shots that you might take elsewhere. Um, this Milky Way shot prepared me for one of these Milky Way shots when I was, yeah, this one. It prepared me for this one. And um, it, it, it's part of the reason that you keep shooting, to try and capture what you see as, you know, a beautiful night sky and you share it with others. and you find different ways to do that. If you want to put some symbolism in there with a cross, you can do that. Um, or, you know, if you simply want to transport somebody where you were and, you know, that's why, that's why the type of nightscape photography I like to do tends to center more around, you know, accuracy of images but you still, you still like them to be as beautiful as you can make them. And for the first time, Scott, I'm gonna, I'll end with, uh, I'll end with a shot of our own star. That's for you, Scott. There you go. Thank you. Man. I do. <laughs> yep. Yeah. On occasion, I'll take with a bird in photos. it. I love it. <laughs> There's birds. They're yeah. everywhere. Yeah. I got them. There's a sandhill crane. There you when go. When the skies are too cloudy take pictures of birds landing oh that's nice man there's a cormorant landing and somewhere around here oh, there's an osprey i think 
you're going to have to share some of those for our birding program. That yeah, we... I got to come on the birding program and yep. there's the osprey and a uh, grackle having words. And um, somewhere there was a, uh, a bald eagle. So, so if the night sky is cloudy, find something else to Hey, take it's all part of the of. universe. That's right. Yeah, they're all part of the universe. Mm -hmm. um, somewhere in there, I had a really cool. I had a picture of a uh, Caspian turn. Oh, these are part of the universe too, the Blue Angels, and um, great white egrets in flight. Oh, that's beautiful. And yep. butterflies and. Yankees striking out. That was for Kareem. Judge struck out on that play. That's what happened in Detroit. And um, those of you that love butterflies, we got you covered for that too. <laughs> and That's somewhere cool. around here, there's oh, there's a there's an eight point buck for those of you that like deer. Mm -hmm. That we took a picture of that. And I will have to find that um, here we'll end on this note. This is Scott saying, when are you going to be done? <laughs> so, <laughs> there you go. All right. Yeah, Thank you nice all for you. indulging Bye, me. <laughs> and um, that is my life in pictures. Yeah. Wonderful. So, That's great, man. Congratulations, Thank you. Man. I'm freaking so, out. <laughs> well, Alan, did you get a, did you get finally get a decent internet connection? Your, your no, audio. No, we right. can't. Yeah. No. It's not transmitting your voice. <laughs> we, we hoped it would. <laughs> yep. Alan says a cool pick of the blue angels in formation flying. Yeah. One of those photos were detailed. Um, Alan, you're, you're going to have to come yeah. back on to our program. You're going to have to come back on. Yeah, I would love it. So thank you, and, Cesar. Uh, yeah. yeah. Guys, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you know, it was a great uh, 69th Global Star Party. Of course, our next Global Star Party is going to be our 70th event. Oh, um, and uh, so we are. I'm very excited about it. Um, we have um, uh, that will be on the 26th of uh, of October, and uh, so you know we'll we will uh, uh, conspire to have a, a great theme uh, to go along with it, and uh, we will have a special uh, door prize. Uh, that we'll give away uh, during this event uh, for any winner in the world. So, um, so I'm excited about that as well. Um, Maxie, thank you for being a, an official co-host. And uh, Caesar, thank you for being on. Alan, thank you uh, for being part of it as well. Uh, Nico, Sebastian, you're back there listening. Uh, you know, thank you for being on our program. Uh, beautiful night sky work as well. Um, thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Agreed. Yeah, Steve, it's late where you are, dude. What time is it, Stephen? Uh, uh, hold on, just a minute. Uh, it's breakfast ten time. To four. Ten to four. Ten, ten to oh, four. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's so. Early. So just I'm gonna. You go. I am going to go ahead real quick. This is the picture I was looking for. Oh, oh look at that. Wow. Yeah, wow. the Caspian turn right before it hits the water. Wow. That's wow, really good. man. As soon as I took <laughs> that photo, yeah, it was it was cloudy. As soon as I took the photo, I um let me go ahead and unshare now. Um, as soon as I took the photo, I packed up the camera and I went home. I said, "This is this is it for today." <laughs> so that was the picture, the photo of the uh, day. Yeah, I, I I can't believe that he he told us, "Oh, I have a picture more." Yeah, something you know. <laughs> Come on, my God! <laughs> <laughs> amazing, yeah, but, amazing. But song, it says great timing. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that, it's the definition well, of great timing. Yeah, the 
you see the bird make its move and you start your burst and you hope that one of your bursts captures it before it hits the water. I right. have plenty of pictures of a fully submerged bird, a bird half in the water, a bird splashing, and you know, just yeah. total miss. And that one, I have it, you know, really close. So that's that it's was almost uh, like it's going to kiss the water. Yeah, it, it yes. was that close. It's very impressive. And if I if I get lucky if I get lucky enough to as well. Yeah, to try again, I can see if I can catch eyes, although he's, the turn probably closed its eyes before it hit that water. So sure it did. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> but yeah, that's uh, they got to be going really kinds. fast before they hit the water because they're, yeah, you know, they're hunting, right? So, yeah, they're yep. they dive pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. Now, now I think that you have the timing to take the pictures with telescope Adrian of the national the international space station from the moon as it flies yeah. yeah i yeah catch it. i you can are catch it uh, yeah that i would yeah. see if i can catch you. it handheld <laughs> i can, yeah. can take it handheld <laughs> yes yeah, shotgun yes yeah, without tripod yeah yeah <laughs> guiding uh, i have a picture yes i have a picture <laughs> no <laughs> the machine right <laughs> yeah <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so any uh, any last thoughts, you guys, before we call it a night? Well, last uh, picture. Who let me know? show oh, you a few seconds. Let me show you. Yeah. The 47 to Ghana. I want that. Uh, ah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you did this shot. <laughs> Nico. Oh, well, this is Steve. We oh, this is Steve. Okay. Yeah, Steve I, is showing us. I forget. I said, Nico, you did that the, with <laughs> your Dawsonian. Six. Um, That's beautiful, Steve. Connected with that image from earlier, the color one. Just the North American and the Pelican. Yeah. This that is, is the mosaic I did of it. Um, there's only six of... in this one. Uh, oh, there okay. was a nine, but I, I got rid of three because... The, they weren't so good at the bottom, so it does. Yeah. It just links in below the pelican, so that's where it was. Yeah, that's beautiful. All that's I uh, see. It looks narrow band, so all HA. All HA, yeah. All HA, yeah. Yeah. Um, now, interesting enough is when you look up at the night sky, naked eye at a border one site, you swear you can see those things, naked eye. It's. You know, and it's HA light, so we, you know, we typically don't see that, but you yeah. can see parts of it mm -hmm. coming through. I mean, it's when it's That's dark enough, amazing. you know, That's you amazing. once you image it like this, you get all the full detail, but you see a little bit of it. You see those patches within the Cygnus region. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Now, th there was a couple of questions uh, that have come up. Uh, Adrian, p some people wanted to know what your favorite lens was. Okay. So, Right now, it changes from shoot to shoot, but right now, my t an old 28 to 70 f 2.8 lens that I used for some of my final Milky Way shots, yeah, um, was my favorite lens for Astro, where I can zoom in or pull out and do like mosaic, I can do panels. That's I becoming see. a favorite lens for wildlife. I have a 150 to 600 Sigma contemporary lens. That's uh -huh. my absolute favorite for that. I see. I see. And Steve, yep. uh, what um, what software were you using for mosaicing? On um, that one, I use Astro Pixel Processor. Astro Pixel Processor. APP, yeah. I've heard of that. It's really good. Let's see if I can. It, what happened was I got a demo version of it, and I've got um, a Veil for four pane mosaic and i couldn't i couldn't get it to join up in registar maxim uh whatever i tried and i got a demo of uh, app and it did it straight away so i bought it <laughs> yeah yep so i see uh nick the hammer is showing us 47 tucane yeah yeah that's the thing with the top, i would say yeah 
It's so bright, it shines through the clouds. Impressive, <laughs> impressive, incredible, yeah. Yeah, that is one. Since seeing that through um, um, through all of you from Argentina, since seeing that, I decided that's actually my favorite cluster. Um, even maybe more so than Omega Centauri. Um, it, it, it's, it's really beautiful to, to observe. Uh, and, and as you say, it's, uh, more, it's uh, Omega Centauri is, is like uh, less shining in the in the center. Uh, yeah, three seven two Kana is it's beautiful. Yeah, Omega Centauri is just it's grand because there's more stars than anything in the rest of the entire sky or in Omega Centauri. But um, the shape of forty seven two Kana is uh, that surpasses a lot of. Uh, a lot of the clusters I, I used to like M5 for how tightly compact the core of M5 was M3 as well. Um, the Hercules cluster, you could, you can look at that and you can think, ah, it looks kind of like a bug. I actually liked M92 a little better, um, you know, for its shape, but, uh, yeah. 47 Tucani beats them all. Yeah. It's one of my favorite, my favorite. And also, when, yeah. when you see, I think in 47 Tucana, you have uh, some blue stars that uh, contrast with the golden and white stars. So, yeah, that's yes. right. And, and the difference in Omega Centauri, you don't have those, those brighting stars. You have all thin little diamonds uh, shining and when you are not watching directly you are watching with the, the size of your eye you start to see shining one from different place this yeah uh, the, the red ones and the yellow ones mm -hmm. yeah yeah pile of jewel. very col yeah colorful like yeah. the i know there are several jewel boxes in the sky but the one that is near uh the uh, crux, the Southern Cross, mm -hmm. is pretty impressive as well. Yeah, the, the chivalry box. Yep. So we're seeing exactly how you're stacking it. Um, you're doing it live, and it's, uh, despite the movement of the uh, object, it's figuring it out and stacking it for you. That's uh, pretty good. Yeah, when I use, uh, when I... To, to stack an, an image, I, I start recording in, in several feeds because I, I am with uh, 200 milliseconds of exposure, and yeah. I I pause I pause the the, the capture and then uh, re repoint and start again and uh, it, and then let it build some more. Yes, that works. Mm -hmm. Uh, Nico, uh, you can point um, the Tarantula Nebula. You have uh, a visual. And, uh, yeah, that's another beautiful nebula I'll never see here. I have to go, go to Argentina. Or... Argentina at this point will be easier for me than uh, Australia where you get really deep in the south. Maybe it will be more cheaper for you. It will be cheaper, yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we are gifted now. Yeah, I saved the money for the barbecue. No, yeah, yeah. because that you're, is you're going I am to looking for that. We are going to uh, teach you how we do asado. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. definitely. There's lots to learn. I am ready with a yeah. net with. <laughs> I don't know if you with obviously chorizo seco and everything and enjoy the 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 asado well i'm also going to have to learn how to eat things that are hotter than i usually uh <laughs> am used to <laughs> i i'm lightweight but i'm gonna have to get ready because the chili the chilies will come and spice up the meals and i have to have the authentic i can't uh I can't have the version for the tourists. We we want the authentic. Ah, no, no, yeah, no, authentic. We, we don't, yes, we don't eat yes, uh, too much uh, chile or very. No, yeah. 
No, yeah. it's more. Okay. We, we use the we, what we chimichurri. call chimichurri, chimichurri, salsa Gimme criolla, curry. or yeah, that's a special salsa that we put in in the meat okay. and gives more um, sabor, more more taste than yeah. if you eat you 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 yeah, will like it. Bland. Yeah, I look I look forward to that. Mm -hmm. You will join eating that, <laughs> and also we well. He, what I how I cook the the meat, I prefer to be in the the, the center of the meat, uh, not red, no blood. Yeah, no, I I don't like it like that. I I like what? when it, it's all cooked. Okay, Nico, that's Nico is saying what a friend is Maxi that he told me that I yeah thank you Maxi Nico is thinking now in your entire family Maxi because yes Nico maybe you can you can uh, say something ironic like a, a, a noise of motors like go to because maybe Maxi say <laughs> okay you can go yeah, to I'm the... no no I will uh, <laughs> no <laughs> yeah no no I know we know that you are a genius searching things we, and but but uh, say okay thank you guys <laughs> where is no no we don't we don't like uh, tarantula much better a sculpture galaxy please <laughs> <laughs> i think we barely saw that at the beginning of the night um at oklahoma before it all went below horizon oh. um very faint i saw if Well, Sculptor Galaxy, I saw it in binoculars. Yes, it is um, possible here, to, to see it. Yeah, here it, it rises. Yes, here now, uh, Maxi is over our oh. head at, at this hour. Yeah, yes. we. No, it was low on the horizon at that site. I had the, uh, I think, some 16 by 70s, and I barely did make it out visually in the binoculars. Pretty big field of view. And, um, It was uh, it, it was a large, you know, it was large, but it was very diffuse. But I, I was cool that I was able to make it out. Mm -hmm. um, I also went up and down the Milky Way, looked for some, saw some um, things from the Astronomical League, some uh, NGC objects, some some large clusters that are in Alta in uh, Aquila, the Eagle. So yes, those are. Those are some interestingly shaped uh, clusters. Once you see them, you don't miss them. You say, oh, that's exactly what I was looking for. Um, and then one, a couple of them, one is here, the other one is there. Yeah, that's But, uh, it. That's right there, Nico. It's a, no, it's I it. don't think so. I, maybe it's, a, it's one of the globular. Near. Uh, perhaps. What are you looking for, a sculptor? No, for tarantula. Tarantula. Yeah, But so I know it is in the large, I know you're searching yeah. the large Magellanic cloud. Yeah, but, but it's, it's, it's there. really, it's low, it's, it's very low at this time, and it's uh, uncomfortable for the, the dogs. For it. the dogs, to, uh, yeah. Mm. Now that this, it hasn't risen okay, no, no far enough yet. No, no, please, a galaxy, please. <laughs> 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 all right well i what time is 11 i have to i'm back to work which is a shame i had all that time off and now i have to do my day job but um i enjoyed the star party um scott wonderful Thank you. I, Thank I, you. i i saw whenever i see that you schedule me for something yeah. i just say okay Every the plan you is do it. plans are changed. Yeah. I'm doing that now. So It's I uh, I always enjoy coming on. I I appreciate all the kind words. Uh, I like doing my photography, and it got better when I stopped trying to compete with all the good photographers out there, mm. and instead just embrace what I like about That's photography. Right and what it is i try i do try to get pinpoints in my stars but um i also i like making the night sky the main attraction in all my photos and the supporting cast is the earth it's a little opposite sebastian does a great job with the foreground is this beautiful foreground 
and the sky, you know, just is accents it. It really uh, it brings everything out. I sort of shoot in reverse, and I'm okay with that because you know, like, like me, with my photo, I'll zoom right in and show you the cat's paw nebula in my photo. Um, and that's it'll amazing. be a picture. Yeah, or something. That's an amazing. Yes, uh, this a uh, uh, you know. I'm glad that you could take that picture because that show how much you learn in this all this time and yes. you have to feel grateful for that and you can continue taking pictures practicing and that's a that's the way it is yeah yeah you keep you keep in trying to gary time. we're here you'd say yeah you're always looking even in that big picture the uh, mosaic of the Milky Way. Now it's like, well, now I can try and take an even better picture and take what I learned to see if I can, you know, do something in a Bortle 4 zone because now I'm back Bortle 4. A uh, couple weeks when the dark of the moon comes back, I can try the same thing that I did at the Bortle 1 site and see what kind of detail I can get. Compare. And maybe even try and frame it up against an actual background, an actual good foreground. So there's always something to learn. And yeah, sure. You know, but then I too, I'm able to share the photos as part of outreach. It's it's not just look at my pretty right. photo, print this in a magazine, please. It's look at this photo, and if you want to see this, here's where I got it. Here's where you go. Here's what's in the photo. And, um, you know, this different, uh, different Whoa, face, like that. this beautiful veil. Uh, I've, <laughs> I've aimed at the veil with a 200 millimeter lens, no go to, I did it, Nick the hammer way and took yeah. a photo and the veil showed up. It was nowhere near as beautiful as this, mm -hmm. but it did show up. And that taught me where to find the veil. Um, You know, if I want to try and do, you know, well, now that I've seen this, I just say, Steve, Steve's got it covered. We're all good. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> I will, I'll right. just say, look at Steve's work. We have a few astrophotographers in our group that have um, done similar work with the similar palette. Uh, this looks like uh, I'll SHO criticize palette. It. It, the background sealed out. Okay. I I, I, I tried well. a couple of uh, days ago. I tried to to take it at the right at that star, uh, how it looks like. Yeah, this yes, right. that that place. Yeah. And I have it Something very sick. at the north, and it was very light pollution. But and also I had wind. The the guy was, I don't know. Not so good. It, 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 but uh, but it had a heart attack the guiding and well i i say uh, that that's okay i can continue so i took a picture you have yeah, yeah i remember seeing that comment live with my own eyes i Ooh. was i late i came into astronomy and astrophotography late otherwise i would have had a picture of hail bop from a plane The tail grew so long, it oh. basically covered oh. the entire sky. The hell like up this tail <laughs> is really way, way past the border and past my screen. It's that long. And I don't remember the ion tail, but I'm sure I would have seen it. This um, is um, old slide film. Yeah. And yeah. you still you managed to capture you managed to capture this meteor right here. Look at that. Yeah, that that's that's proper that's lucky imaging. Yeah, <laughs> very lucky imaging. <laughs> very hey, lucky imaging. I think yeah, I got. I, I had to dig that one out for a friend of mine. He he asked about it when I when Neo Wise was around. Yeah, you say uh, well, I uh, I did this back in the nineties with Hale Bop. <laughs> Yeah, and it, yeah, Hale Bop was indeed larger, or at least it loomed a little closer. Um, I don't know if uh, Neowise was as big 
as Hale Bop in actual size, but uh, we certainly saw a little more of Hale Bop. Oh, yeah. But there were some there were some beautiful yeah, well, pictures. I... There it is. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Damien Peach, who is apparently a a named astrophotographer in our field, has Neowise images that uh pretty much won the prize. He, he did are some pretty good work. Clouds, right? Say again. Those are not tulips and clouds, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's so beautiful. Beautiful. looking too. Yeah. 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 I have to see if I manage to get those by accident i i don't think i've taken pictures of those but i'll have to look because i may have i may have some where i shot some before as dusk was coming i might i seem like i may have some images similar to that yeah we had um i think three or four nights of um when we got um the Noctilucent and uh, the Comet. Oh, yeah, look, some horses. Those are beautiful. Yeah. I pulled up. This is not far from home, and I pulled up at, uh, in the driveway of the field, and the horses came down to see what I was up to and got very <laughs> bored very quickly and drifted to the back of the top of the hill there. Okay. <laughs> and, they were in, yeah, and that's when they were in perfect awesome, position man. for you to get your shot. Yeah, I got yeah, that's shots. good work. Yeah. Impressive. Yeah, three paint stitch. I've started to get into the paint stitching because I think the detail, the overall detail gets to be a little bit better. Um, I can use the I have the 14 millimeter Sebastian that you talked about. And in one shot, you get a nice, beautiful image, even though there may be a little bit of distortion. I have a rectilinear lens, so I try to try, you know, cut down on some of the types of distortion. But um, I've all I've started to learn that shooting in, you know, in narrower, you know, larger focal lengths, mm -hmm. but putting them together uh, can yield some pretty good results. Yeah. 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 I like that too. Yeah. yeah. Which one was that one with? Oh, that was with the Sigma. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I have. Uh, How about this one for a fail, then, if I can find it again. I've seen it two or three times, and I've been flicking up and down the site. You'll like this one, or maybe not. Uh, oh no! You've had a rose nice there. collection, you, Steve. Yeah, you, you had, had a really nice, nice M51 collection. down there, and I've seen the Hubble fits data. So your M51. Um, is uh on its way now i once i saw the hubble fits data on m51 i stopped shooting at it because i go. said there is nothing else you can do yeah look at the uh tracking <laughs> fail on the Orion. it's still a cool photo because you you have that's the orion the, yeah, you've got the, the dark lanes that's the picard shot yeah and then, so. then you then you took <laughs> off for another for somewhere else, and you ended up. I, with, uh, it just stopped. Is the kick, kick at the mount effect? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and Star right. Wars. Star Wars. Look, looks like a, an X wing from Star Wars. Yeah. yeah. Yes, an X wing from from Star Wars. I think the same. Yeah. Amazing. I saw the elephant trunk there. You've got yeah, some. Put that uh, one up earlier. Yeah. Yeah, you got some. Yep, there's your elephant trunk. I quite like that one. I'm, I, it's probably. Yeah. Probably one of my better ones. That. Yeah, yeah that's the. Yeah, there you yeah go. that's just nice. Yeah, that's that's cool. yeah. good detail amazing. there. Look at the. I, I yeah. love that. The, the yeah, nebulas are, are amazing. Even the, the good images and the fails, all of the images are keeping me up at night. I still want to see more. <laughs> uh, and i'll tell you what i don't know if i'll be able to do it but i know the moon and uranus are going to be close together um the moon will be coming just off of full so it'll be 98 percent, and uranus is gonna be maybe a couple of degrees not much more than that near it um i was hoping to get an image of it as it rises 
but of course just like in the uk the forecast is supposed to be cloudy for that day so <laughs> i may miss it all together unless i wait until one in the morning and then just take a handheld image oh you can do what i've done adrian and become um nocturnal <laughs> there you go yeah i it'd be hard to get up to work there's your fireworks galaxy i see that up there yeah that one yeah i yeah. think i took that with the toscano i think yes i did yep. yeah 18 oh. that. Yeah. what yep. uh, what words uh, do you have steve sorry uh, the the um, the bottle sky 46. um four five oh yeah yeah five i think but as i say i've got a, a an led street lamp not 10 yards away from where the telescope is mounted mm -hmm. so uh, above it's five probably five four on a good day but but, uh, but, the, but if you're you seeing narrow brand there there is no problem yeah then you can do it Yep, yeah. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise you can light paint your astro photos with that. That's yeah. all it's good. Yeah. <laughs> that looks like an old uh, hail bop shot. Yeah, that's the hail bop that I yep. showed earlier. Uh, There's Neo Wise for comparison. There's the M101. I see some M. I think that's M101 right there that you took. Yeah, uh, I could be go. wrong. I think that gave a different number. I think it looked like it gave an NGC number. It will do with the plate solve. It does an automatic oh, okay. plate solve. Oh, okay, so it so it is Messier one hundred and one, but it's it also is. NGC five seven seven or whatever it said. Whatever. That makes sense. This was taken with the dual rig last year. I think I had uh, the, the one three two. Uh, and the one oh type 102 on the same nice. amount with the you two get a, a lot of small galaxies around. Yeah, this is life life around the dipper is uh <laughs> yeah. lots of there's there's a there's some galaxies wow. at uh Ursa Major. So that it is our only our only comeback for uh not having the Magellanic clouds or having deep galaxy fields around the dippers. Yeah. And that's so, uh, yeah, you can. There's a couple of groups. I think M51, Messier 51 has its group. I forget if 101 is a part of that group. I can't remember myself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But you have, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, M51. And then you have the other Bode's galaxies are impressive. I don't know if you have them shot here, but uh, they are. They are pretty impressive too. That horse head in uh, narrow band. No, it's amazing. I see that. Yeah, you, yeah, that's good. People were it. getting, people were doing that at the um, at this board at uh, Oki Tex. The horse <laughs> head was a popular uh, target to both try and visually see as well as image. Oh yeah. And uh, yeah, it just maybe five hours of integration, and you had a sharp horse head. Let's guess this one. Um, <laughs> I know that when it's closer up, M13 can look really impressive. But from far away, M13 looks more like what you have at the bottom there. Yeah. Yep. Um, oh, there's so all I, sorts on here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was trying to find that 51. Yeah, I saw it. You, yeah, I saw I you cross it. Zooming up and down. Sorry about that. Oh, it's okay. Ah, uh, don't worry. This is, this is the after party. We yeah. There's no. Yeah. That's 101. There's one of your M51s right there. There we that's go. Pretty... Well, yeah, that's it's nicely. Cool as well. yeah. It's a beautiful image. Yep. This is. We tease you all in the southern hemisphere with M51. I don't know if you can, because the Dipper from where you are, I think the Dipper stays below horizon. Yes, yeah, we we yep. can see it. Look at that galaxy that's off to the lower. If you, yeah, look at this uh, edge on galaxy. It, yeah, don't know what that is, but and then you got another one, kind of within the uh, 
haze of that second galaxy. You said, okay, there it is. I see four yeah. two seven 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 seven. We just identified <laughs> it. <laughs> Here we okay. can we can capture that. I will try uh, maybe uh, in a couple of months the antennas uh, galaxies. Uh, yeah, they yes, come. Uh, they come south for you. Yes, because we have it here below in, in the Senate. That looks like the uh, whale or so, the spindle. I don't know which one. Is that the whale? No. Or the spindle? Spin, spin, no. Uh, uh, the needle. Need, needle. No. needle galaxy. Uh, 5907. No. no, it's not the needle galaxy. No, no, no that no. looks, that looks, looks like, like the whale. Is that Steve? The whale? No, it's not the whale, that one. Okay. Yeah, it looks familiar, like I've seen yeah. it, but I can't I can't remember the name or the the NGC. Is, is I think it is an NGC um, number. Is that a yeah. silver dollar? That one? Uh, no, no, silver do dollar is um uh, the Spectre wrong. Galaxy. Oh yeah. right. Okay. I think I uh, can't and, remember. And the, I, can't and the remember, white, but I, I have seen that before. Hmm. I can't I remember should know what I, it is because I shot it. <laughs> well, it is NGC 5906 or 07. Seven. 5907. So it's whatever it's whatever that other is. name. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Here's yeah, a sombrero. I, I will start to to keep it out all inside and go to bed because I, I need to get up in, in a few hours. So yeah. it was a pleasure. It was ah. a really nice yeah. night. Thank you, yes. Scott. Thank you, Maxi. Sunflower. Sunflower Galaxy? Yeah. Yep. In yes. the, in M65, yeah. I believe. Three. M63, yep. Okay, well, guys. Yep, M63. No, I, I'm All right, yep. And I will be, and with, with that, I will be heading out as well. Yeah, okay. stop sharing. Uh, Go home. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. I Thank you, guys. <laughs> all right, you all take care. Excellent take star care. party. Good night. Yeah. It was a Cheers, pleasure. Thank you night. again, yeah. Scott. Thank you for putting Cheers. these on. Thank you, Thank you very so much. much. Thank you. Thanks, Cheers. everyone. Thanks. Yeah, Good night. time for me to go too. Yeah. So <laughs> you are coming very <laughs> late. <laughs> you live online, yeah. Scott. <laughs> you can, wait a minute. No, we will go about three and a half more minutes because then we will be broadcasting for seven hours straight. Oh, okay. <laughs> so Scott anyhow. Network Roberts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, guys. It's no, it's great. Record, though. It's though, fun. It? It's wonderful. That was the 24 so. hour one, wasn't it? You've oh my before. God. Yeah. 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 We, we did, we've also, we have broadcasts where we, uh, went for a certain number of hours and stopped and then if certain, mm -hmm. it, when we did the uh, great conjunction uh, star party we had it started from the philippines okay and mm -hmm. then you know as far as we could take it so but that was a very enjoyable um a star party david levy uh stayed awake for the whole thing you know i actually <laughs> took naps like you know in between a little bit but um yeah david david was uh just really uh determined to stay awake for the entire time and i think he had i think he was awake for 18 hours something like that so <laughs> you know when we were young we could stay up and do pull a 24 hour you know deal or something but uh <laughs> yeah yeah so. So what's the longest that you guys have stayed awake first time? Um, um, I don't remember. No. Maybe well, I went to work. I remember a Saturday. Yeah. And uh, more at the... Uh, well, I, I think when we went to Navarro, Nico, when we met for the first time, I think that was... Hmm. Uh, and yeah. also because I, I couldn't even sleep, I I have my finger uh, cut in the in my finger. Yes. Oh, I, I, and it, was it was a very cold. <laughs> no. very cold night. And that was cold. Oh, your yes. finger hurt. Uh, no, <laughs> my, my feet was oh a very. Oh yeah, terrible. And, yeah, yeah. And one I, one or two hours we sleep. Mm, yes, I, 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 and I don't know if I even sleep. And then well. 
I came to home at the yeah. midday of the Sunday. Yeah. And I think I, I didn't uh, uh, lunch, so I went to well, I think. <laughs> but it, it was like when you go uh, for a party uh, with friends and you yeah. had a headache and everything, but yeah. now without alcohol, this is astrophotography <laughs> this is <laughs> when you come home you you feel like that but yeah. there's no, there's no alcohol <laughs> but if you the bring it right? over from astronomy <laughs> the uh, yeah. leonids around 1999 hmm. probably I'm trying to remember which year it was i think it was 98 okay we went when are the Leonids? In November. What did we go and do? We went camping. <laughs> <laughs> that must ring And cold. we had, we drove up there, set up camp. Yeah. And stopped up all night as well. Um, and uh, somebody reckoned it was minus, something like minus eight. Oh, it was ice on the inside of the tent anyway. Yeah, yes. that's yeah. cold. And we did three or four nights. Yeah. And on, on the fourth night, we'd, we'd obviously done too much uh, because we got the camp beds out. Yeah. We were in the sleeping bags looking yes. up and it was clouded out. <laughs> oh, but yeah. it was promise, promise of cleared spells. Hmm. But it was like white noise. And all three of us nodded off. Oh. And what woke us up was the snow. <laughs> it started snowing. So we decided at that stage that it was time to pack away. Oh, yeah. And drive oh, yeah. up. That's right. Before oh. you freeze it, yes. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was that's probably the longest. That's the longest. Yeah, hmm. absolutely shattered we were. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Anyway, is it must must be past the seven hours now? Is it? It is now. Right, yes, it is. Okay. I'm going to call it. I want right, to thank all of you. That. Good night. I want to thank all of you that uh, presented, and uh, I want to thank everybody in the audience that watched. Uh, thank you so much, and. Um, We'll be back uh, tomorrow with uh, more programming, and um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna make it a uh, a late day. So <laughs> my uh, my daughters are visiting from California. I haven't seen them in over two years because oh. of the pandemic oh. and all the rest of it. So uh, and then they leave Thursday. So I need to uh, spend a little bit more time. But, uh, but it's great. good. It's all good. So they knew I was doing the star party, and I would have missed it. So. Thanks, enjoy everyone. That, Scott. Enjoy with, with your dad. Yes. Thank you so much. Take care. And you guys have all a good night. And we Take care. Will good night. See you. Yeah. And keep good looking up, guys. Good Bye -bye. night, guys. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah. Bye.